My name is Grant Frederick Johnson Walker. Walker. Could you spell it, please, Mr. Walker? W A L K E R. Mr. Walker, are you nervous? Yes. Okay. Mr. Walker, what do you do for a living, please? I'm a swim pool uh, service and repairman. And were you employed as a swim pool service and repairman in August of 1989? Yes, I was. And uh, so you don't provide regular pool service. You provide a specialized kind of pool service. Would that be fair to say? I uh, do repair uh, work for other independent pool men. On Saturday, August the 19th of 1993, did you go to the Menendez home at 722 North Elm Drive in the city of Beverly Hills? Yes, I did. Was that the first time that you had ever been to that residence? I believe so. And were you sent there uh, by someone else? Yes, I was. And who, what is the name of the individual who sent you there on August the 19th? Leon Bartek. And is Mr. Bartek's name spelled B-A-R-T-E-K? I believe so. Okay. How long had you um, been doing referrals from Mr. Bartek back in 1989? Probably just a few months, maybe six months. Okay. When you went to that residence, do you recall approximately what time it was? Approximately 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And when you got to the residence, did you gain entry to the residence through the front or the back of the, of the property? Through the rear. And how was it that you went to the rear? Did, were you directed to go there through the yes. rear? Yes, yes. Um, as a pool repairman, is that your normal habit and custom to go through the rear of properties to gain access to the pool? Depends on where the equipment is or the pool is. <laughs> Had you prior knowledge about where the equipment would be at the house? Yes, Leon Bartek told me where it was. And when you went through the back of the house, what did you first see? Well, I entered the gate through the rear uh, from the alley, and I saw two people sitting at a patio set. And could you describe these two people for me? Were they ad adults? Were they, they were adults. And uh, what were their sexes? Male, female. Okay. And when you say they were sitting there, could you tell what they were doing? Uh, not right, right away, no. Okay. Did you, uh, did you then approach these people and have some conversation with them? Yes, I did. And did you learn who they were? Yes, I asked if they were Mr. and Mrs. Mendez. Uh, that's what I said. Now, when you say Mendez, are you meaning to say M-E-N-D-E-Z? Yes. All right. And did they um, correct you or respond to you, or what happened? No, I, t I introduced myself and asked if that's who they were and told them who I was and that I was to do a repair. All right. What happened then? Mrs. Mendez uh, acknowledged me and said, yes, that's who she was. And uh, I asked her whether it was convenient for me to do the repair today. And she said, yes, it was, and she was expecting me. All right. And did you conduct this conversation with her outdoors in the backyard? Yes, I did. And could you describe if there were any, um, was there a pool in the backyard? Yes. Was there a tennis court in the backyard? Yes, there was. All right. Um, when you had your conversation with Mrs. Menendez, did you notice if there were any, um, ch any of her children around? Yes, there was. Sustained. Rephrase the question. Answer did you, stricken. Did you notice any young men around that time? Yes, there were three. There were three. Could you describe them for me? There was two in white tennis outfits, and uh, there was another gentleman on the court in the rear. And uh, as far as the ages of the two people in the tennis outfits, were they older or younger than the other man that you've described? They were younger. And do you see them in court here today? Yes, I do. All right. Would you indicate where you see them in court today? What are they wearing? Wearing a plaid shirt, red, Indica and a red sweater. Indicating Eric Menendez and Lyle Menendez, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. But at the time that you saw them, they were wearing white tennis clothes. Is that correct? Correct. And I believe you indicated they were on the tennis court. Yes. What were they doing? Uh, they were playing tennis. After you made uh, Mrs. Menendez's acquaintance, did you proceed to start to do what you were hired to do? Yes. And what were you, physically, what were you doing? I was working on an automatic spa control. What it is is you have a, they have a pool and a spa. So if they choose to use the uh, spa at night, rather than have to go all the way to the rear of the tennis court where the pool equipment is to turn it on, there's automatic controls right on the side of the house. And when you say right on the side of the house, did, um, are you talking about the main house? Yes. Did you see a guest house there as well? Yes. Okay. So when you talk about the house, you're talking about the main house? Correct. Okay. 
Um, and so what were you trying to do in regards to these spa controls? The spa control that's right on the house did not function. In other words, they couldn't go out and turn on the switch and have it function. They would have to go all the way to the rear to turn on the equipment. And this so, was what they call an override switch. So that's what I was working on. Okay, so your job that day was to fix the switch that was nearest to the house? Correct. Okay. And how long were you there that day? Approximately half an hour to maybe 40 minutes maximum. And did you have to move around the backyard of the house in order to accomplish this task that you had? Yes, there's four switches on the side of the house that do four different functions. So to determine which one was which, I had to walk back and forth several times. And in order to walk back and forth, did you have to walk by the tennis court? Yes, I did. Did you have to walk by the area where Mr. and Mrs. Menendez were sitting near the patio, uh, at the patio set? Yes. And did you hear any conversation um, among Mr. and Mrs. Menendez and either one of their sons? Yes, I did. Okay. Without telling me precisely what you heard, could you describe the nature of the conversation? Well, let's first establish some foundation as to who was speaking. Okay. Um, the conversation that you're going to tell us about, do you remember who was talking? Yes, it was uh, Mrs. Mendez. Mrs. Menendez? Menendez, excuse me. All right, and who was she speaking to? She was speaking to uh, Lyle. And which one is Lyle as you sit here in court? The uh, red sweater. Indicating Lyle Menendez for the record, Your Honor. And what did she say to Lyle Menendez? I don't recall exactly, but it was tennis related. All right, and did you hear Lyle Menendez respond to her? Yes. And in what, how did he respond to her? In anger. And what did he say? I don't recall the exact dialogue, but it was uh, vulgarity and anger. Do you know what Mr. Menendez, where he was physically located when the, you heard this uh, conversation between Mrs. Menendez and her son Lyle? Mrs. Menendez and Mr. Menendez were sitting together at the patio set near the tennis court. Now, did you actually see anybody playing tennis that day? Yes. And who did you see playing tennis? I saw Lyle and the other gentleman that I mentioned before. Okay. Could you describe him for me? You've said he was a male and he was older than the um, Menendez brothers. Could you give me any better description of him? He had dark hair. And so um, you saw the gentleman with the dark hair who's not in court playing tennis with Lyle Menendez during the day. Is that, that you yes. were? And that, was that for the entire time that you were walking back and forth fixing the spa controls? I believe so. All right. Did you ever see Eric Menendez playing tennis that day? No, I didn't. What was he doing? He was standing beside his parents, close did, to them. Did you, ever, did you ever overhear any conversation between Eric Menendez and his parents? One time. And could you tell us what the nature of the conversation was between Eric Menendez and his parents? He seemed to be angry with his parents also. And could you tell me what led you to the... Well, I'm going to move to strike that. It's a non-responsive conversation. Overruled, the answer will stand. Could you tell me what about the conversation led you to believe that he was angry? I'm going to object to the conclusion as the witness tells us what he said. Overruled, you can ask the question. Can you repeat the question, please? Could you tell me what it was about what you heard Eric Menendez say that led you to believe that he was angry? Well, as I recall, Lyle was angry at this point too and he joined in Eric joined in so Lyle was angry and his brother Eric joined in yes and when you say that they were strike the answer is non-responsive overall the answer will stand okay. and um, do, at whom was the anger directed was it at this other gentleman with the dark hair or was it at someone else no it was at at the parents okay now um, after you completed your job how was it that you were going to be paid I, I'm paid by Leon Bartek all right. Did you leave any kind of bill or receipt with the Mr. and Mrs. Menendez on the uh, 19th of August of 1989? No, I did not. All right. And um, after you finished there that day, did you return to your home? Yes, I did. Did you um, talk to your wife about what you had seen that day at the Menendez home? Objection, Your Honor. Paul Gibson. Without going into what you said, did you talk to your wife? Yes, I did. Shortly after that, did you have a conversation with Mr. Bartek? Um, af about what you had seen that day at the Menendez home. Objection, Your Honor. Calls for hearsay, even if it doesn't relate to conversation. Overall, don't tell us what was said, just whether you had a conversation. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, now, on Sunday, um, it was the 19th of August. At some point within a few days after that, did you learn that Mr. and Mrs. Menendez had been killed? Yes, I did. Do you have any independent recollection here today 
of when it was you heard that Mr. And, Men Mr. and Mrs. Menendez had been killed. Yes, I believe it was Monday. And when you heard that, um, did it um, cause you to recollect that you had seen them two yes. days previously? Objection, Objection sustained. The answer is true. Um, Mr. Walker, at the time that you heard the news on Monday, did you have any thoughts about um, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez in terms of what you had seen? Yes. Okay. And sometime after Monday, did you have any conversation? I believe you indicated you had a conversation with Mr. Bartek. Do you remember what day it was that you talked to him? It was probably Monday. All right. I have nothing further of this witness at this time. Cross-examination. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Bartek. I want to ask you Mr. some. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. I want to ask you some questions about how you date this incident. You said it took place on August 19th, a Saturday, correct? Yes. And did you also say that you'd been doing referrals for Mr. Bartek for about six months before this incident took place? Correct. Is that right? So was it around April that you start April of 1989 that you started doing referrals for him? I'm not exact on that. Just roughly six months before August, you had been doing referrals, correct? Correct. And would that always involve a situation where he would call you and send you over to somebody's house and you would do your work and then call him up and tell him how much he owed you for the work? Yes. W would you bill him for the jobs that you were doing uh, on paper or just tell him, I went to the house, here's how much you owe me? It verbal. Verbal billing. And would you, would you yourself keep any records? documents of when you went to particular places and the work that you did at those places? No, I didn't. And would he pay you for each individual job? He would be individual or groups. Individual or groups. In other us. words, there were some times when he would pay you for specific jobs and other times when he would pay you in one lump sum for a number of jobs you had done. If there was many jobs all like several jobs in a week, then they'd be all grouped together. If it was slow and it was only one, then it'd be a single check. And how about if it was not a big job, just a 20 or $30 job, how would he pay you for, for something like that? The same way. Could be individual and it could be. Correct. Did you ever tell anybody that he always paid you individually for the jobs? No. How about this job? Did he pay you individually for it or in a group? I don't recall. Did you look to see if he had any records of getting paid for this particular job? No, I haven't. When was the first time that you ever had any conversation with anybody about what you heard that day when you were at the Menendez home? I don't understand the question. You testified about a conversation that you say took place on August 19th, 1989, correct. in which you heard Lyle and Eric Menendez say certain things, correct? Correct. When was the first time that you told anyone about that conversation? That would be Saturday. And you told your wife about it, correct? Correct. And then you also had a conversation with Leon Bartek sometime later that week about it? Yes, that would be later in the week. And did you have any conversation with anybody else that week about this incident? I might have had a conversation with my neighbor. And did you also attempt to have a conversation with someone at the Beverly Hills Police Department? Yes, I did. And when did you attempt to have that conversation? I believe that was a, a, on a Wednesday. And was that a telephone call that you made to the Beverly Hills Police Department? Yes, it was. And do you know who you spoke with? No, I don't. I spoke to an officer of the watch or whoever answered the phone. And did you tell whoever answered the phone that you had some information about a case you had read about in the newspapers? Yes, I did. And did that officer take your name down and say somebody would be in contact with you? He said he wasn't interested. I'm sorry? He said he wasn't interested. He said, did, he, did he say he was going to take your name down? No, he didn't say anything to that. Do you ever recall telling an investigator that he did take your name down and told you that somebody would get back to you? No, I never said that. In any event, after you had that conversation, no one from the Beverly Hills Police Department came to talk to you about what you had overheard, correct? No, they did not. And is it true that the next time you had any conversation with anybody about this incident took place about four years later in July of 1993? Correct. And between 1989 and 1993, 
you had no other conversations with anybody about what you testified to here today, is that correct? No, that's not true. Who else did you have conversation with? Well, I'm, like I said, I, told, I talked to my neighbor. But aside from the conversations we've already talked about, in the period from 1989 to 1993, did you have occasion to discuss what you overheard with anybody else? I probably have, yes. Do you know who that would be? Who they would be. No. Is it fair to Friends. say? It, is it fair to say that the first time you started thinking about the conversation you overheard was in 1993 in July? No. And when, during the period between 89 and 93, were you thinking about the conversation? I can't recall that, but it had come up from time to time with other people. And is mine? Is it something that stuck in your mind during that period of time as to the specifics of what you heard? Yes. And it's something you carried with you for four, roughly four years, vivid yes. in your mind? Yes. And it's something you talked about pretty much on a daily basis, would you say? No. I'm talking on a daily basis. All right. But it was something that was on, on the top of your mind, would that be fair to say? No, it wasn't on the top of my mind either. Well, is it something that you overheard in 89 and then you put it out of your mind? And I didn't put it out of my mind either. Right. Now, in 1993, did you again call the police department and indicate, as a result of something you had seen on the television, that you wanted to tell them about this conversation that you told the jury about? No, I did not. And who, if anyone, did you have a conversation with in July of 1993 about what you had overheard? Detective Soiler. Detective Zoller from the Beverly Hills Police Department? Correct. And how is it that you and Detective Zoller came together in 1993 to discuss this conversation? He called me. And do you know how he got your name? Yes, I do. How, how did he get your name? From my wife. And is it true that your wife had gone into the Beverly Hills Police Department and had said that you had some information relating to this case? Detective calls for hearsay. Assistant. This is for the non-hearsay purpose of the... All right. Um, Again, it would be hearsay as far as how he would know that. Right. At some point in time, you had a conversation with Detective Zoller, correct? Yes. And that was in July of 1993? Correct. And at that time, do you remember telling him that it was Eric who you had heard having a conversation with Mrs. Menendez? Correct. And is that the truth? It was Eric, the one? No, that is not. Right. And at the time you had the conversation, you thought you had overheard Eric Menendez having the conversation with Mrs. Menendez where That's correct. he was angry, correct? That's correct. And when you gave him that information, were you pretty sure of it? I don't understand. Yes, I was pretty sure of it. You were pretty sure of it? Yes. At that time. And when did you find out that you were mistaken? I found I was mistaken when I watched court TV and I saw the names with the faces. I did not read a newspaper article, I've not read a newspaper article to do with this trial since the event happened. So I did not know which name went on which person until I saw the actual pictures. See, I heard my information on radio, and they talk about the older and the younger, and I was mistaken in the ages. I'm, that's why I put the names in the wrong places. Well, when you spoke to Detective Zoller on July 25th, 1993, did you tell him that you'd been watching the news in reference to Lyle and Eric Menendez's murder trial? No, I, have, no, I did not say that. You never made that statement to no. him, is that correct? Mm -mm. And if he wrote that down in the police report, he would be incorrect? Yes. And is it your testimony now that you were actually listening to something on the news? and you hadn't seen any photographs of the Menendez brothers up to the point in time when you had this conversation with Detective Zoller, is that correct? I did not see a picture with the names underneath to determine which name, which went with which face. All right, and even though you hadn't seen a photograph, you went ahead and told Detective Zoller that you had personal knowledge that Eric Menendez had said some angry words yes. to his mother, correct? Yes. And what was that based on if you hadn't seen a photograph or a likeness of Eric Menendez up to what that What it was point? based on is radio. I'm out in the field all day long. I listen to radio. And you hear about the older and younger brother. And that's where I made the mistake. And so, I thought it was more important to correct it when your investigator interviewed me than it was to be in error. 
So what I'm trying to get at, though, is how you connected up the conversation with Eric Menendez. Is it because you thought it was the younger brother who was they having They always described older and younger when they gave the names. Okay. And, and I took Eric as being older, and I was incorrect. And so when you heard over the radio that they're describing older and younger. Yes. That's where I got the names confused. And in your up. mind, you hadn't seen photographs of who was older and who was younger. Correct. Who did you think was having the conversation, the older or the younger? Well, that's where I was mistaken. No, but I'm that's asking. Why I corrected it. When you when you made your statement on July 25th <laughs> to Detective Zoller, did you think in your own mind, gee, I know it was the younger guy who was mm -hmm. having the conversation, and that's a, and because the the radio had yes. identified the younger guy as Eric. Yes, I mistook the younger person for having the conversation. And that's how you made that mistake because yes. the radio had mistakenly said that Eric was the, the younger. The radio man. was correct. I was mistaken, and I thought it was more important for me to be right than to be mistaken. And did you think you were right when you gave Detective Zoller that information? Yes, I did. All right. Now, when you talked to Detective Zoller, were you able to describe to him? Uh, exactly what was said by either brother to the mother that day. Not exactly, no. And the only thing you in fact recollected was that it was something about tennis, correct? Yes. And that it seemed to be an angry exchange, correct? Correct. And it was anger on, on behalf of both parties, is that right? No. What was it that the mother said, if you recall? I do not recall exactly what she said. And do you recall what it was uh, that was said by the brother that made you think it was um, related to tennis? Well, he was playing tennis. And did you assume that it was, the conversation was about tennis because they were playing tennis? Yes. And the other man that you said was present there did you think, based on what you saw, that he was a tennis coach? I assumed he was. I do not know who he was. And the reason you assumed that was because he seemed to be helping out one of the brothers in his tennis playing, correct? Yes. Now, you described that man as having dark hair. Is that correct? Yes. Is it true that you could be mistaken about that because he was back in the shadows somewhat? No. Did you ever tell an investigator that you could be mistaken? about describing the person you thought was a tennis coach as having dark hair? I said that I, wouldn't, I would probably not be able to recognize him. And my question is, did you ever tell an investigator that you could be mistaken about the uh, tennis coach having dark hair? No. And you're pretty sure that he had dark hair at this point? Yes. And is it also true that um, your best recollection is that you were there on a Saturday? Yes, that's correct. And could you tell the juries why you think it was a Saturday that you were there? Well, when I heard on the radio that a professional murder had been committed, the day after I was there, you don't forget something like that. It's like the Kennedy assassination. I know exactly where I was that day, too. And so you date it because you heard about the um, killing on Sunday? I heard about, no. No, I did not hear about the killing on Sunday. When did you hear about the killing? Monday. Monday. And you were there the day before you heard about the killing? I never said that. I was there, yes, I was there the day before the killings. But when I heard on Monday about what had happened, you don't forget that you were there the day before. <clears throat> and, and that's how you date it to Saturday, correct? Yes. And is it true that when you received the call from Mr. Bartek that you went to uh, do this job shortly after you received the call, either that day or the next day? It would be within a reasonable length of time after I received the call, yes. Give me your best estimate of when that was. It can be a week. It can be three days. Well, I'm not asking in general, but in this case, I since you no recall idea. the date. I have no idea what day he would call me and ask me to do repair. And do you have any idea about when in relation to receiving the call that you went to the Menendez home? I have no idea what day he would call me. Do you remember that uh, the atmosphere between the parents and the uh, two boys you heard making the statements was tense? 
Did it seem to be a tense atmosphere to you? Yes, it was. And that was tension on behalf of both the brothers and the parents, correct? I, I wouldn't know. Well, it wasn't. I mean, for me, it was tense, yes. Yeah. What, it, what I'm getting at is it wasn't tension between the brothers. It was no. some tension between the parents and the brothers. Correct. And you don't know what happened before you got there to cause that tension, correct? No, I do not. And you pretty much were occupied with doing the job you were called to do at that point. Yes, right? I was. Now, do you know when you billed Mr. Bartek for this job? I didn't bill him for it. Well, let me rephrase that. When you told him how much he owed you for the job? We talked quite a bit when it comes to doing repairs. It could have been that Saturday. It could have been Sunday. It could have been Monday. Well, you I, did, according to you, did the job on Saturday, right? Yes, but I could have called him Saturday night. He could have called me. It could have been on a Sunday that I told him it was completed. And would that have been your normal practice to call yes. him that night and say? Or he would call me. Most of the time, he would call me. And do you have a recollection of him calling you or you calling him that Saturday? Mm, not, no, I don't. Do you have a recollection of how much you billed him verbally? Yes. How much was It'd it? It would be $30. And do you have a recollection of when he paid you? A lot of the times, he would pay me immediately. I'm not asking for a lot of the times. I'm saying for this job, he All the have time, it? he would pay me immediately. I'm sorry? He would sometimes pay me the same day. His, he never held back in any money. All right. So that was all the jobs. Did he pay you the same day for this job? He may have. I don't recall. And what is your best recollection as to when he paid you? Probably. For this job, not what he usually did. Well, I have to go on what he does. He just gave me a check today for a job I did yesterday. So that was his practices. So if he followed that practice, he would have paid you $30 on Sunday, correct? He, would have, he could have written a check on Sunday, yes. And is it your recollection, based on what he normally does, that he would have written you a check for $30? I have, like I said before, he paid me in groups. It could have been groups of other jobs. It could have been sometimes he would pay me in advance for a job, whatever was convenient for him. And could you tell me how you uh, are able to recollect that it was approximately 2 o'clock you were there? I just remember it was in the uh, early afternoon. Could you be more uh, precise of when it was you were there? No, I can't. That's your best approximation, yes. right? Do you remember telling the investigator that you could be wrong on the time? Yes. Did you hear the tennis instructor making any statements at all? I don't recall what he said. No. And how long were you there? I was there approximately half an hour to maybe 40 minutes. And if you were there at 2, you were maybe there close to 3 o'clock? Could be. And when you left, um, were all the parties still in the same position you saw them in, that is around the tennis court? Yes. Did anybody look like they were preparing to leave? No. Anybody look like they were getting ready to go fishing? No. Anybody say anything about, hey, we got a fishing trip, we got to sort of wrap this up, words to that effect? No. And where were you before you went to the Menendez home that day? No, it was probably in Hancock Park. Do you have a recollection of that? Yes. And how about after you left the home, where'd you go? Beg your pardon. Re repeat the question, please. Yeah. How about after you were at the house? Do you know where you went afterwards? Yes, I would go home. Um, could you describe for me what the brothers were wearing that day? Tennis outfits, white. They were all white? Yes. Can you tell me anything more about the outfits themselves? No, I can't. Do they have white tennis shoes on as well? I don't recall. How about the tennis instructor? I don't recall. And you mentioned a conversation you had with Mr. Bartek later on that week about what you overheard, correct? Yes. 
And is it true that that conversation took place on Wednesday? I don't remember what day that was. Was it shortly after you learned about the killing? Yes, it was. And had you read in the newspaper about the killing? I didn't read it in the newspaper. I heard it on the radio. Heard it on the radio on August 23rd. Do you remember hearing any names when you first heard about it? Objection, Ms. Stacey, testimony. Sister. Do you remember when you first heard about it whether there was any mention of names, uh, either Eric or Lyle? I don't recall those names being mentioned. And do you think it was shortly after first hearing about the case that you had a conversation with Mr. Bartek? Yes. And during that conversation, do you recall saying to him that you overheard Eric making certain statements? There we go again. It wasn't Eric, it was Lyle. But I might have said, I would probably put it as a group. I wouldn't give names at that point. You, you, I wouldn't know the names. I would just say the kids. You said something about the kids, but you... Because I didn't know their names then. So if you didn't know their names, you wouldn't have been saying Eric or Lyle, correct? Correct. That would have been impossible because there was nothing about the names in the stories you had read or heard, correct? I, I don't even recall what, what I would say, but that makes sense to me. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Walker, you don't have regular pools that you visit on a regular basis, such as an ordinary pool person, is that right? Yes, I do have regular. You do? Yes. You, do you do regular pool service? Yes, I do. Uh, okay. So you said that you would have been in Hancock Park before you went to this house. Yes. Was that a regular location of yours? Yes, it was. Where in Hancock Park? You want the address? Yes, please. Let's uh, give it to council uh, without reciting it over. What street? Lucerne. Lucerne? Yes. What block of Lucerne? What hundred block of Lucerne? 400 block north. 400 north? So we're north of 3rd Street? Yes. And is that uh, 400 north on Lucerne a regular? You're laughing. I live in Hancock Park. Let's go. Uh, is that a regular? <laughs> come from Queens and live in Hancock Park. Yeah. Uh, is Which that a is regular better. location? Of the house? <laughs> Which is better, Hancock yeah. Park? Okay. Um, is that a regular location that you serviced? Yes, it is. And did you service it every Saturday? Still do. And what time of day do you get to that uh, 400 block of Lucerne Pool? All depends on what time I get up on Saturdays. Saturdays is a slow day for me. Okay. Is that your only regular service job on Saturdays? As far as service, yes. As I have three on Lucerne. You know what you need to do, Mr. Walker? You need to get a little more forward to the mic because back here I can't hear you. Okay. You say you have three houses that you service on Lucerne. Yes. But this is the only one you service on Saturdays? I service all three on Saturday. Okay. And you go there before you do any special work? Yes, I normally like to get my service out of the way before I do any repairs. So is it your recollection that on the 19th of August, 1989, you made three service calls on Lucerne Boulevard and Hancock Park before you went to Elm Drive in Beverly Hills? Correct. And did you have any other special service repair work that Saturday? I do not recall. You could have? It's possible. You say it, uh, your, your service work depends on when you get up on Saturday. Well, try to sleep yes. in a little on Saturday? Yes, because I don't have that many accounts to service. Okay. And how long do you spend at each uh, house that you're servicing? It depends on the weather conditions and what's needed to be done. Okay. Uh, so you don't just drop the chlorine and leave? No. Okay. Now, what's the latest you would start your days, your service run? About 10 o'clock. So apart from special repair jobs, every Saturday with respect to your work would be the same as every other, correct? You have three service calls on Lucerne and you make them every Saturday, right? Not always, but most of the time, 99% of the time. And do you have a regular service calls on Sundays or is that your day off? No, no work on Sundays. And on Fridays, do you have regular service calls? Yes. Would it be um, accurate to say that the week before 
August 19th, you would have also served as three pools on Lucerne Boulevard. Yes. Now, do you, did you have a book or a calendar or a date book of some kind that would indicate where you're supposed to go on what days for servicing pools? No, you have it in memory. It's like Soon a trained yeah. rat. You just do the same thing over and over again the same day. <laughs> just a rat in a maze. The old Hancock Park maze. Okay, but uh, then there'd be these repair jobs and that would sort of break up the maze a bit. Well, like, I would set those after I did my service. Okay. So there's nothing that would have happened before you went to this house on Elm Drive that would distinguish one Saturday from another, is that right? Correct. Now you indicated when, uh, well, strike that. Now before, before your wife talked to the police, um, had you learned that this case was in trial? I don't understand. Okay, well, your wife uh, somehow went to the police in July and you wound up talking to Detective Zola, Correct. right? And before that happened, did you know that the trial of this case had started or was about to start? Yes. And had you heard about what the opening statements in this case was, what the defense was? I don't recall. Do you recall that before you spoke to Detective Zola in July, you knew generally what the defense was in this case? I believe so. Eventually, will. Okay, now, you never were at that Elm Drive location before this particular day, nor I take it after. Is that right? I've, I've been there after. Why were you there after? Repairs. And when did you go there after? I don't, re I don't recall. I've probably been there th three times after. Three times after the parents were killed? Yes. So if I were to ask you to describe the layout, you'd be able to do that? Right? Oh, yes. Yes, because you've been there yes. more times since they're dead than before. Yes. Now, did you ever watch tennis on television? No, I did not. And is it your belief that everybody who plays tennis these days wears all white? I have no idea. <laughs> did you tell Officer Zoller in July of 1993 that the tennis instructor who was there was giving lessons to both brothers. I assumed that's what he was, and I assumed that's what he was doing. Now, why would you assume that he was a tennis instructor and that he was teaching both of them? What would lead you to assume that? Just a wild guess. A wild guess? Yeah. I mean, that's who I assumed he was. Isn't that because he was giving instruction? Do this, I don't do recall that. whether he was or not. Well, you, but, but something he was doing made you assume he was a tennis instructor rather than, say, their Uncle Fritz or something like that, right? Yeah, it's just the feeling I got. From what he was doing? Yes. And from what they were doing with relation to him? Yes. Okay. And was that both brothers seemed to be interacting with the instructor or coach? I can only recall one. You only recall Lyle? Yes. Uh, he, is he the older brother or the younger brother? I know who he is now. He's the older brother. Okay. And at the time, did the person who you now say was uh, angry with the mother appear older or younger than the other person in white? I still can't tell, distinguish the ages. Who's, you can't tell us between Eric and Lyle which one's older and which one's younger? No. All right. So... With respect to uh, who you thought was, I, I guess it's fair to say you thought both of these boys were rude to their parents, is that right? Yes. And that's what you came forward to tell these juries, that they were rude to their parents, is that right? Yes. And therefore they couldn't have been abused or molested because they were rude to their parents, <laughs> right? That's an argument. Right. Okay, now, with respect to the, the ruder of the two, if you will, when you left uh, that house that day, who did you think had been ruder to the parents? You didn't know their names, did you? No, I did not. Okay. So who did you think was ruder, the older or the younger? Objection <coughs> vague to who she's referring to. Yes. Why don't you rephrase the question? I don't know who's referring to. You thought one boy was more rude than the other boy, right? I thought they were equally. 
Equally rude. Equally angry, too? Yes. Okay, so you've changed your testimony now, is no, that I right? No, I haven't. That's an argumentative, Your Honor. Sustained. Didn't you testify that one of them s seemed to be angrier and was being angry back to the mother, and then at one point the other one joined in? Objection right? mischaracterizes the testimony. Overall, you can answer the question. Do you understand the question? No. Okay. Well, well let's go back to your police interview, okay? Okay. Now, what you said to Detective Zoller was that one of the sons was ranting and raving over a missed shot. You remember telling him that? Yes. Okay. And then you also said... that... Um, Okay, in fact, all you said to Detective Zoller was that uh, both boys were ranting and raving over shots. Is that right? Yes. Excuse me, Adam, that mischaracterizes the report. Well, let me ask him what he remembers. All right, then ask him. Do you remember that what you told the police was that both boys were ranting and raving over shots? Yes. Excuse me, Adam, that mischaracterizes the report. Well, I'm not referring to the report. Question, he's answering the question. Next question, please. Now, What you've testified to here was that Mrs. Menendez was speaking to Lyle about something tennis related and he responded in anger with vulgarity. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And then you said that uh, at one point, Lyle was acting angry with his parents, and Eric joined in. Is that right? Yes. And you said that Lyle was on the tennis court with the tennis instructor. Yes. And you didn't testify that Eric was. Is that right? Well, he wasn't. I don't understand that question. Was Eric on the tennis court with the tennis instructor during the half hour to 45 minutes you were there? Not that I recall. So he was never on the tennis court with the instructor? He was on the tennis court, but not with the instructor. Well, what was he doing on the tennis court? He was court? there with a racket. I don't know what he was doing. Well, didn't you tell uh, the investigator that he was standing by his parents with a racket, not yes. on the tennis court? They were. They had the patio set right up against the tennis court. That's where they were sitting. This is an open tennis court? It's not this, fenced? This is a fenced tennis court, except for one opening. It's on the west side. The rest has got canvas around it. So they were right up as close as they could get to the tennis court on that side, near the net. The west side. Now, the west side of the tennis court is the side closest to the house. Is Correct. That right? And you're saying the patio furniture is between the house and the tennis court? The day that I was there, that table was pushed up right up close to the tennis court. When you walked by, you walked by the, the you did not walk between the tennis court and the tables because they were so close. You had to walk around the other side of it. So there's a patio table that's pushed up against the tennis court. It's not on the patio, though, is that right? It's right up against the tennis court. Yeah, the patio's off to the right of what you're talking Correct. about here. Correct, but okay. the patio furniture was brought right up to the tennis court. Now, my question, though, was the west side of the tennis court is the closest part to the back of the house, correct? Correct. And there's like a concrete walkway between the back of the house and the tennis court, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying someone had put a patio set there. Yes. And that's where they were sitting. Yes. Yes. Now, you told our investigator that Eric was standing next to his parents with a tennis racket in his hand all the time that you were there. Is no, that right? No, he wasn't there all the time. He was there the one time that I observed him, yes. You only observed him I one didn't time? sit there for half an hour and watch him. I had you things to do. You didn't sit there for half an hour and watch anything. You were fixing the spot, right. weren't you? That's what I'm saying. Could, could she not argue with the witness? All right, just ask another question, please. Okay. Well, let's see. Now, was Eric playing tennis or was Eric standing by his parents? I did not see him play tennis. Did you see him on the tennis court as contrasted with standing by the table where his parents were? He was off to the side on the tennis court, near the, right near the divider where they have the, the fence that fences off the tennis court to keep the balls in. Okay, so was he near his parents or not near his yes. parents? Yes. 
because you bring the patio furniture up there, it's all in the same area. So the parents were on the tennis court also? They were at this patio set at the edge of the tennis court. You say a patio set, are you talking about a table? Yes. A table with chairs? Yes. Four chairs? It had two chairs when I was there and two people were in it. Okay, so there are two people sitting on this table and it's not on the tennis court, it's No, it's just at it. the edge of it. Okay, and Eric is where? Standing next to the table or away from the table on the tennis court? Uh, one time he was right next to the table and another time I observed him, he was over closer to the tennis court. And did you see him playing tennis? No, I did not. At no time? At no time. Did you hear him taking instruction from the coach? I did not. I do not recall hearing that. But you recall the coach saying something to Lyle because he was playing with Lyle, is that correct? He, he must have if he was playing with him, but I don't recall what was said. Well, it's not whether he must have. Do you recall he said things even if you don't recall specifically what they I'm were? sure he must have said something. I do not recall what they said. Now, was this man that you saw Caucasian? Yes, he was. And uh, did you uh, estimate his age? Yes, I'm not good with age, as you can attest to that. I estimated him at 30, 30-ish. 30 30-ish 30 in his 30s? He could have been younger, he could have been a little older. Well, did you tell the police he was in his 30s? Yes, I did. And was that a wild guess on your part, or did that you That was think the closest was? that I could recall. Now, did you tell the police that the parents, mostly the mother, was commenting about any missed shot that either boy would make. You want to repeat the question, please? Did you tell the police that the parents, mostly the mother, would comment about a missed tennis shot that either boy would make? I don't recall saying that. So if Detective Zola wrote that in the report, he's mistaken? Objection, mistake the report. Oh and well, let me read you this sentence. Tell me if you told this to Detective Zoller. <coughs> he, being yourself, stated that as the boys were playing tennis, the parents, mostly the mother, with the father sitting next to her, would comment about a missed tennis shot that either boy would make. Did you say that to Detective Zoller? I may have said that. And if you said that to Detective Zoller, are you telling him then that both boys were playing tennis? Obviously not. Obviously not? As the boys were playing tennis. It's just plural. Yes, plural I recall, means more than one. Yes, it does. I only recall one. So you wouldn't have said as the boys were playing tennis to Detective Zoller? <coughs> Is that right? I guess so. You guess you wouldn't have said that? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And so you wouldn't have said missed shot that either boy would make because you only saw one boy I missing shots. don't know tennis and the conversation that I heard was related to tennis. Yeah, exactly what was said, I do not recall. I'm not talking about tennis, I'm talking about the number of boys, okay? Okay. Now, would, would you agree, Mr. Walker, that from the sentence I read you, it appears you told Detective Zoller that both boys were playing tennis and both boys were missing shots? Boys, boys probably were playing tennis. I did not see them. Well, you certainly didn't tell Detective Zoller about things you didn't see, did you? No. Overall, the answer will stand. So did you tell Detective Zoller that both boys were playing tennis and both boys missed shots? I do not recall okay. if I said that. And in fact, you even, uh, did you tell Detective Zoller that while on the court, they, meaning the boys, would rant and rave over missed shots? You're pearlizing per again. <laughs> I only recall one, and both of them did rant and rave. I'm not pluralizing. Mr. Walker, I just want to show you a page of police report to see if it's Excuse me, Honor, that is very argumentative. Right. The, uh, it's just a remark, and it's stricken. Just show them the report. Have you seen a copy of this report that Detective Zola wrote concerning his interview with you of July 25th, 1993? Yes, I have. So you've had a chance to read it before now, is that right? Correct. And did you make any corrections on it and tell Detective Zola that he got it wrong? No, I did not. So let me call your attention to the part that I have been reading to you, okay? Do you see this sentence? 
He stated that as the boys were playing tennis, the parents, mostly the mother, with the father sitting next to her, would comment about a missed tennis shot that either boy would make. Do you see that sentence? Yes. And does it appear then that you told Detective Zoller, plural, that both were missing shots and both were playing tennis? Objection, argumentative. Overall. Do you understand the question? No, I do not. Well, my question is very simple. Are these words here yours, or did Detective Zoller make them up? Objection, argumentative. Sustained. Are those your words? Detective I don't recall. I mean, this is a while ago. Yeah, what I'm well, three months ago. Yeah. That's hard to remember what happened three months ago. Excuse me, that's argumentative, Your Honor. Right, that is argumentative. Objection sustained. Do you find it difficult to remember what happened three months ago? Objection argumentative. Overall. No, I do not. But you find it difficult to know if that boy's boy to me is not a. It's just. Plural or singular to me. Your next question, please. Okay, now what? Counsel, well, you can go back to the podium if you like. I want to take the report. Back. Okay, then before you ask another question, why don't you take it back and go to the podium? <coughs> now, Mr. Walker, let's talk about your current memory, if we could. Who do you remember being the person who was playing tennis with the instructor? <coughs> Lyle. <coughs> and only only Lyle, is that what you're That's saying? That's all now? I recall, yes. So you don't remember boys playing tennis, just one, is that right? Correct. And what vulgar thing did Lyle say? Understand my question? Yes, I understand well, the question. Go ahead, tell us, we can stand it. Different words, I don't choose to say them. Well, I'm asking you to say them. So I understand you're asking me to say them. I don't choose to say them. Excuse me, Officer. Did the counsel not yell? Yes. Please answer the question, Mr. Walker. You're under oath here. I understand. Excuse me, I would object to counsel reminding him that he's under oath. Yes, just ask a question, please. Please tell us what vulgar things Lyle said. Do you recall the exact words? I do not recall the exact words. I recall some of the words that were involved individually, but not in a phrase. Okay, well, tell us the individual words. I feel uncomfortable. Well, go ahead. What words did you hear? Fuck. Uh huh. And, and words similar to that. There are words similar to fuck? Yes, there is. Well, what other words similar to fuck did you hear? I'm, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable. Well, do you recall the words? Uh, I'd rather, I, I feel extremely uncomfortable. All right, you feel uncomfortable with what? Well, it's repeating some of the words. All right, these were words said by who? By, by both, both boys. All right, well, why don't you tell us what those words were? I can't recall them all. Well, just the ones that you do recall. Mm. Mm. Shit, and things like that. I just, it's just, I can't recall all the words. And I don't want to say some of the words that maybe they did not say. All right, your next question, please. So they said fuck and they said shit? Yes. And you had never heard teenage boys say fuck or shit before, is that right? Sustain. Yes, I have, but not to their parents. Okay. And they said fucking shit to their parents, is that yes. right? And they ranted and raved over missed shots. Is yes. that right? They yes. both did, is that right? They both ranted and raved. Over one, missed shots? One over some tennis move. I do not know exactly. I'm not a tennis expert. I do not watch tennis. Let me ask you something. Do you know what the expression missed shot means? No. So then, did you use that term with Detective Zoller, missed shot? Well, missed doing something. What it was, I don't know, because I am not a tennis expert. I do Mr. not follow Walker, tennis. Mr. Walker, my question is, did you, on July 25th, 1993, tell this detective, Detective Zoller, that Eric was <coughs> ranting and raving over a missed shot? 
Yes, that's what I said. And you said that without knowing what a missed shot is? Yes. Now, would you tell me what the ranting and raving was? As far as I could remember, it was to do with tennis. But what was the ranting? When you say someone's ranting, you're characterizing Angry. something. Directed at their parents. He's angry at his parents because he did something you don't know what it is. Correct. But you called it a missed shot. I, what I meant by that was tennis related. <clears throat> and what was the parents saying that got them so angry? I did argument not hear the parents. Argumentative tone. Overall, the answer will stand. Your next question. Now, you said the parents, mostly the mother, would comment about a missed tennis shot. Do you remember telling that to detectives? Yes. And she was the one making comments about tennis. Oh, no. Do you remember telling Detective Zoller that the parents, mostly the mother, would comment about a missed tennis shot? Missed tennis shot to me is something related to tennis because I am not familiar with tennis. Mr. Walker, do you understand my question? I thought I answered it. No. My question is, did you use those words in that phrase to Detective Zoller on July 25th, 1993? I, I may have, yes. Okay. And when you used the word that the parents, mostly the mother, would comment about a missed tennis shot, did you have something in mind? Yes, to refer to tennis, because oh. I'm not a tennis expert. What about the parents' comment? Did you have that in mind? What do you mean to have? It was related to tennis. That's all what I recall. What did the parent say when the related child Related to tennis. I do not know. Shot. It was related to tennis. I'm not a tennis expert. All right, well, let me ask you this. Was it a kind of exchange where the mother was saying, oh, darling, you did a great job, and the son said, fuck shit? No. Was the mother being critical? I, I, I cannot tell whether she was or not. I don't know tennis terms, obviously. You know vulgar terms, though. Excuse me. At your direction. Right <laughs> Overall, the answer will stay. Next was question. the mother using vulgarity? No, she was not. I did and, not hear vulgarity. And when the sons, or one of them, said these vulgar words to the mother, what did the father do? Nothing. Didn't say a word. Is no. that right? When did you first see this case on television, Mr. Walker? Probably three months ago. And how often have you been watching it since then? Not very often. How often is that? I try not to watch it. Why is that, Mr. Walker? Because it's very uncomfortable for me. See, how often have you watched it? Maybe bits and pieces of it because of it's on television, maybe 10, 12 times. Do you get Court TV? Yes, I do. And Court TV has this trial on every single day. Yes, it? it does. And even on the weekends, it replays mm -hmm. it. Yes, it does. And here you knew the people involved. Yes. And therefore, it must interest you, doesn't it? No, it does not. So you I don't do not watch, watch it. it? No. No. And you didn't go to the police and tell them this story in order to get yourself on television, did you? I didn't go to the police. You let your wife, you sent your wife, is that I right? I sent my wife. Yes? I went to the police three days after. And that was the last time I went to the police. You went to the police three Call days them, after? excuse me. Okay, and then you sent your wife in July of I did not send my wife. Okay, and, in fact, and I after told her not to told her not to go? Yes. And so when the police came, they came to you or you went to the Beverly Hills Police Department for they this They came interview? to me. They came to you and the interview was conducted at your home? Yes, it was. And you told me you didn't want to talk to them? No, I didn't say that. So your wife went to the police against your wishes, is that what you're saying? Not against my wishes, but I told her I, I'd prefer not to. Oh, she said it was my civic duty. I see. And so after she said it was your civic duty, you said, well, okay, go to the police. No, I did not. Did she go before she told you it was your civic duty or after? I don't recall. 
You don't recall that? I don't recall when that was said. She just came home one day and said she did it. Oh, so you didn't even know she went to the police so she came home she and said, said she, she did it? She said she was going to and then she did it. Okay. And had your wife been watching the case on TV? She does watch it, yes. She does. Yes. She watches it every day, doesn't she? Correction Black Foundation. Overall. Your answer? Almost every day, yes. And in fact, Mr. Walker, your wife is out here scheduled to be a witness, isn't she? Yes, she is. But she doesn't have any first-hand knowledge, so in order for her to be a witness, you had to be a witness first, right? Excuse me, that's argument. Sustained. <coughs> Objection sustained. Now let's get back to this telephone call that you made, you say, to the Beverly Hills Police. This is on the Wednesday after the Menendezes are killed? Yes. And you're telling these juries that you told a policeman at the Beverly Hills Police Department that you had information about the Menendez murders and that policeman said, I'm not interested. That's right. I called him and I told him I was a swimming pool repair man and I was there that Saturday before the murders and he said so. He said so? Yeah. And you said, well, I saw something that I think is significant and he said, I'm not interested. That's right. He said so. And so you said, okay, and hung up the phone. That's right. And he didn't take your name. No, he did not. And he didn't tell you that anybody would get back to you. That's correct. A moment, Your Honor. Yes. I just let me see. that after the uh, officer who spoke to you said so you just got off the phone that's right uh, you didn't give him your name no I did not he didn't ask for your name no he did not now do you remember speaking to Cynthia Erdely the defense investigator in this case on August 19th, August 19th 1993 yes and did you tell Miss Erdely that they did take your name when uh, the Beverly Hills police officer no, did take your name I did not I also remember telling um, the defense uh, investigator that um, Eric was more quiet and stayed by his parents mostly. Yes. Did you say that Lyle was the one who made the vulgar swear word replies to his parents, which happened several times? Yes. I thought you said here that both of them made vulgar swear they word did. replies. They did. I see. <laughs> and you said you cannot recall, did you not? Well, and did you tell the investigator that the parents remained quiet after Lyle's comments? Yes. And you said you can't recall the exact words used by Lyle, is that right? That's correct. And today you gave us a couple of words, uncomfortably, is that Yes. Right? Are those words that you remember or those words that you're making up? Oh, the words I remember. I do not remember the exact order in which it was set. I see. And did you tell the defense investigator <clears throat> on August 19th that the whole atmosphere between the parents and the boys was tense? It was tense for me. Well, my question is, did you tell the investigator the following sentence, the whole atmosphere between the parents and the boys was tense? It seemed tense, yes. Uh, now, you say that your wife's been watching this trial just about every day, but you haven't. No, I haven't. But she talks to you about it, Mr. Walker, doesn't she? Yes, she does. Have a moment, John.
Now, when you, just one thing at a time, guys. Now, when you talked to Detective Zoller in July, did you tell him at that time that you had had a conversation about the Menendez family with Leon Bartek that Wednesday? I don't recall the day. No, no. My question is, did you tell Detective Zoller in July of 93 that you had had a conversation with Leon Bartek about what you supposedly yes, heard? Yes, I did have You a, told that to Zola. I don't know whether I did or not. I can't recall whether I said that or not. Okay, wait. You don't remember if you told I do that. not. I remember the conversation with Leon Bartek. I do not remember whether I relayed it to the detective. Okay, so you don't know if you told Detective Zola that. Correct. Did you tell Detective Zola that you had discussed this uh, afternoon at the Menendez home with a neighbor of yours? I did not. I don't believe it. I may have discussed it with him. I don't recall it. May have discussed what with whom? The detective. I don't recall. You may have told Detective Zola that you talked to your neighbor about it. Is that what I you may said? have. I, don't, I do not recall. And did you tell Detective Zola in July that you talked about your visit to the Menendez home with your friends? No, I did not. I, did not, I do not recall telling him that either. What's your neighbor's name? Chip Worthinger. Excuse me? Chip Worthinger. How do you spell his last name? I can't help you there. Well, say it again. Worth Singer. Worth Singer? Yes. And he lives on the same street you do? Yes, he does. And who are the friends of yours that you've discussed this with? I mean, their names? Yes, their names. Mm -hmm. One would be a friend of mine called Peppy. Pepe? Mm -hmm. What's his last name? Marciano. Marciano? Mm -hmm. And when did you tell Mr. Marciano about what you saw or heard at the Menendez home? It would be shortly afterwards. Shortly after <coughs> August 19th, 1989? Yes. Where do we find Mr. Marciano? I, I don't have his address. Well, how do you get in touch with him when you want to talk I, to him? I call him. Yes, you have his phone number? Uh, yes, I have his phone number. Uh, may I approach the witness with a piece of paper, Your Honor? I do, I do not. I do not have it in memory. You have it with you? No, I don't. You have it at home? Yes. So if Ms. Early were to call you later today, you'd be able to give it to her? Yes. And you have your neighbor's phone number? Yes. What other friends do you think you discussed this with shortly after? Uh, David Greenfield. And you have his phone number? I have it at home. And when you say shortly after, you mean all in the month of August of 1989? Uh, yes. Now, did you tell Miss Early on August 19th, 1993, that you had discussed uh, what you saw at the Menendez home with Mr. Bartek? I don't recall. Did you tell her that you had discussed it with your neighbor? I, I don't recall whether I did or not. Did you tell her whether you discussed it with Pepe Marciano and David Greenfield? Of those people, I know I didn't. So you don't remember what you said to Ms. Erdley on August 19th, 1994? I remember what I said, but I'm, I'm not going to bring in my neighbor. What relevant had that got to do with? Well, I asked what am I going to tell her? I'm going to tell my neighbors. That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, Why I would tell her that I told my neighbors? Well, she talked to you about Mr. Bartek at some length, did she not? She, she may have, but that's... Uh, no, my question is, did she talk to you about Mr. Bartek? She did talk to me about Mr. Bartek, and yes. Did you tell that's her, relevant. Did you tell her that you had told Mr. Bartek about what you saw at the Menendez home? Yes, I did. You told her that? Well, we talked about it. He, you he, told her that? I don't recall whether I told her that or not. So you don't recall what you told Ms. Erdley on August 19th, 1993. That be fair to say? I told her the same thing I've just told you. No, no, that's not my question. My question is, did you tell her on August 19th of this year that you had had a conversation with Mr. Bartek shortly after the Menendezes were killed about what you saw at the Menendez home? I, I do not. So you... Now, do you recall that you also spoke to Ms. Erdley on Thursday, September 9th, 1993? I don't recall what day that would be. There was another conversation, though, with Ms. Erdley. There was. 
And do you recall if on that occasion she talked to you about Mr. Bartek? There was a, a conversation about Bartek. And do you recall if you told her on Thursday, September 9th, that you had had a conversation with Mr. Bartek about what you observed at the Menendez home? I don't recall. So you have difficulty remembering what you said to Ms. Erdely on August 19th, 1993 and September 9th, 1993 about this subject. Is that right? About my conversation with Bartek, yes. Okay, but you have no difficulty remembering what you saw or heard on August 19th, 1989. Is that your testimony? Objection. It's a big difference. Overall, the answer will stand. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any redirect? <coughs> His wife wants Mr. Walker, to you have spoken to Mr. Bartek about what you saw on August the 19th on more than one occasion? Yes, I have. I think I'll stay here. Did we, um, did, when you spoke with what, the defense investigator on one of those two days, did you indicate um, to her why you would not be able to recognize the man that you assume was the tennis coach? Yes. And why did you tell, what did you tell her in that regard? Well, he was back in the corner where the, the tennis uh, uh, court was covered. And the homes that you referred to in Hancock Park that you service on Saturdays, were you servicing all three of those homes on Saturdays in August of 1989? Uh, I believe so. At least two of them I know for sure. And you spoke with me early um, on either of those two patients, the defense investigator. Did you tell her about your normal service calls on Saturdays? No, I didn't. Your Honor, I'd like to approach uh, two things. You said you've talked to Mr. Bartek on numerous occasions, more than one occasion. I, I talked to him constantly. Uh, uh, may I finish the question? Yes. You just told Mrs. Bozanich that you spoke to Mr. Bartek on more than one occasion about what you observed at the Menendez home. Is that right? Yes. Did you tell Ms. Erdley about any of those occasions? I don't recall. Did you tell Detective Zoller about any of those occasions? I don't know. I didn't. Your Honor, I'd like to approach the witness with a piece of paper so he can write the addresses of the homes on Lucerne that he serviced. I don't, I don't have them that available in memory. You go there every Saturday, Mr. Bartek. Mr. Walker. Excuse My name me, Mr. Walker. Walker. You go there every Saturday. Yes, I don't. I could be right at that place, and you could ask me the address, and I wouldn't remember. Like You're I told you, it's like a train. Saturday for yes, four years. it's like a trained rat. Okay, well. <laughs> you just do it. You don't look at the address. I have it all written down for the billing. Just write the names of the families. They're in the 400 North Block of Lucerne. All right, Council, let's not uh, make any gratuitous remarks here. All right, have you done that? Yes. Okay, anything else? Do you send these, these folks um, a monthly bill for pool service? Yes, I do. And do you keep records when uh, they pay you? Mm, yeah, <laughs> very loose records. Well, you do do taxes every year, don't you? Yes. And so you have to have records for yes, that, I, don't you? Yes, I have that. I have money records, yes. Now, you say that the tennis coach was in the covered portion of the, uh, of the court? Correct. What do you mean by covered? Well, I don't mean covered. I mean the sides have canvas on them. All four sides have canvas on it, doesn't it? Except for the one part that's open. The gate? No. There's a whole open section on the west side. Is a whole side with no fencing? Yes. And no, no fencing? Yes. Just right, open. That's open to the, the walkway and the pool. Okay, and there's no fencing there at all. It's just open. Yes. And where is the net in relation to that open side? Is it perpendicular to that or is it parallel? Well, it's that open part and then it would go, like the open part would be here, the net would go across. Let me approach if I could. Yeah, I think perpendicular. Yeah. Just watch your talk for any Mr. Walker. That way you have to guess. Can we have this looking like Let's first see if we could draw it. Here, let's do something. Good job. Thank you. Yes, dear. Well, let's first have him draw it and see if it's worth preserving. Artiste. Okay, it doesn't have to be art, it just has to be. Close? No, it just has to communicate. Designs <coughs> what? This 
All right, very good. But now what I need you to do is to do one of those directional things, north, south, east, west. Why don't you, before you do that, why don't you put in uh, where the table was? Approximately here, I would say. Oh, okay. And, and this is the pool equipment over here in this corner. Watch, put in label of pool equipment. Equip. Yeah. Okay, now you've made a W. That's west? As far as my recollection, that's west. And that's east and that's north. So now you're putting the table on the south side. Yes. And now you're putting the, oh, is this the opening here? Yes. That's on the south side now also, is that correct? Yes. Now didn't you testify the opening was on the west side closest to the house? No. No? No, I didn't. Draw me the house or just the back. The house is over here somewhere. And don't you remember me asking you, Mr. Walker, if you were, if what you were describing? Well, it'd be the west side, yes. The west side of the tennis court. This would be the east side, this would be the west side. The west side would be open. Okay. West end, kind of, that's what I meant by west. Your Honor, I think this is clear enough. <laughs> All right, and the way you uh, drew a little square and the W for west, that's where the house is, is that Did right? you write house there, Mr. Walker? All right, that'll be exhibit 361. Oh, Your Honor, before I finish with this witness, could we have a brief break to look at some Sure. All right, we'll take a recess, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll resume at 20 minutes after the hour. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't form any final opinions about it. We'll see you back here at 20 after. Well, he was on the east side. Now, would you just draw like a circle and put the word coach, and that's where he was? And would you show me where uh, Lyle Menendez was when he was playing with the coach? Over here. Okay, we just make an L. And show me where Eric Menendez was when you say you saw him on the court? Well, he was over here. Okay. Would you do an E rather than a dot? I sure can. Okay. Now, keep that diagram in front of you, if you will. I'd like to uh, read to you, Mr. <coughs> some of your testimony uh, a little earlier this afternoon, okay? Okay. Um, this is uh, the unofficial transcript for today, Your Honor, and right now this is numbered page 51. Starting at line 15. I don't have a copy of this. Uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll share it with you while I read it. Isn't there another one sitting right there? No. No, that's a different part of the same thing. Okay, do you remember my asking you, uh, starting at line 17, right, but the patio furniture was brought right up to the Osaka. And question 15, question. The patio is off to the right of what you're talking about here. Your answer, right. But the patio furniture was brought right up to the tennis court. <clears throat> question. My question, though, was the, was the west side of the tennis court is the closest part to the back of the house, correct? Answer, correct. Question. There's a concrete walkway between the back of the house and the tennis court, right? Answer, yes question and you're saying someone had put a patio set there your answer yes question and that's where they were sitting your answer yes yes you remember that testimony this afternoon yes your honor i have two photographs i'd like to mark um 362 362 and 363 all right Let's go. Mr. Walker, I'm going to show you these two photographs, Mark 362 and 363. 
Now, do you recognize the back of the house depicted in those photographs? I don't recognize this, no. You don't recognize Which that. photograph was it? Uh, he's holding in his hand, Your Honor, 362. <laughs> you don't recognize that as the back of the Menendez house? I don't reckon this is not the back that I was referring to. The house has another back? It has a portion that I'm referring to, which is this portion here. The house goes like this, like an L-shaped. This is the back of the house that I'm referring okay, to. Okay, well, let me orient you to this, the wall that you drew, drew here where you made a little box house. Yeah. You see this red wall here? Correct. Okay, why don't we assume for the sake of my question that this wall here is this? Yeah, that looks like it, sure. That does it would like be. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you say this wall here is this, what do you mean by this? Your Honor, what I would like to do is make a one on the diagram for the wall I was referring to, which is, this is confusing, but the We've just East without, wall of the back of the house. Without identifying what is on the diagram, you put a one uh, next to it. Okay. I put a one next to it. And now, Mr. Walker, would you put a one on the wall of the house in the photograph that corresponds to the wall with the one on it in the diagram? Now, Mr. Walker, you recognize that this wall that you've marked one is the wall closest to the tennis court. Correct. Just as it is in the diagram. Yes. And you just heard your testimony that the patio set was put between the wall of the house and the tennis court. No, I never said that between the wall of the house and the tennis court. Between the back of the house and the tennis I court. I drew where it was. Now, I'm asking you if you recall just hearing your testimony that the patio set was between the back of the house and the tennis court. No, I do not recall saying that. Oh, I just read it to you, Mr. Walker. Judge, not a minute. Sustained. All right, now, where is the wood? That's, that's, not, that's not what I meant, obviously. Okay, well, let me ask you something. That's about, why I drew it. Let me ask you something about your diagram. What is next to that table in the diagram? Besides the tennis court on what side? What's on the other there's side? A, there's a pool over here. So and then there's a And then there's a guest house over here. So now you're saying that the table was between the tennis court and the pool and not between the tennis court and the back of the house? As I drew it. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that I'm saying the patio furniture was right up against the tennis court. And are you saying it was between the tennis court and the swimming pool or between the tennis court and the back of the house? I'm saying that it is up right up against the tennis court as I said. Now my question is is it between the tennis court and the pool, or between the tennis court and the back? It's of right the house? up against the tennis court, is where it is. Mr. Walker, do you understand my question? Yes, I do. Do you understand what the word between means? <laughs> yes, I do, and I've made a diagram. Of, I don't understand the problem. Why don't we just try to answer the question, okay? I did. It's the patio furniture is right up against the tennis court. Is it between the tennis court and the pool? or between the tennis court and the back of the it house? It is closer between the tennis and the pool. So it's between the tennis court and the pool yes. is what you're now testifying? Yes. And the pool is not directly behind no, the back of the house? And is it your recollection, as you've drawn in that diagram, if not might approach again, Your Honor, yes. that between The, the table and the actual surface of the tennis court on this west end, this whole west half of the tennis court, there is nothing. Is that your testimony? I don't understand that. What do you mean there is nothing? What's between the table and stand and the tennis court and the surface of the court? Well, you can see directly, if you were sitting here, you can see directly onto the west side of the tennis court. Can you walk directly onto the west side of the tennis court? Yeah, you can walk straight to it. You can walk straight on. There's nothing between the table and the surface of the court. Is that what you're saying? Yes, there was nothing between there and the tennis court. It's just open. It was open, yes. There's no fence. There was no fence between here and there, no. I have some more photos for you.
364. Mr. Walker, let me show you 364. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Swimming pool. The swimming pool, does that also show the Menendez house? Yes, it does. Does it also show part of the tennis court? Yes, it does. Okay, now let me show you 365. You see that? Yes. Does that show the swimming pool? Part of it. Does that show a space between the pool and the tennis court? Yes. Does that show a fence running down that west side of the tennis court? Yes, it does. I've never heard of it. Anything else on behalf of the uh, of the defendant, Mr. Burt? Mr. Walker. Who was the first person you spoke to about what date you were at the house? Do you recall? No, I don't recall. And do you remember when you spoke to Detective Zoller in July of 1993, over four years uh, after you had been to the house, that he asked you, well, what date was it that you were at the house? Yes, he did ask me. And what did you say to him? How did you describe what date you were there? I described it as the day before. The murders. The day before the murders. Saturday, the day before the murders. Well, did you know what day the uh, killings had taken place when you were having the conversation with Zoller? You mean the, the exact day and month? Yeah. I don't recall whether I did or not. Did he tell you what day the no, killings he did not. took place? Mm -hmm. Did he ask you, well, Mr. Uh, Walker, what day were you there? Tell me the day you were there. He didn't ask me. And your your best memory now is what you told him was you were there the Saturday before the killing. Correct. And when you gave that statement to, to him, did you know what date the killing had taken place? I'm sure I did. What date did you think it had taken place when you told him you were there the Saturday before the killing? Well, it was August 20th. And how did you know that? I don't recall how it would know. I don't recall where, where I would remember that date. And is it your testimony that you went to the home shortly after you received the call from Mr. Bartek? Yes. Would have been that day or the next day? After he called? Yes. It could be a week. It could be, it could be a lead time of a week to three days to one day. It all depends how busy I am. And you have no recollection as to when it was you went after receiving the call, correct? No, I do not. And before you came to court today, did you have a discussion with Mr. Bartek about what date it was you were over at the uh, house? No. Did he tell you that he made his discovery that there was something wrong with the pool two Wednesdays before the killing took place? Never mentioned that to me. And if that had taken, if he made that discovery two days before the killings took place, two Wednesdays before the killing took place, and told you about it, then when you would have been over there would have been before August 19th, correct? If he's correct? Well, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be two weeks. It wouldn't take me two weeks to get to a repair job. Right. So if, if he was over there two weeks before August 19th, and found out there was something wrong with the pool and sent you over at that time, that would not be consistent with what your memory is. Is that right? I don't understand the question. Repeat it, please. If he, if he made the discovery two Wednesdays before the killings that mm -hmm. there was something wrong with the pool and sent you over there shortly after he made those discoveries, that would have been before the time that you say you were over there. Is that right? 
It, it, uh, it's compound. You're, uh, you're gathering too many facts there. Right you had down. no discussion with Mr. Bartek about when he was that he sent you over there, correct? No. And did you have a discussion with him before you came to court today about the conversation you testified about, about saying to him after you were over there that you had overheard some conversation between the boys? <coughs> I don't follow the question. Exactly. Did you meet with Mr. Bartek in the district attorney's office before you testified here today? I have spoken to him before I testified, yes. Did you meet with him in the district attorney's office before you testified today, Judge, uh, this afternoon? Judge Vegas is the term meet. Well, overall, do you understand the nature of the question? Did you see him there? I, I have seen him today, yes. And did you see him in the district attorney's office today? I have, I've seen him outside the courtroom. Did you see it? Did you have a meeting where you and the district attorney and Detective Zoller were present in the same room with Mr. Bartek? Not in the district attorney's office. We've all been together. I didn't talk to him. Objections overall. The answer will stand. Did you have any conversation? I didn't with have him? any conversation with him about that. About the conversation. Correct. All right. And did you talk to him at all about um, whether he had any records which would show when you were over there? I've talk to him and he says he doesn't have any records. And did you see, did you receive payments in the form of checks from him before August 19th? Um, I'm sure I have, yes. And those would have been checks that you received from him that would have uh, included lump sums for more than one job, correct? It could be lump sums or it could be just one job. That's the way I'm paid, either in multiples of jobs or it could just be a single job. That's all I have to say. Any redirect? No. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. All right, sure. Mr. Walker, I want to just focus you for a moment on dates, okay? You follow along with me. The, the Saturday before August 19th would have been August 12th. You agree? If you say so, I have to take your word for it. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. The calendar is pretty reliable. Okay. Seven days before the 19th would have been the 12th, correct? Correct. And so the Wednesday before the 12th would have been the 9th. Okay. Right? And so two Wednesdays before the time when the Menendezes were killed would have been August 9th, correct? I'll, I'll go along with that if, if okay. that's correct. So hypothetically, if Mr. Bartek had discovered on Wednesday the 9th that uh, this pool and spa needed repair, you wouldn't have waited until the 19th to go fix it. Is that Correct. Right? So it's possible, isn't it, that if he did discover it on the 9th and told you that it's the 12th that you went out to that house? No, that's not possible. That's not possible because it's your insistence that after hearing these people were killed, that reminded you that you had been there the very day before. Is that right? I'm not going to forget about this kind of an incident that happened just the day before. You're not going to forget about two teenage boys using two rude words the day before. Is that right? right. All right. Matter. You are now arguing with the witness. I'm not sure. All right. Anything else? No. All right. You may step down. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Your next witness? Mr. Bartek. My name is Leon Bartek. Can you spell your last name? B-A-R-T-E-K. Mr. Bartek, what do you do for a living, please? I'm in the swimming pool service maintenance business. In August of 1989, um, did you have an arrangement where you took care of the Menendez swimming pool? Yes, I did. And was that located at 722 North Elm Drive in the city of Beverly Hills? Yes, it was. And in August of 1989, do you know for how long you had been taking care of the Menendez pool? I've been taking care of the Menendez pool as long as they lived at the house. And do you remember approximately when that was that they moved into the house? Uh, not approximately, but uh, like I serviced the pool during the time they lived there. In the house. And how often did you service the Menendez pool? Twice a week. And do you remember what days of the week that you serviced the pool? I would come there on a Monday and Thursday. Did you ever refer out repair jobs to other people to take care of the Menendez pool? If there was an electrical problem or a plumbing problem that I couldn't deal with, I would hire someone else to, to do the repair, yes. 
And did you hire Mr. Grant Walker, who just left the courtroom, to take care of a problem at the Menendez Pool in August of 1989? Yes, I did. As, to your knowledge, was that the first time you had hired Mr. Walker to do a job for the Menendezes? Uh, yes, it was. All right. And do you remember when it was that you contacted Mr. Walker um, and asked him to go to the Menendez house? It was the week of the murder. All right. Do you remember what day? It was uh, about the middle of the week when I discovered the problem, and then I called Grant to, and sent him there. All right. And so do you remember if you called him the same day that you discovered the problem or a different day that you discovered the problem? I don't remember. It could have been the same day that I called him or the next day. And the week before the killings, um, do you have a recollection that you went there on your normal days or did you go there on different days? In other words, did you go there on Monday and Thursday or different days? I would go there Monday and Thursday. Unless there was a problem, I might stop by on another day. But generally, I stuck to a certain schedule. Okay. And it's your recollection that you contacted um, Mr. Walker in the middle of that week and told him about the difficulty at the pool, is that correct? Yes. You remember the nature of the difficulty? Yes, uh, there was a problem with the spa override switch. Uh, the spa would not function properly. And where was the spa override switch located at the Menendez property? It was located uh, right at the end of the uh, pool, in the shallow end of the pool, close to the spa area. Okay, was there another switch closer to the house? Well, it was, uh, it was right on the house, uh, the, the spa switch. Uh. Um, at some point, did you learn that Mr. and Mrs. Menendez had been killed? Uh, I discovered it uh, the Monday after the murder. I, uh, Do you, can you tell us how, um, how it was that you heard about it? Well, it my schedule was to come there on a Monday and Thursday, and when I came there, I saw the uh, area fenced off. I didn't know what the problem was, so I just... Uh, uh, bypassed the house. I, I knew there was a problem, but I didn't know what the problem was. Could you describe what it was you saw that led you to this conclusion that it was fenced off? In other words, was there a big fence up or was there some other sort of barricade? Well, there was like tape around the uh, pool area, the gate that I would go to the pool. It was uh, barricaded with like tape. And when you say tape, are you talking about the police type of tape? Yes. Okay. And that was at the back of the house, is that back correct? Back of the house. Right. Shortly after that, did you have a conversation with Mr. Walker about um, something that he had done at the Menendez home prior to Mr. Men Mrs. Menendez dying? Uh, yes, I called him and I asked him if he uh, repaired the problem. And, and he informed me he repaired the problem. Do you remember when it was that you had this conversation with Mr. Walker about repairing the problem? It was after the murder, a day or two, perhaps Monday or Tuesday. Of the, the was this after you had already gone to the house and found the police tape there or before? Uh, afterward. Okay. And during that period, when you had the conversation with Mr. Walker, did he indicate anything to you about what he had seen or heard while he had been at the home on that Saturday? Uh, he mentioned to me that he overheard a, an argument. And did he tell you the nature of the argument? Did he describe it for you? Uh, not in detail. He just said he overheard an argument between the father and the son. All right. And um, did he mention to you any more detail about it than what you've told the juries? Uh, no. All right. Now, um, how was it that you paid Mr. Walker for the services he performed for you? I would pay him by check. And how, how soon after the jobs did you pay him normally? Generally right after the job was done, a day or two afterwards. Mr. Um, Bartek, have you been asked by the um, police and the prosecution to look for anything that, any kind of records or checks that you might have for Mr. Walker? Yes. And did you bring the originals with you to court today? Yes. All right, Your Honor, I have here um, two pages, um, eight and a half by 11, which have three checks, the front and the back Xerox. May I have this marked as exhibit, I think it's 366? Yes. I believe counsel have, have copies, is that correct? Yes. All right, may, may I approach, please? Yes. I'm gonna show you this um, exhibit 366. I'd like you to take, the, you have the checks right with you, right? Yes. Would you please take them out of your pocket? All right, and the three original checks that you have with you are dated the um, 21st of August of 1989, the 15th of September of 1989, and the 2nd of October of 1989. Is that correct? Yes. And those original checks match this exhibit, which is now 366. Is that correct? That is correct. And when we asked you to bring some sort of documentation, why did you choose these particular three checks? Because these are the records I have. Uh, all right, and are these the only checks that you ever made out to Mr. Walker? 
No, I made uh, other checks uh, for previous jobs. Now, do you recall how much Mr. Walker told you he was going to charge you for the job that he'd done at the Menendez home? He charged me a regular service call. And how much is that? Uh, $30. Now, the checks that are Xerox on Exhibit 366 are for more than $30. Isn't that true? That's true. Could you explain why that is? Because I would pay him for more than one job. He, he might do over a period of a few weeks uh, several jobs. Now, to the best of your recollection, which of those three checks represents your payment to Mr. Walker for the work he had done at the Menendez home on the, the 19th? The one of August the 21st. All right. Now, when you spoke to Mr. Walker shortly after learning about the homicides, did he indicate to you that he had been there, how, how far in advance of the homicides he had been at the house? Do you understand my question? It was kind of bad. Well, he was there on the Saturday uh, before the murder. And did he discuss that fact with you? Yes, that okay. he was. I, I asked him when. Uh, when did he do the repair? Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Cross examination. Mr. Bartek, when did you first talk to someone from the prosecution in this case about these issues? Perhaps a month or two ago, just um, by memory. A month or two ago? And which member of the prosecution team did you talk to a month or two ago? Uh, I had Detective Zola call me. And do you recall what you told Detective Zola during that call? Uh, specifically, no. Have you ever seen any notes of that call to Detective Zoller or any police report that contains what uh, you said to him? Uh, no. Did you tell Detective Zoller when you spoke to him about a month ago that Mr. Walker told you he had overheard an argument between the father and one of the sons? I uh, possibly did. I don't recall. I, I'm not asking for possibilities. Do you remember if you said that to Detective Zoller? Uh, I don't remember. Do you remember? When you, is there, strike that. When is the first time that you do remember telling someone, anyone, about uh, Mr. Walker having told you that when he was at the Menendez house, he overheard an argument between the father and the son? When was the first time? Yeah. Whenever I talked to Detective Zola, I, um, Mentioned I had some information. I don't just recall what all the information was. Uh, well, okay, but but you, I think we've but, just established that you don't know if a month ago you told Detective Zoller that particular piece of information. Would you so, repeat the question again? Well, let me ask you this way: Isn't it true that today is the first time you ever told anybody that Mr. Walker told you that he overheard a, an argument between the father no. and son? No. You think it was an earlier day? Absolutely. Okay. When was it, and to whom? I, I mentioned I talked to Detective Zola. And so you're telling us that you, before today, you told Detective Zola that Mr. Walker told you that he overheard an argument. Is that yes. what you're saying? Your Honor, I'd like to approach. All right. Mr. Bartek, I want to make sure you understand my question, okay? Okay. Today, did you tell any of the three people sitting at that end of the council table, Mrs. Bozanich, Mr. Kuriyama, or Detective Zola, did you tell any of them today that Mr. Walker told you that he had overheard an argument between the Menendez father and one of the sons? Did you tell them that today? Y yes, I did. And did you ever tell any of these three people that before today? I mentioned something of the fact to Detective Sola. Okay. And how many times before today have you talked to Detective Zoller? Perhaps three or four times. Three to four times. And was each of those times over the phone, or were any of those times in person? It was over the phone. And do you recall on which of those occasions you mentioned to him that you had information from Walker about an argument between the Menendezes? Possibly the first time. Now, if we could focus on the first time 
What month do you believe it was that you talked to Detective Zoller for the first time? I, I didn't make a note of that. As I mentioned, it was somewhere in perhaps a month or two ago. He, uh, he called me for information uh, regarding Grant Walker. This was the reason why he first called. He asked me if I sent Grant Walker to the Menendez house. Okay. This is specifically the first information that he wanted if, if right. I sent him there. Now, let me ask you this. Do you recall, and do you think it was in that first contact with Detective Zoller that you mentioned what Walker had told you? Uh, I think so. Yes. All right. Now, do you recall also having a telephone contact with a woman investigator named Cynthia Erdely? Yes, I do. And did you understand that she was a defense investigator? Uh, yes, I did. And did you speak to her before or after you spoke to Detective Zoller for the first time? I don't remember if it was before or after. And do you remember Ms. Erdely speaking to you about this job that you had sent Mr. Walker on and whatever you knew about that job? Yes, I do. And if I were to tell you that your conversation with Ms. Erdely was Wednesday, September 1st, 1993, would that refresh your recollection as to when it was? Yes. It, Does that I, sound right? About, about a couple of months. Okay. So just. Now, do you recall Ms. Erdely asking you what your uh, regular appointment date was for servicing the Menendez pool? <clears throat> I don't remember if she asked me that question. Um, I don't recollect. Do you still have the account for that pool? Yes, I do. And did you tell that to Ms. Erdely? Uh, no, I don't remember her asking. Okay. Do you remember telling her in 1989 you went there every, there being the Elm Drive house, every Wednesday between 1 and 2 p.m. and performed the pool maintenance that took about 45 minutes? I don't remember. I, my regular schedule was Monday and Thursday. Occasionally, if there was a problem or a win, I might come on a Wednesday. Uh, there might be a possibility I made a Wednesday call if, uh, if I didn't get through. Uh, so, But mostly my schedule was Monday and Thursday. Mr. Bartek, isn't it true you told Ms. Erdley your schedule was every Wednesday and you never mentioned Monday and Thursday to her at all? I don't remember that, no. What's your schedule now? I come there on a Wednesday now. It's switched from two calls to one call. So now you the go there schedule, every Wednesday. The schedule was changed, yes. I may have been confused, but the schedule was changed. So when you spoke to Ms. Erdely in, on Wednesday, September 1st, 1993, you might not have remembered at that time when it was you serviced the Menendez uh, pool when they were alive? Is well, the fact saying? I switched from two times to one time, that possibly could have just elapsed my mind. But I, I, like I said, I switched the schedule there and only come once a week. When did you switch the schedule? Uh, a couple of years ago or so. All right, let me ask you this then. Did you say to her, to Miss Erdley, in 1989, he went there every Wednesday between 1 and 2 p.m. and performed the pool maintenance that took about 45 minutes? He would mostly see Kitty Menendez, who was usually pleasant. Do you remember telling Miss Erdley that? Uh, I would uh, talk to Kitty, yes. Do you remember saying the words I just read to you? I remember is telling her, yes, that I did talk to Kitty, yes, that I remember. Did you tell her that you went there every Wednesday? That I don't remember. Did you tell her that you were there the Wednesday before the killings? I don't recall that I said that, no. Did you tell her that uh, you could not recall who was there that Wednesday? I don't remember telling that, no. Did you tell her that the Wednesday after the murders you went there and found it was roped off and security guards were there? I may have told her security guards were there. In fact, uh, I went there, passed by there a month or two after the murder and there were always security guards there. My Even, question is, did you tell her you went there the Wednesday after the murders? I possibly may have, but I don't recall. Now, didn't Ms. Erdley ask you to look up your records for, for uh, any records that you had relating to the Menendez home? I told her at that time that my records were in the garage and boxes and that I would look them up, that I didn't have any at the present time. And I, I, Did you I, go to the garage and look in the boxes? Well, yes, uh, several weeks afterward. So yes, I finally did. But at that time, I didn't, uh, so you I had didn't no have records. any records. So you can't prove in writing that you went there on Mondays and Thursdays rather than Wednesdays. Is that right? I can't prove it in writing, no. Now, did you also tell Ms. Erdely that uh, 
you discovered the spa controls were being overridden by the pool controls on your own. In other words, the Menendezes didn't point it out to you. You knew it. I don't recall saying that, no. You don't recall saying that? Did you tell Ms. Erdley that you may have made this discovery two Wednesdays before the murders? I don't remember that. I said that, no. Did you tell her that you called Grant Walker to do the repairs and they were done a few days later to the best of your recollection? I told her that Grant Walker did the repairs, yes. No, I'm asking you if you told her that you called Grant Walker to do the repairs and they were done a few days later after you made the discovery to the best of your recollection. I don't recall saying that, no. So you have a great deal of difficulty remembering what you said on September 1st, 1993. Is that fair to say? Well, you mentioned the fact that uh, this is when I was first called. I see. This is before you and Mr. Walker got together and decided what you remembered. Is that what you're saying? Objection. Very argumentative. Very argumentative? Yes. Ask another unargumentative question. Okay. Mr. Bartek, this is what you told Ms. Erdley before you and Mr. Walker talked. Objection. Assumes facts not in evidence. Is this what you said to Ms. Erdley before? Let me strike that. Was your discussion with Ms. Erdley before you and Mr. Walker talked about these issues? Objection vague. When in 1993 was the first time you and Mr. Walker talked about these issues? Objection. Assumes facts not in evidence. You talked to Mr. Walker about this today, didn't you? Yes, I did. Did you talk to Mr. <clears throat> Walker about this before today? In 1993? Yes. And uh, when was the last time you talked to Mr. Walker about this before today? When, uh, when the matter first came up that uh, we would be I mean, subpoenaed to uh, testify. And when were you subpoenaed? Uh, I have the subpoena somewhere here. Okay. Uh, I subpoenaed on November 1st. 93. Here's the uh, subpoena. So you were subpoenaed two months after you spoke to Ms. Erdely, is that correct? Uh, yes. And you talked to Mr. Walker after you were subpoenaed? Yes. And now your memory is different than it was when you spoke to Ms. Erdely, is that right? Objection argumentative. Is your memory today different than it was when you spoke to Ms. Erdely? Uh, no. Did Mr. Walker change your memory in any way in talking to him? No, Mr. Walker did not change my memory. Did you tell Ms. Erdley that Mr. Walker told you about uh, overhearing an argument between the Menendez father and son? I possibly did say that, yes. Possibly you don't remember? Uh, possibly I did say that. I, I don't recall the, the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Bartik, might it refresh your recollection about the conversation with Ms. Erdley if I show you her report? Yes. Okay, have you read it? Now, M Mr. Bartek, is there any mention in there, in Ms. Erdely's report, a bit, well, strike that. Does reading the report refresh your memory as to whether or not you told Ms. Erdely about your conversation with Mr. Walker concerning his overhearing an argument? I'll repeat that again. Does reading Ms. Erdely's report refresh your memory as to whether or not you told her that Mr. Walker told you that he had overheard an argument between Mr. Menendez and one of his sons? If, if I recall, I did tell her that uh, my repairman overheard an argument, yes. Is it in her report? Uh, I don't see it here. Let's see. It's not in the report, is it? No, I don't see it there, no. But what is in the report is that you told her that you went there every Wednesday, that you were there the Wednesday before well, the murder. Well, it's possibly I could have got confused since I go there Wednesdays now, and I just wasn't thinking. But my schedule at that time, as I mentioned, and I reemphasize that correct. Right, let me make that correction, if that's possible. Well, did you make that correction? Oh, you had two months between the time you spoke so, to Ms. Erdley and the time you were subpoenaed. Did you call her up to make the correction? Uh, no, I didn't. And she had asked you, had she not, for you to please check to see if you had any documentation and to please contact her. At if that time, I didn't up. find any. I, as the case progressed, well, then I searched and I found these checks. Uh huh. And uh, but she had left her number with you for you to contact her. Had yes, I did. She did, and I'm. I don't remember what I did with it. I misplaced it, and I forgot her name. You misplaced her number, and you forgot her name. Is that yes. right? Yes. 
Well, when you spoke to Detective Zoller, did you tell him that you had given some uh, misinformation to the defense investigator? No. no. <clears throat> now, you said that uh, apart from the checks that are before you now, that you had other checks made earlier for previous jobs that Mr. Walker did. Is that right? Well, that would not pertain to this well, job. Well, yes. that, that wasn't the question. Yes. Did you bring those earlier checks? No. no. So let me ask you a hypothetical. If Mr. Uh, Walker had done the work on the Menendez pool on August 12th, is there a chance that you would have paid him for that before the 21st of August? I generally would pay him promptly, a day or two or within a week. I would pay as soon as the job was done. This is the way I did things. So is that yes, that if he Yes. Had, if okay. he did the job, then the job was paid for immediately afterward. It would not go on for two, three weeks. Okay. But you didn't bring us any checks that you might have written between August 12th and August 21st, did you? No. Well, there's a check here August 21st. Yeah, but you didn't bring us the earlier ones. No. Now, um, did Mr. Walker tell you what this argument between the Menendez father and his son was about? No, he didn't. He did not go into detail, and I didn't ask him. Did he tell you which son? Yes. Now, your testimony is that you had this conversation with Mr. Walker just a, few a day or two after you learned the Menendezes were killed. Is that right? That's right. And you learned the Menendezes were killed a day or so after they were killed? Yes. All right. So tell me, uh, what son did Mr. Walker tell you the argument was with? He said it was Eric. He specifically used the name Eric? Yes. And he used the name Eric on August, what, 21st or 22nd of 1989? Yes. Now, Mr. Oh, he just, no, excuse me, he just said he overheard an argument between the father and the son. And which son? Eric, right? Yes. Right. Now, Mr. Bartek, Mr. Walker's testified here, just before you, that he didn't know the name Eric in, on August 21st or 22nd, 1989. Well, I mentioned he, he said the, the I mentioned he, asked, he said the father and the son. No, 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 you just said he told he you the name. Isn't it your testimony that he told you the name Eric when he told you about well, this? Well, this was later on. This was later oh, on. Oh, this is later on. When yeah. was later on? Uh, as, as this case started. As this case started? You mean as this case started being televised every day? No. It, uh, when, when did this case start, according to you, Mr. Bartek? Well, I, I don't specifically know just when it started, but uh, I don't specifically know that date or the time that he mentioned this to him, I, I did ask him, I said, well, which one was it? And he said, well, it was, it was Eric. It was when did you talk to him about this? Uh, this was uh, after the murder. It's, uh, okay, now you've just said that it was right after the murder that you talked to him and that he mentioned Eric. Now you're backing off that, isn't that right? And you're changing that. No, I'm saying that uh, the first wait, time... Wait when was the next time you talked to Mr. Walker about this? Well, there are a number of times, I mean, so that we, we talked about this. Yes, I, I mean, want to know the second time. The second time? Yes. That, that we discussed? This argument that he claims to have overheard between Mr. Menendez and a son. Objection, argumentative. I specifically don't remember just when we discussed... Uh, I mean, I can't give you a certain day. Give me a year. Uh, well, it was uh, when, uh, when, they, when they found out that the boys did the murder. I mean, it's... When they got arrested, is yes. that right? And you're saying when they got arrested, Mr. Walker told you, I overheard an argument between the Mr. Menendez and Eric. Is that right? No. No? No, he uh, mentioned that he overheard the argument whenever I talked to him about, uh, you know, about, the, about the, the family being murdered. Okay. Well, when the boys got arrested, what was the discussion with Mr. Walker then? Well, we were both surprised. Surprised? Yes. And is it then that he said, by the way, the one that I heard the father arguing with was Eric? He didn't say it in that terms, no. Well, when did he say it was Eric? That's after the boys well, got arrested I can't or later? Um, I'll just be very honest with you. It's not like honesty. I specifically just don't remember what, 
period of time. Mm, maybe went. it was today then, if no, you don't remember. No, definitely not. Well, when was the next time you had a, you said you, that you had a conversation with Mr. Walker about this when the case got started. Did you mean when the brothers got arrested or some later date? Well, we started discussing it when uh, we found out that uh, Grant would be subpoenaed. Uh, and so uh, that's when we started discussing it. I mean. So you started discussing it uh, after the, when, when the defendants got arrested, you discussed it. And then you discussed it again after Grant learned he was being subpoenaed? Well, we discussed it, yes. Uh, yes? And when did Grant learn he was being subpoenaed? I'm just going to, out of the clear blue sky, perhaps a couple of months ago or so, three or four months ago. So but you're subpoenaed. to strike as being out of the clear blue sky? Somewhere in, 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 I don't know, four, three, four months ago. Just. Uh, You're saying that Mr. Walker anticipated being subpoenaed three or four months ago? Yes. I do not keep records. On this. Did Mr. Walker tell you three or four months ago that he expected to be a witness in this case? Yes. Can you give us any clue, Mr. Bartek, of when it was, when was the first time Mr. Walker told you Eric's name as the person who had the argument with the father? I don't r remember when. Do you know if it was in 1990, the year that no. the defendants were arrested? You don't know? I don't know. I don't remember that. Do you know if it was in 1991? No. Do you know if it was in 1992? No. Do you know if it was in 1993? No. So you have no idea when it was? Well, let, let me rephrase that. Uh, I'm trying to recollect just, just when. It's, uh, After the boys were arrested, perhaps sometime at that time or when he got subpoenaed, I just, like I said, I just can't specifically give you the date. But, uh. Mr. Bartek, the, uh, the brothers got arrested in March of 1990, three years ago, three and a half years ago. And Mr. Walker told you he expected to be a witness three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a period of three years here. Yes. Yeah, and can you place anywhere in those three years when he first said to you that the argument he overheard was between Mr. Menendez and Eric? I can't give you a date. Now, what did he tell you about this argument? What was Mr. Menendez and Eric arguing about? He, uh, he didn't say what they were arguing about, and I didn't question him. He just said he heard an argument, that's all. And that was the nature of the argument between the father and Eric? Mm -hmm. Yes, right? he just said he heard an argument. And he never mentioned anything about Lila. He never mentioned anything about the mother. Is that correct? No. That's not correct? No, he did not mention anything about Lila, the mother, no. Now, when it was the most recent time that you and Mr. Walker discussed this argument between Mr. Menendez and Eric? The recent times? Yes. Um, we, we haven't discussed it. I mean, I mean, How about I today? don't see any. I can't give you a date. How about today? Talk about it today? Well, we mentioned going in, but. Uh, it's Sorry? Did you and Mr. Walker talk about what he, the argument that he heard between the father and Eric today? Uh, yes. And what did he tell you about that argument today? Um, uh, let me rephrase that. No, we did not discuss that. I'm just trying to uh, think. No. Just don't, don't say if you don't know, Mr. Bartik. I Take just don't. Time. No, we didn't discuss this outside. You as, didn't discuss this at all today? No. Did you discuss it yesterday? No. How about last week? Uh, no. How about the week before? <coughs> no. But you have discussed it since you received your subpoena. That's what you've told us. Well, yes, but I can't give you a specific date or whatever. When we got the subpoena, this thing came up again, yes. Well, what did he tell you, if anything, about, uh, what did he say about this argument when you last spoke to him about it? Well, he mentioned something to the fact that if it's going to be helpful to the case, then, uh, you know, he's going to do what uh, he, he has to do. 
to help the case. It's, to help the prosecution in the so, case, is uh, that right? Uh, anyway. To help the prosecution in the case, is that what he said? Well, to help the case. It's, uh -huh. And to get on television? No, that was not the reason, no. Was Mrs. Was Walker around when he was talking to you about this? I don't know. You don't know? No, I mean, generally our conversation was over the phone. Okay. How many times do you talk to Mr. Walker a week, in, a, in a given week? It depends. Sometimes twice a week. It just depends. You talk to him all the time, don't you? Because you still work with him, right? Well, yes. But it just depends on what the problems are in the pool, pool route. It could be two times a week, could be once a week, could be three or four times a week. It just depends. And how many times do you think you've talked to him about the Menendez murder case? How many times? Yes, sir. Uh, that I wouldn't know. Mm. Now, you recall reading in Ms. Erdely's report that uh, you said that the call, I'll strike that, that you may have made the discovery of the spa override two Wednesdays before the murders. Do you recall reading that there? Jackie, call for her second. It's, it's, it might be possible that I may have discovered it earlier, but... <laughs> no, my um, question is, did you read it in Ms. Erdely's report? Yes, I did. And it appears, therefore, that that's what you told her. Objection, as soon as facts not known. Do you remember reading this report now that that's what you told her, that you could have made this discovery two Wednesdays before the murders, but you can't recall exactly? I'm reading it here. Okay. And is that what you told her? <laughs> it's, it's possibly. Possibly what you told her? But uh, when there is a problem with the situation, you might discover it a week or two, but then if you do not get the okay from the customer or whatever, you can't deal with it right away. You have to maybe wait a week till you contact the, the mm -hmm. customer to talk about the problem. Did you have to wait a week to contact the customer? It's possibly I did. Are well, you guessing, Mr. Bartek? You're in a murder well, trial. You sworn to tell the truth. You guessing? Yeah. Excuse no, me? I'm not, I'm not guessing. Second, I'm not guessing, but... Are you guessing or are you telling us what you remember, Mr. Bartek? I'm telling you the, what I remember to best of my knowledge. Okay, so tell I don't me have a you... recorded piece of paper here of everything. You know, I don't record every single thing. Some things I remember, some things I don't. And that's fine, Mr. Bartek. If you don't remember, will you tell us you don't remember? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Do you remember what day it was when you discovered the spa control was overriding the pool control. I either discovered it the week uh, prior to the murder, or could be a few days earlier. Or two weeks prior, according to what you told Ms. Erdely, isn't that right? Well, that's, that could possibly be. Could you have discovered it two weeks before? Possibly and possibly not. Right. So you don't know, isn't that the truth? I, I didn't keep records on that, whether it was specifically two weeks or so. You don't know, do you? Well, it was either, I mentioned to you, it was either the week of the murder or a few days before. A few days before the, the murder or a few days before no. the week before the murder? No, a, a few days before. Before May have been what? The, well, all right, let's say if, uh, if it was the following Thursday. Oh. And maybe I didn't contact her till the following uh, Monday or Wednesday. Why would you do that? They were home that Thursday? They're not always home, no. They're not always home. Mr. Bartek, I'm not asking... Wait a second, counsel. When sorry. I'm ruling, you wait until I finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Ask your next question. Thank you. Mr. Bartek, this is what I am asking you. Do you actually remember what day it was that you made this discovery? I cannot give you a specific day that I made the discovery. So I that either, no, you Okay, don't let remember? me just tell you this. I, it was either the week of the murder or it was three or four days before. Before what? Before the murder. It was the following, th the previous Thursday. So it was either the previous Thursday or the previous Thursday. That's what you're saying. That's the same week. No, it uh, could have been the week prior to the Thursday I discovered it. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't keep a record of that specific day that All I right. told her this. Let me see if I understand what you're saying then. It could have been either the Thursday immediately before the killing or the previous Thursday. That's true. Or it could have been the Monday. The Monday before or the previous mm -hmm. Monday. No, I didn't say the previous Monday. I either had to discover there on a Monday, a Thursday, or a Monday. 
because then I call my repair in the middle of the week. But what you told Somewhere. us early, though, is that it was either the Wednesday or the previous Wednesday. Well, I, I told her that I'm... Overall, the answer will stand. I have nothing for you. All right, anything on behalf of the other defendant? Mr. Bartek, those checks you brought with you, um, is there anything on those checks which indicates that the checks were written for work at the Menendez home? Uh, no, sir. It's and the check that um, is written on August 21st, 1989, how do we know that that check was written for work on the Menendez case? Okay, I'll explain. On the Menendez house. I'll explain this to you. Whenever a repair is done or two or three repairs are done, mm -hmm. I would immediately write out a check maybe for three or four jobs. So this had to be then for the Menendez job. And it does not say no. It does not say. Right. And the reason you're testifying to that is because you're looking at the date on the check Right. Right? Which is August 21st, right? Right. And you're saying to yourself, gee, I know the killing took place on August 20th, and this check is written on August 21st, and therefore this check must have to do with the work that Grant Walker did on the Menendez house. Yes. Right. Possibly, yes. Now, and you also have checks that are written before August 21st in the month of August to Grant Walker, correct? I don't have them with me, no. But I mean, you have them somewhere. Well, yes. I mean, there's other jobs, perhaps going from the first of the year. And, that, um, and how long had Grant Walker been doing work for you? You mean total beside the Menendez job? Yeah. Two or three years, something like that. Two or three years up to the point of 1989? Um, had he, had he oh, wait a minute. Let, let, let me rephrase that. He started, I had another repairman. Grant started somewhere in 19, let me strike that, in 1989, somewhere in that area, yes. 1989 he started. Yes. Um, in early 89 he started? Somewhere in 89. Okay. Um, so, summer or somewhere? Somewhere in 1989. So uh, by August he'd been doing work for you for a lot of months? Well, f yes, for maybe a period of eight, nine, ten months. All right, eight, uh, nine, ten months he'd been working for you, and during yes. that whole period of time, your way of doing business with, with him was to write him a check for a, a series of jobs that he had done, correct? Uh, yes. Generally, I would ask him over the phone what I would him for maybe three or four jobs. and he, So he would just give me the amount. Right. You and never write him checks just for one job, in other words? Um, sometimes I would, but most likely it would be maybe a couple or three jobs. And, and you wouldn't keep any records as to which jobs they were? He'd just tell you, you owe me 200 bucks. That's right. You'd write him a check. Right, absolutely. So when you go back through your business records, the only thing you have are, are the checks. That's right. Right? No way to tell what check relates to what job? Uh, n no. It's, um... Now, you said, I think, that you spoke to Mr. Walker oh, the Monday or Tuesday after the killing. Was that your testimony on direct examination? Uh, yes. And which of those two days do you think you spoke to him? Possibly it was Monday. Um, and and I'm not asking you to guess. Do you know which one of those two days it was? I don't specifically, but I'm sure it was Monday. What? what? Poss possibly Monday, because I wanted to have the job, make sure the job was done, okay? Right. Generally, if there's a job, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just nervous about it, and I say, okay, was it done? And they wanted it fixed. So most likely it was Monday that I called. All right, you said and, three things there. You said you're sure it's Monday, you're not sure it's Monday, and most likely it's Monday. So well, let's say it was Monday. Now, uh, you'd say it's Monday. Uh, most likely it was Monday. Most likely it was Monday. Right. right. So your testimony that you're sure it was Monday, you're sort of modifying that, right? Uh, it, it most likely was Monday, because that would generally be my time of calling to, if, to see the, if the job was done. I wanted it completed and fixed because they wanted it fixed. And what made you think it was Tuesday when you said it was Tuesday? Well, sometimes I can't exactly reach him on a Monday or something, so I may call the next day. That's why I made that. You know, sometimes you can't reach somebody, reach his answer machine, and may have to call him the next day. So, so this is why I said Monday or Tuesday. So it could have been Tuesday uh, that you spoke with him? It could have been, but most likely it would have been on a Monday. Now, were you at the house on Monday, August 21st? I passed by there. You didn't go to the house itself? I just in the, I would service the pool from the alley entrance. I well, would go through the alley. Let me ask you this. Did you service the pool on August 21st? Uh, no. 
I didn't service it for a month afterward. And was there a point in time on Thursday of that week, that would have been August 24th, where you tried to service the pool and couldn't get in? Uh, yes. All right. And when you went to service the pool on August 24th, which was a Thursday, do you remember at that time that you were surprised by the fact that you couldn't get in? Yes, I was surprised I couldn't get in. Uh, and you remember telling Miss Erdley that you had not seen the news of the murders, so you had not known what had happened, so you were surprised when you went and you couldn't get in. Yes, I, rem I remember telling her something of that nature, right. yes. So on August 24th, when you went to service the pool, it was roped off, Yes. correct? That's correct. The police wouldn't let you in. That's correct. And you were surprised because you didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about it. Right. And yet you say that Mr. Walker had a telephone conversation with you on August 21st where he told you about an argument between the father and the son, right? Yes. That's all I have. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. The amount of that check on August 21st is uh, $200? Yes. Is that right? And you said you serviced the pool from the time the Menendez uh, family moved in there? Yes, the whole time that they lived there, I serviced the pool. And that would have been twice a week during the time, 1988, up to the time of the killings? Uh, yes. And during the time you were there, were there times when you saw the Menendez brothers on the tennis court? I would see them every week. Nothing unusual about the interaction that you saw between the brothers and their parents, correct? No. During the entire time that you were there? No. Never saw anybody ranting or raving about missed tennis shots? No. Never heard anybody using vulgar language? No. Never heard any disputes between anybody? No. Thank you. Any redirect? People are represented. And before the next witness testifies, what is it that council wish to discuss? Can't quite hear you. Uh, with the assumption that we think we understand now what the people are offering. All right. And there are three parts to this, Your Honor. There's the handwritten notes dated 11-21. There's um, Mr. Anderson's correction, which is page 30. There's the type notes, Mr. 28 and 29. And then there's the handwritten notes. I keep this place in the of November 27. Yes. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Yeah, let's go through your objections. Starting with the November 21st notes, um, page 24, <coughs> uh, we have no objection to the one part of the record. I don't want to hear about objections, just uh, or not no objections, objection. just those things you do object to. Okay. So no objections on 24. Correct. Uh, right. no, they're not offering anything on 25. Um, I would object on, oh yeah, we're going to get that later. On, on 26, we're going to object to the camcorder incident that's fleshed out somewhere else. At the bottom of 26, we're going to object to uh, Eric received accolades from his peer group. I don't know how the witness would know that, what that's supposed to mean. I would object to characterizing Eric as having a puffed up ego uh, and improper character of him, even if the witness thinks he was deservedly so. Well, I'm sure it can be described in a legally permissible fashion. I don't think we have to litigate that prior to the witness testifying. Okay. Um, page 27. I uh, would object to this portion of the where it was E and L did use some language on parents. They were assertive to parents verbally. We think that's also improper character evidence. And there's no specific incidents given here. I should indicate to the court that the purpose of this hearing isn't just 402 and eliminate. It's also discovery. We have no idea what the witness is talking about here. We've been given no further information from the prosecution, just this statement. We think this statement is improper character evidence. 
and we don't know what specifics, if any, it's based on? Well, if he can describe specific incidents, uh, then that can be identified. If he cannot, but he does recall that this happened some time in the past, then that's the way it would be presented. Well, I don't see this as character evidence. Uh, it's the description <laughs> of conduct that uh, uh, it would be contrary to uh, other descriptions other witnesses have been providing. Well, so. when, when do we get to hear about that, the incidents upon which this is based? I mean, we're supposed to have discovery of these things, and nothing. Well, I, all I have before me is what you have, right. and uh, there's no requirement that verbatim statements be obtained that have every detail of what a witness is going to say. You have noticed that he is going to describe something along those lines. Well, we would object. Um, you know, there's been witnesses completely excluded from this trial on the basis that the information is too remote. So we would object to the notion that we're not entitled to know what the witness is talking about in violative of the discovery rules. Uh, the people are supposed to give us the witness's statements and not just summaries. Um, and so we're asking if there's any specific incidents that the people have knowledge of that they're withholding from us. Well, I will inquire of the prosecution whether or not uh, the witness described to you any specific incidents. No, Your Honor. I asked him if he had ever used either of the defendants used I that kind of language. I don't know the. I don't know how I described it. If it was offensive or vulgar. And he indicated that it was not overly vulgar, but that they did use words like the ones that are listed here. And he was very specific about using the word assertive in describing their conduct. He didn't say aggressive. He picked his word very carefully as being assertive. This is all in relationship to uh, the parents? Yes, how they talk to their parents. All right. Uh, again, um, there is no requirement that there have there has to be a specific outline of every word the witness is going to utter on the witness stand before the witness testifies. Well, there is a requirement under Brady that they reveal exculpatory evidence, and when she just reveals for the first time that the witness said they weren't overly vulgar, that's an exculpatory type of statement that we're entitled to. So I think there is a requirement that we be provided with some context for these conversations which contradict the part that she has chosen to write down. All right, well, she's just told you that, so let's go on to something else. Can we return to the paragraph the preceding one we're concentrating on, which is La Menendez has an objection to the uh, incident concerning Eric Menendez. It's a relevant answer. Which uh, incident This is the uh, Eric lost patience with his father, even at the break. Eric, Eric wouldn't look at Jose. Wasn't that tennis match uh, described before both juries? Well, it wasn't described by anyone in defense. Uh, a lot of Menendez comments. It wasn't it? Uh, we objected to Eric Menendez. Okay. So to, to follow that <coughs> objection out, we object to this as irrelevant. Okay, your position is the only time it came out was during the testimony of Eric Menendez uh, before the Eric Menendez jury, and no uh, relative of uh, the defendants testified about that before your jury? Ms. Abramson is reminding me of Ms. Sure Anderson. I'm not sure she did. She um, spoke she did. very specifically about this incident in front of both. both. I, my recollection is she didn't testify in front of a single jury. It was in front of both. Well, we could certainly check that out uh, rather quickly if there's some doubt about it. Ms. Uh, Lansing says it was both. Okay. My recollection. Then I would throw the objection. All right. The, uh, we hit, I had. I, on behalf of Lyle Menendez, have an objection to the characterization that Lyle Menendez was sensitive about his lost here in New Jersey. It's been speculation on, on behalf of the witness. Right. If it's phrased in that fashion, it would be. Uh, there would have to be something more specific in mind than <coughs> such a description. So um, again, many of these things would just relate to how questions are asked and objections made at that time. The answer is non-responsive or speculative or whatever. All right, what else? Um, before we get to page 30, which is a whole other thing, look at the handwritten notes. Page 28, Your Honor, we're objecting to um, the first phrase people are offering. The Calabasas house and living there was going to be the answer to All right, that is a speculation or a conclusion on the part of the witness. Uh, and. Um, the entire next paragraph would seem to be spec or hearsay, other than the fact that uh, Mrs. Menendez was acting as her own contractor. The witness might have personal knowledge of that. Um, but as far as the other uh, rest of that, it seems to all be derived from hearsay. Well, even that she was acting as a contractor, I don't think he knows, except that she told him. 
Well, the inference I had was that he came out on periodically and observed these things from the content of the uh, notes. Your Honor, is it the court's position then that the people cannot present evidence that Mrs. Menendez told her brother that she was having financial difficulties? <coughs> Well, what is the relevance of that? And, uh, well, it's, it's relevant to explain the camcorder incident. It's also relevant in that it corroborates the information contained on the December 11th tape, in which Laman and his talks about his mother saying that she was cash poor, and it uh, goes to her state of mind as to her son's spending. And I think that for her to say that she, even if she wasn't in fact financially strapped, she believed she was. And I think that that is a statement of, of her state of mind, which is relevant to issues in dispute in this case. Her ultimate state of mind as to whether she was strapped for money I think is totally irrelevant. It's the state of mind of the defendants used to be money theoretically as well, and that's not established here at all. Well, there has been on many occasions evidence offered by the defense of the state of mind of Mr. or Mrs. Menendez. The only issue is whether or not this particular um, information here uh, either corroborates or contradicts the evidence offered by the defense. And uh, if it that's where I'm at, uh, at a loss to uh, ascertain where it does. Well, it corroborates the December 11th tape, which is, although offered by the defense, it was um, it is evidence acquired by the prosecution through litigation. And it does corroborate that particular part as to her state of mind. It also ties in with why the camcorder incident, in which occurred approximately two weeks before, was of significance because it was her state of mind that they didn't have money to buy so that the sons could buy things. And well, assuming that was her state of mind, what does it prove? That she, it was her, she also told Mr. Anderson that she wanted her sons to stop spending money and that she conveyed that to them. And that proves that it's during the conversation that's handwritten. Um, and also, Mr. Menendez indicates uh, after he finds out about the camcorder that he's going to have a major discussion with Lyle Menendez about this issue. And I think that goes to some of the financial motivations of the defendants. There's been testimony that Lyle Menendez had free use of a credit card. He had no financial motivation to kill his parents because he could buy anything he wanted. And this certainly shows that he couldn't. And it shows that the parents were concerned about not only his spending, but the family finances. All right. It, it could very well show their concern, but again, as was discussed yesterday, how does it show that that was communicated to the defendants? Well, for one thing, the, the incident with the camcorder, the, I have things in quotations wherein... Um, well, uh, let's forget the camcorder for a moment, just in the relationship to this conversation. All right. I, well, it's a series of conversations in which she expressed that she was having financial difficulties. And it shows that this was an ongoing problem for her and that it was not a recent vintage, it was something that had occurred since they had moved to Beverly Hills and were paying the mortgage on the house in Beverly Hills and the expenses of the construction. And it shows that it was her state of mind that she was strapped for money, which, which she then conveyed at a later time, 10 days before her death, to her son Eric, and that Mr. Menendez indicated he was going to convey it to his son Lyle. I believe I have Convey to that they were strapped for money or convey that, uh, that, that something was going to change or what? Yes, it conveyed that he, they wanted their sons to stop spending money. And under um, statement of intent, I cited two cases to the court, I believe I have them here. It's the people's position that a statement of intent to do an act. Um, People versus one, 69 Cal up third, 79, and also all called, which is a Supreme Court case, indicates that when a declarant says that they are going to do something, that that is circumstantial evidence that they did in fact do that. And I think that when Lyle Menendez in the September 17th statement to the police talks about difficulties with the camcorder, that ties this incident up as an issue for the family dealing with money. But she said that uh, the offer of proof was that statement about being financially strapped with represented um, Mrs. Menendez's belief that she was financially strapped. That's not properly admissible under the state of mind exception. The exception says statements of belief are not admissible under this exception. And that's all it is. It's a statement by, at most, it's a statement by her saying, I believe I'm financially strapped. So there's still, I think, a hearsay lack of confrontation objection with respect to these statements she seeks to elicit, both with respect to the uh, statements about being financially strapped and with respect to the uh, camcorder incident. Yeah, with respect to the camcorder incident, for example, Your Honor, there is not what the court is asking about. There is no 
legitimate admissible evidence that either parent said to the brothers, things are going to change, you're not going to be able to do this, you're not going to be able to do that. All <coughs> you have is here is an incident where Lyle has bought a camcorder, Eric has left it on an airplane and is going back to pick it up, and Kitty goes off on Eric. I can't believe you've done this. I'm not sure what that is, whether it's left it on the plane or bought it. You kids have got to learn. I'm not sure what they're supposed to learn. You kids have got to stop spending money. Well, Eric didn't even spend the money. So if it's anything, it's an example of how Mrs. Menendez blames Eric for things that aren't his fault. But, it is, but for that purpose, we're not seeking to introduce it. The point is there's no showing that this ragging about a $900 camcorder that she then chooses to keep rather than send back and to use herself has any relation to motivation to this homicide. And there's nothing in these materials that say the parents said to the boys, I'm cutting off your Princeton $25,000 a year tuition, I'm cutting off the purchase of the hundred and some odd thousand dollar condominium. And just to throw in the balance here, we are in a position to prove how much money Mrs. Menendez spent during this period from the purchase of the house in October 88 until their death, when she is telling her brother she is desperately poor. I mean, we have every single item of furniture that she bought, including a $40,000 dining room table. So the problem is that this evidence isn't even reliable. Maybe she's lying to her brother. Your Honor, may I just respond? He says, this section does not make admissible evidence of a statement of memory or belief to prove the fact remembered or believed. And we're not trying to prove that, in fact, they were poor, because I think they weren't. What we're trying to prove is that that was her state of mind, that she was extremely concerned about money, that it was a problem for her, it was something she discussed with her brother continuously, and that it was her state of mind that she, one of the ways to abate this problem was to get her sons to stop spending so much money. And that the camcorder incident is a specific example of, of, of her, a specific example of this state of mind. The real problem with this kind of hearsay, Your Honor, is there's been no evidence in this case whatsoever that Eric Menendez ever spent any money before these people got on anything. So how do I cross-examine Mrs. Menendez now on what money was Eric spent? And Uncle Brian, I can assure you, has no idea. So to allow this hearsay, and there's no way to cross-examine, and there's no proof Eric ever spent anything. All right, anything else from anybody? All right, the court uh, doesn't uh, agree with the prosecution that this is uh, admissible state of mind evidence. The state of mind at issue here is not one that if proved, um, let me back up. The state of mind that the, this evidence would prove is not uh, at issue in this case. Uh, it hasn't been tied to any activity or action by the parents uh, in relationship to the defendants. The incident with the video camera um, is relevant and admissible evidence because it relates to uh, some of the activities that occurred um, a week or two prior to the homicides and the uh, description of these events have already been provided to the jury by other witnesses and this just fleshes it out. As far as the specific um, statement uh, by Mrs. Menendez uh, to uh, Eric Menendez, um, Portions of it uh, may not be relevant to uh, this this proceeding, and uh, uh, portions of it may. It uh, depends exactly how it's brought out. But the um, incident itself, regarding the camcorder or the video camera, and uh, going to the airport, picking it up, and what use it was was, was made of it afterwards, is all admissible. Your Honor, with respect to the specific statement that I'm yes. concerned about, uh, Mrs. Menendez yelling at Eric, you kids, I've got to stop spending money. We're going to object to that. That's hearsay. Um, if it's not, if her state of mind isn't relevant, if this is simply all this is, is being offered for the truth to establish that the kids, including Eric, have been spending money. And that's an improper use of this. Your Honor, we would offer it under 1240 as a spontaneous statement, as well as 1250. We would also offer it to show the state of mind of the defendant. How does it show the state of mind of the defendant? He didn't buy this thing. This is ludicrous. All right. The state of mind would be only reflective of what was said to the defendant and whether or not um, 
that had any impact on the defendant's state of mind. That would be Eric Menendez. Yes. Menendez is not so La Menendez, who buys this thing, it doesn't get admitted as to him. It gets admitted as to Eric Menendez, who had nothing to do with it, on the notion that it somehow influences his state of mind when no one's ever proved the other body. Judge, this doesn't seem fair. What, what are you arguing about? I'm arguing that it shouldn't come in as what, Eric Menendez. What? You kids have got to stop spending. You're responding food. specifically to that one <laughs> sentence, is that it? Well, I don't think any of it makes any sense, but that particular <coughs> sentence is the fact that your client left a $900 camera on a, an airplane and uh, he and his mother had to go back to pick it up. Uh, that doesn't bother me, that part. The fact, well, that's the fact part that of what we're talking about. All right, but I, as I'm saying, I'm talking about you kids have got to stop spending money when he hasn't spent any money, when this is going to be offered to prove he did spend money, and they know he didn't buy this camera. That's what I'm objecting to. He, right. First of all, he's trying to go back and pick this up even before she knows about it. He's the one who winds up telling her about it. Yes. So, whether she's ragging on him about leaving it on the plane or not. Doing what? What is she doing? Ragging. What does that mean? That's, a, that's an R word for the N word, nagging. <laughs> and so you felt that she was nagging, is that right? Well, he is telling her that he's going to get it, that he has located the camera, that it's been left at the airport. She gets upset. Right. But blaming him for buying it when she knows he didn't. And how you know? And how can I cross-examine what she meant by him spending money? Where is there any evidence in this case that he spent money? All right. What is the people's response then to that one phrase? You kids have got to stop spending. Your Honor, I think it's relevant to the issues in this case having to do with the relationship between the defendants and their parents regarding money. It's the people's position that part of the motivation for the crime was financial. That, um, Eric Menendez testified that his father uh, had or was going to disinherit him in May of 1989. And by virtue of the fact that Lyle Menendez ultimately did talk to the police about this in September of 1989, it's quite clear that this information was communicated to Lyle Menendez as well. And as to Eric Menendez, it goes to his state of mind that his mother was upset about the expenditure by her sons, not son singular, her sons, plural, uh, expenditures by them, and that she wanted it to stop. Judge, I think the technical objection here is not only is this hearsay and denies us our right to confrontation, but there's no showing of personal knowledge by Mrs. Menendez, the declarant. And I don't think that people can avoid the personal knowledge requirement simply because it's hearsay. Well, why is it hearsay? Go back to uh, what is hearsay, well, the definition I, I, of hearsay. Why is it hearsay? I think it's hearsay because it's a statement offered to prove that, in fact, they were spending money. Is it offered for that purpose or I, I to show so. the state of mind of the uh, declarant that this is what she wanted them to do? It's not offered to show that they were spending money. It's offered to show that it was her belief, it was her state of mind that they were spending money, and that she was upset about it and intended to do something about it. Well, the intended to do something about it, Your Honor, is pure speculation. There's no statement here that she intends to do anything about it. No one is. Uh, I'm not saying that that is proved by this. So it, does it not, though, reflect her state of mind as to what she thinks should be done, that they should stop spending money? I think it reflects her belief yes, that it's they her were belief. spending money, and that's prohibited under 1250. And that's why it's so important you can't cross-examine on this word, deny confrontation, to prove that her belief is erroneous. It isn't her state of mind that's an issue. It's what she thinks is happening, and it's erroneous, and I can't prove it. Your Honor, the people are not in a position to cross-examine Mrs. Menendez by what she meant when she told Dr. Summerfield something, or what she meant when, or what Mr. Menendez meant when he told things to the defendants which have been admitted under the state of mind exception throughout the trial, and certainly at times that are a lot more remote than 10 days before the homicide. Well, I don't know of any rule which says that because the defense had some hearsay admitted properly by the court, some of which wasn't even objected to by the people, that the court should give the prosecution free reign to retaliate with inadmissible hearsay. It's not admissible on the face of it, and our objection is that it, uh, it is a statement of her belief that they were spending too much money, and it's not admissible under 1250. Well, it's two things. One is uh, the statement of uh, the declarant's state of mind um, as to what she wants to have happen in the future. But uh, I agree with the defense that it does also reflect um, the witness's statement, or the declarant's statement, rather, as to what has already occurred. And um, there's, um, 
a dichotomy here as to the purpose for which it's being used. Your Honor, I have no objection to this court giving a limited instruction that this statement is not offered to prove that they, in fact, have been spending money, and if, if that would take care of the dichotomy. But I think it is relevant to show that she was upset about this and that she conveyed that to her son. Well, in light of the court's comments, I think the statement would also be excluded under 352 because it's just too um, impossible, I, I think, for the jury to ignore um, the impermissible purpose here of this evidence and to limit it um, to a permissible purpose. Not conceding there is a permissible purpose here, but if the court were to try and instruct on that dichotomy, it's, I think it's virtually impossible the jury could understand that distinction. I'm not even sure I understand it. All right, under Section 352 of the Evidence Code, the court will rule that that statement not be admitted. It is uh, incorporating um, the witnesses for the declarant's belief, and uh, that does prevent the defendants from cross-examining the declarant on the subject, that uh, the source of that information. Well, Your right. Honor, then I may have to reevaluate whether you should call this witness, okay? Since it appears that there's very little left that the court well, I've, I've told you you have all of the uh, incident regarding the tennis match, his observations, and things of that nature. It's up to you as to what you want to do with the witness. How much time will you need to reevaluate that? Three minutes. Well, if you need longer, if uh, since it um, the reevaluation um, that results in his not testifying would uh, alter our schedule here. Yeah, just a moment. Sure. Then that anything having to do with the financial, Mrs. Menendez's state of finances, anything having to do with the camcorder incident is inadmissible. Is that correct? No, I told you the incident regarding the, the video camera was admissible. Well, then what portion of it? Then the only portion that's not admissible is that she had made the statement that you have to stop spending money. Yeah, because I first of all, it doesn't really relate to the video camera itself. The camera had already been purchased, and apparently been purchased by Lyle Menendez. This is a statement made to Eric Menendez. Um, well, how about Mr. Menendez's um, statement that he was going to have a major discussion with Lyle about the camera? Is that? I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Do you? My understanding is it was because of the expenditure. Well, you're, that's your understanding, but what We're was it? We're talking to the witness, Your Honor. Well, what is it that, he, that Mr. Menendez said? that he was going to have a major discussion with Lyle about buying the video camera. Well, she left out part, which is he had had or was going to have, so it's ambiguous. Is this a conversation that took place or was going to take place? And if so, are the people offering this to show that, in fact, that conversation did take place to prove something relevant in the case because there's no showing that it ever and the conversation ever took place. So what's the relevance of this? Your Honor, the showing is that on September the 17th, when Lyle Menendez talks to the police, he mentions to them that there were some problems with the video camera, but after his father realized that something they really needed, he went ahead and acquiesced. And clearly they did, since they never sent it back. And they since it was a credit card purchase, and they could have taken the refund. Well, now we're really speculating. I know, but you see, the point is none of this really proves anything, Your Honor. That's the with it. Well, I have to believe that the defense position is partly a reflection on the fact that uh, you feel the evidence could hurt the defense or you wouldn't be pushing so hard. No, but that's well, beside the point. Uh, uh, still, I, the legal. I share legal with you uh, why I'm objecting, okay. but not in front of the prosecution. Yeah. The legal uh, rules still apply as to whether it hurts or helps. All right. Um, Again, what is the people's response as far as whether uh, Mr. Menendez actually communicated this to the defendant? You say there was something on an audio tape uh, in September about it. Yes, on the September 17th tape, Lyle Menendez is, uh, has a discussion with Detective Zoller and Detective Lenahan about the fact that there was a problem over the camcorder, and he said, yeah, and I don't have the exact words, but I have a specific recollection that what the gist of it is, is that, yeah, I would go out and buy things if I needed them, and my father wasn't happy about it, but once he realized we really needed it, then it was all okay. And what is the evidence as far as Lyle Menendez regarding the purchase of the video camera? Well, here's the one. 
what is it that if you were putting this on against Lyle and Endez, how would you establish the the well, camera was purchased? Were you present? Well, I was just going to ask him. Were you present when there was when this camcorder was lost? Um, yes, I was. Um, well, one side at a time. Let's just give us your uh, off the top of the head response to everything. Go ahead. I was just going to ask him if he was present when the, when the camcorder had to be, when there was a discussion about it, it had to be covered. <coughs> Later on, there was some discussion with Mr. Menendez about the purchase, not by Mr. Menendez of the camcorder, and Mr. Menendez's statement that he was had or going to have a, just a major discussion with Lyle about the camcorder. And that would go to show that when Lyle Menendez in September of 1989 discusses it with the police, this is an issue of an expenditure which was uh, not authorized by his father. There's been a lot of testimony that Lyle Menendez had free reign to buy whatever he wanted, and this contradicts that. I don't have a problem with the fact that you're entitled to contradict that. I just question whether you have the proof of it here. Judge, the only proof I see in answer to the court's question is the statement, Eric told Brian, I can't believe Lyle did this, this presumably referring to purchasing the camera cord. That statement is hearsay as to Lyle Menendez. Well, there is a statement in the September 17th tape, which is Lyle Menendez saying he bought the camera, which is offered against him under 1220 of the evidence code. It's an admission by a party offered against him. All right. That is the proof of how it was purchased. He bought the camera, but there's is there something in there saying he bought it without the authorization? I said I wasn't going to use that. I wasn't going to use the part about the credit card. No, I mean in the September 17th yes, tape. He, yes, he specifically indicates that it was something that, his, that he had purchased and that it was not something his parents wanted. He went out and bought it without telling anyone. And when his father found out, there were some problems, but his father realized it was something they really needed, and it, he smoothed it out. Well, yeah. how does, uh, assuming that that's all correct. How does that? Uh, how was that disproved by uh, this offer that uh, Mr. Menendez was going to talk to Lyle well, Menendez about Mr. it? Mr. Menendez was very upset about it, and that's what Mr. Anderson would say. Is that Mr. Menendez was upset about it and said he was going to have a major discussion with Lyle about the issue. Well, again, how does it come before this jury that he was upset about the purchase of the camera? Because Ms. Mr. Anderson spoke to Mr. Menendez about it. Okay, that's hearsay. Yes, yes, I was upset offered. about the, the camera, that's why I'm going to talk to... Yes, and it's offered under the state of mind exception. Because I think Mr. Menendez's state of mind vis-a-vis -vis his children's spending is relevant to issues in this case. Well, Judge, if the offer of proof is to be accepted, it doesn't say anything about Jose Menendez being upset. The statement is Jose said he had had or was going to have a major discussion with Lyle about this issue. So unless there's another discovery violation here, I don't see anything about Jose Menendez saying that Brian Your Anderson that he was upset, and in any event, it's still hearsay. Yeah, I would represent that every word that Mr. Anderson said, I did not take down or protect the solar, nor did the defense take down every word that was said by their witnesses. There were many times when this All right, That's well, true. we're now focusing on whether or not uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson describes him as being upset when he made that statement. It is my understanding that Mr. Menendez was upset. And that's why he was going to have a major discussion with his son. Judge, the purpose of this document was for the prosecution to make an offer of proof so that we wouldn't have to question the witness about what he heard. And this document was drafted with the idea that the court would have in front of him what the witness was prepared to testify to. Well, what is it that you're saying that uh, you, your witness will say that uh, Mr. Menendez was upset and he said, I'm going to have a conversation or I did have a conversation with... Uh, he wasn't clear whether he was going to or he did. And That's why I put both of those in my notes. I couldn't recall if it had happened or was going to happen. And what was the discussion going to be about? The Just the purchase of that camera and nothing else? Yes, expenditure of the money to purchase the camera. And not to uh, change any spending habits or anything else, just to talk about the camera. Your Honor, I don't know if it went that far or was that detail. You don't know if what was that detail? If it was, if Mr. Menendez conveyed to Mr. Anderson whether it was specifically about the camcorder or about the spending habits in general. Well, I think we should know that before we continue with this discussion. Can I also clarify the people's offer of proof as to what the September 17th statement said in regard to this? This is a question by Detective Zoller. 
uh, question. Now, one statement I heard, and I don't know who it was from, you had gone out, bought like a video recorder, a camera. Answer, yeah. And your dad said, gee, that's nice that he could buy something like that. I wonder how he could have paid for it. Answer, yeah, yeah, he said that. And But you know, question, did he end up paying for it? He ended up paying for it, sure. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where if I knew we needed it, and I knew that he thought it was a good idea, he wouldn't buy it himself ever, but I'd buy it. And then, you know, we just discuss it, and he'd buy it, and he'd pay for it. Or if I came down to it, you know, I could pay for it. So I'm not sure how this statement being offered in any way contradicts this or is relevant to some issue of the case, given what's stated in this transcript. All right, and I assume that Mr. Kuriyama is going to talk to the witness about this. He's asking her about it. Okay. All right, what else is there that you want to discuss regarding this witness's testimony? On the next page, Your Honor, there's this statement. Um, First of all, Kitty Menendez saying Lila's not doing well at Princeton University. That's pure hearsay. Jose saying Lila would have to be a doctor. Pure hearsay. Excuse me, what page are we on? Next page of your what post. What numbers? Page 22nd, not number. Page 2 of the November 22nd handwritten notes. You have that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the next thing, Jose said, this is in 1988, Brian Anderson apparently visits his brother-in-law, and Jose is apparently telling him about his clever tax dodges. He's telling him that he had cash flow concerns, so he borrowed money from live in lieu of salary. Now, the, in another place in these notes, it's indicated that Mr. Anderson knew that Mr. Menendez deferred salary for tax purposes, and then to have the money that he deferred, he borrowed money from the corporation. Now, I don't see what possible relevance that has. It's not offered a state of mind. It's simply a historical event. And it's hearsay. Well, you're on a line of the court's ruling about the um, Mrs. Menendez's state of mind 10 days before the homicide. I'm not going to offer this. Maybe if, it, if her particular state of mind 10 days before about their finances 10 days before the homicide is not relevant. <laughs> Well, it depends on what we're talking about, state of mind. I'm not, I, and I certainly haven't made any blanket ruling about Mrs. Mendez's state of mind uh, 10 days before the homicide. It clearly is relevant if uh, it relates to uh, issues in this case. That, um, that the, the way this has been presented to me, the particular statements that you're offering do not. Okay. I'm certainly not. Uh, ruling that any and all statements that uh, would reflect uh, Mrs. Menendez's state of mind or Mr. Menendez's state of mind would be inadmissible. That's certainly not uh, the ruling here. The clarification on page one of the notes of November 22nd, uh, Mr. is Mr. Anderson's statement to Mr. Kuriyama that Mr. Menendez was going to get on his son Lyle about his spending. Oh, it's a new state. And that is a quote, or is that what? Yes. OK, and what is the response by Lyle Menendez? Well, first of all, it now occurs we have a uh, collateral impeachment problem with respect to Ms. Bazanich's notes and a statement she took for him, uh, from him in which he indicated that the conversation had already taken place, which she wrote down. So that's one uh, 352 problem. Uh, number two, uh, it's our position it is still here to say, uh, deny us the right to confrontation. And number three, it's not relevant because it does not in any way impeach the September 17th statement of law. All right, the uh, concern again is one that uh, whether it can be tied into the defendant Lyle Menendez's purchase of this uh, video camera. Uh, how is it tied in? Because of the video camera, according to Mr. Anderson, was the straw that broke the camera's back. He just reiterated that to Mr. Kuriyama and that this was something that prompted Mr. Men that the discovery of the purchase of the video camera was what prompted Mr. Menendez to want to talk to Lyle Menendez about the spending. 
and considering the kindness in relationship to the homicide and considering the spending that occurred after the homicide, mm -hmm. people's position of this is Is the prosecution offering a statement uh, by this witness that it, his opinion is that it was a straw that broke the camel's back? Because if so. No, I'm not, because that's an improper opinion on the part of the witness. <laughs> I'm just merely putting it in context for the court. Well, is this something that really uh, is described by the witness as a major event or just a casual incident that occurred? And uh, well, it's hard to uh, visualize exactly what it is that you're proposing. He has described it to me as the straw that broke the camel's back. So and why does he describe it that way? Because of the, uh, because of the way the parents reacted to this. That after all the months and months of being financially strapped, or at least thinking that she was financially strapped, this particular purchase of nine hundred dollars, that it was that the, there had been prior attempts to um, or prior statements of intent by Mrs. Menendez to curb the spending of her sons, and that now there was a this that Eric Menendez tried to secrete it from her, but couldn't get to the airport without her help. Finally, had to tell what it was he was going to retrieve that it, it upset both the parents greatly because of their efforts to get their sons to stop spending money. That's the best I can do to put it in context. Well, as I understand it, she was upset because uh, the defendant, Eric Menendez, had left the camera there. Uh, and no, Your Honor, she was upset. Well, she, she was mainly upset because of the camera's purchase. We know this. And, and the recitation of there were prior conversations where she tried to get her sons to stop spending, there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Mr. Anderson lived 2,000 miles away from his family. There's no evidence of Eric spending for her to have been talking to him about it. So this is just being used for the improper purpose of showing that he was spending all over again. It's just, all this man sees is an incident over a $900 camera. And the bottom line is, his sister keeps the camera and goes on to use it over the ensuing week and a half of this tennis tournament, and never says anything about wanting to return it, about getting the money back. Um, it's just ridiculous. <coughs> All right, anything else? Judge, um, I don't think the court has ruled on the objection about your recommended a statement that came from me while did this. And it's our position that's hearsay. It's also irrelevant, absent some foundation as to what this is. All right, it is vague as to what was being referred to. Do people have any information about that? I can't believe you've done this. Yes. No, that uh, Eric Menendez was quoted as saying, I can't believe Lyle did this. And it says right after the thought can order. Well, but um, is that what was said? That's it's not in yes. quotes. Yes, Your Honor, that's what, what I believe. Well, that, that appears to be the, the writer's interpretation of what's being referred to. But in any event, it's still hearsay. It's a statement by Derek Menendez. All right, we've proved that Bob Menendez did this. All right, we've gone around and around on this one, so. Um, what uh, we'll have to do, unfortunately, is have the witness testify, which is not what I wanted to do. We have him testify outside the presence of the jury so we can get it out once and for all so that uh, everyone can hear exactly what he's going to have to say. Is he here? Yes. All right, let's put him on and get this straightened out once and for all. Mr. Anderson, um, you were calling an incident regarding uh, a camp order where the discovery of the camcorder, by the existence of the camcorder by Mrs. Menendez occurred in your kitchen. I do. And um, may I lead, Your Honor, just to... Well, we would object to leading Your Honor. Exactly. Yes, you may lead. Thank you. Um, now, this particular conversation had to do with the fact that Eric Menendez had left a camcorder on the airplane when he came to um, the Chicago area. That's correct. Okay. And could you explain briefly for us the circumstances surrounding Mrs. Menendez's discovery of the fact that this camcorder had been purchased? Eric had asked me to use a uh, telephone that morning, uh, private, uh, and I put him in the rec room with a telephone and he made a series of phone calls. And, and then uh, a call came back uh, and he wanted to take it in the other room. 
you know, the call was answered in the kitchen, and then uh, he quickly wanted to go into the rec room and take the call. And uh, he obviously piqued Kitty's curiosity, and when he came back into the kitchen, Kitty wanted to know what went on, and he didn't say anything except for the fact that he wanted to use the car. And that discussion went on for a while, and then ultimately uh, he let it be known that there was a camcorder that was left in the overhead baggage compartment of the airplane. They had it in the baggage claim at the airport, and um, there was a discussion at that time between Kitty and Eric, and the two of them got in the car and went to the airport to get the camcorder. Okay, could you tell us what the discussion was after Eric told his mother that he had left a camcorder on the airplane? What, what was her response to the discovery of this camcorder? She was quite upset. Okay, and how did she express that? She couldn't believe it. Uh, what she, did she say as best you can recall? I can't believe you boys continue to do these things, and it was along that line. Just can you remember anything else she said aside from the thing that you just told us? Any other statements of hers? The um, Eric insisted that uh, he would just go up and get the camcorder and just let me use the car, and she insisted, no, we'll both go up and get the uh, camcorder. Okay, did Eric Melendez respond to her in any way about it not, did he say anything about the camcorder specifically, that is, whether he had bought it or someone else had it? What did he say to explain to her its existence? It was uh, purchased by uh, Lyle, uh, not by him. Apparently, uh, somewhere on the East Coast, I assume New Jersey. And, uh, now, did Eric specifically say that to his mother after she questioned him about it? That it was Eric told me that. Okay, now what I want to know then is your observation of the conversation between Kitty Menendez and Eric Menendez after she discovered um, the existence of the camcorder. So she made some statement, I think you related, about she can't believe you kids continue to do that. What did Eric respond, if anything? I didn't do it. Lyle did it. Lyle's camcorder, not mine. Okay, so he said it was Lyle's camcorder, not his? Yes. All right, and then did she make any response to that along the same lines of what she said previously, or did she change the topic, or what happened? The conversation went on for some time about that. She went up and got things ready. She was generally had an upset demeanor about things, and, and uh, they got in the car and off they went. Was there more discussion than what you just told us specifically involving the purchase of the camcorder and its existence? On that day? During that particular conversation, you told us about a statement Mrs. Menendez made. You told us about a statement that Eric Menendez made. Were there further statements made dealing with her being upset about its purchase and Eric perhaps explaining it? No, not, there was a lot of conversation to, re, to respond specifically to what was said. She generally was upset uh, about the purchase, uh, generally uh, disturbed, as I say, about the fact that they had uh, basically gone against their wishes to stop spending money and that the camcorder was apparently purchased on uh, either hers or, Ly or Jose's uh, visa card. Was that conveyed during the conversation that the in other words, was the information related to Mrs. Menendez in front of you that day that the camcorder had been purchased on the Visa card? Yes. Okay. Now, I believe you've indicated that Eric Menendez had made some comments to you about the camcorder. Is that correct? Yes. As Kitty was in the process of getting upset, uh, Eric was uh, close to me at the time, and he said he couldn't believe that his brother did that, that uh, he purchased the camcorder with the Visa card. And, and, uh, pretty much told me what happened, that he had it hidden in a bag and put it up in the uh, luggage overhead luggage compartment in the airplane and forgot it when he got off the plane. Right now. And was impressed that the airline still had it. At some point after this conversation, did Mr. Menendez have any conversation with you about the camcorder incident? Uh, in Kalamazoo. Yes. Yes. Okay. And did Mr. Menendez say anything about what he intended to do or what he had done or anything to do with his conveying information to Lyle Menendez? I asked him what happened with the camcorder incident, and he uh, responded that uh, he was going to have a major discussion with Lyle, and this spending, this uh, reckless spending had to stop. That he had to learn that he has to start supporting himself in life. We're not supporting him forever. Now, was this in response to your question about the camcorder? Yes. All right. Thank you. No, nothing further. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Uh, let's not make a 
major cross-examination here. Yeah, we'll save that for later. Mr. Anderson, did you have any, uh, was there anything said in the course of the conversation between Eric um, and his mother about uh, what spending he had been doing? Uh, Leslie, you're talking softly, and I'm getting voices from my right-hand side. I can't quite hear you. Is someone talking? Okay. During this particular conversation that we're talking about, which I take it is taking place in your kitchen at your home in Downers Grove? That's correct. Okay. Is in the course of this, uh, you said that your sister became upset, and she said something to Eric about, um, I can't believe you boys continue to do these things, that sort of thing. Did she mention any spending that Eric had done? No. Now, you said that your sister was indicating, or, or at least conveyed to you who knew her, that she was disturbed that they, meaning her sons, had gone against their, meaning the parents, wishes to stop spending money. That was the impression that you got? That's what she said. Okay. What money did she claim Eric had been spending? She made the statement as I gave it to her. Okay. You didn't have any information, and she didn't convey any information in this conversation about spending by Eric. Would that be a fair statement? Not that I recall. Okay. Mr. Anderson, could you clarify for me who said something about how the camcorder got purchased? Was that Eric's statement or your sister's? Eric's statement. And what specifically did he say about how the camcorder got purchased? that uh, Lyle had purchased it with a Visa card. I don't recall whether it was Jose's or Kitty's or both of theirs. And uh, he couldn't believe that Lyle had done it. Had, had done it? Had purchased it. So he told you that the uh, camcorder had been purchased by either Mr. or Mrs. Menendez's credit card? That's correct. That's all I have. All right, anything else? All right, Mrs. Menendez uh, made the statement, I can't believe you boys continue to do these things. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did she say what these things were that she was referring to? Spending money was the illusion, is what she was alluding to, as, as I understood it. She didn't say that, though. She may have said that. But do, you, do you remember that, or you're just in, inferring that? I'm inferring that. Could have been that she was referring to the fact that uh, they were reckless in leaving things on airplanes, or? negligent in that regard? No, it was definitely not that, Your Honor. But she did not say anything about money per se? She said, yeah, she said spending. money. She referred to money. What did she say? Um, she referred generally to money. To, I, I cannot remember exactly what she said. The only uh, phrase that you do remember is, I can't believe you boys continue to do, to do these things. Is that right? I remember that. Okay. And what was um, Mr. Menendez's mood when he told you he was going to have this discussion or conversation with Lyle Menendez? He was very straightforward, uh, spoke quickly, and uh, was very assertive. And um, when was this conversation in relationship to when the uh, video camera was um, discussed by Mrs. Menendez with Eric Menendez? After I had flown up to the uh, Kalamazoo Tennis match. All right. Refresh my recollection. How many days was that afterwards? Would have been, I would think, two days, uh, if I recall. I it would, as I recall, they were there on the third uh, of August, um, and then it would have been a couple, a couple of days after that. What did you say uh, to Mr. Menendez about the video camera? I simply asked him what happened with the camcorder incident. That's how you referred to it? Yes. And did he indicate he knew what you were talking about? Oh, yes. What did he say? He said, I'm going to have a major conversation with Lyle, and uh, he is going to have to learn that he's going to have to start uh, providing his own income. He's not going to, we are not going to support him the rest of his life. All right, and you referred uh, earlier to something uh, about reckless spending. Did he make reference to that? Yes. In the same conversation? Yes. All right, anything else? No. Okay, thank you, sir. If you would wait outside again, please. Thank you.
Let me inquire if we have all our jurors in the jury room. Okay. All right. Um, do does anyone want to add anything to our discussions? Just to indicate to the court that still our our Lyle Menendez's position that Eric Menendez's uh, statements to this witness are, are still hearsay and it's in fact unreliable hearsay because we can prove independently that uh, the circumstances under which this uh, recorder were as purchased is not the way that this witness has it in this hearsay statement. But it, the the main objection here is it is still hearsay as 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 is uh, Mr. Menendez's discussions with this witness. All right. Uh, well, as far as the discussion by Mrs. Menendez, uh, the people's offer was that uh, she made a statement about the, the defendants having to stop spending. The witness doesn't describe that here in his testimony. He, he describes a statement, I can't believe you boys continue to do these things. And it was his impression that it had to do with money and certainly not about leaving the camcorder on the plane. Okay. Because, well, of the, because of other things that said that he can't remember verbatim. Okay. Well, that would then call for speculation on his part as to what she was referring to. All right. As far as um, the incident itself, uh, the finding of uh, or discovery that there was a video camera left on an airplane and the witnesses hearing of uh, Mrs. Menendez's reaction to it as he's described it here, that would seem to be admissible and describing what occurred at the time, uh, which was in close proximity to the uh, incident in question. So is he going to be permitted to testify that she said, I can't believe you boys continue to do these things without reference to money? Well, he didn't say there was reference to money, so if this is his quotation. We can't draw conclusions and speculate as to what she meant. As far as the um, conversation with the defendant, Lyle Menendez, uh, that does indicate a, an intent on the part of Mr. Menendez to conduct a or have a conversation with the defendant about uh, his reckless spending and uh, would uh, reflect a state of mind of Mr. Menendez to have such a conversation. We would object well, to that coming in against Eric Menendez. All right, let me hear the Lyle Menendez response. The problem with that, Your Honor, is the statement of September 17th already indicates that such a meeting took place. So how is this relevant? It doesn't contradict in any way the evidence that's before the jury. Well, it's... The meeting took place. And there's a second part of the statement, which is hearsay, which is, uh, in addition to indicating he had an intent to have a meeting, he also adds a second part, which is, um, these kids have got to learn to spend, he's got to stop, or however he phrases it, he's phrased it different ways at different times. But that second part of it is, is the, uh, the hearsay statement that remains like that. Well, that's the part of it that reflects what Mr. Menendez said he was going to say to Lyle Menendez, his state of mind and his intent to have that conversation, not just to have a conversation about uh, tennis, but to have a specific conversation about the reckless spending and that the behavior of uh, the defendant would have to change. But it still reflects Mr. Menendez's belief at the point in time when he's making that statement his belief that these boys were spending too much money at that point in time, or a boy, one or the other. And, and I think under 352, the danger here is that the jury will accept it as a statement of his belief and not as a statement of a future intent to have a meeting in which he would make the statement that he says he intends to make. And the, the danger that the jury will confuse the proper and the influence I think, remains under 352 and, and uh, under the hearsay. Well, the court, would, the court would instruct the jury that it would be received only to reflect the state of mind of uh, Mr. Menendez that he would have such a conversation with the defendant, his intent to have such a conversation with the defendant on that subject, not that uh, mm -hmm. reflect that whether or not uh, it was true that there was reckless spending or anything else. Well, would the court then say that it cannot be used to reflect uh, his belief at that particular point in time that the boys were overspending and if the court issues such, such an instruction, how can the jury be expected to follow that? Uh, hearing that statement at face value, how is the court 
going to ensure that the jury is going to follow the admonition that although on the face of it he is stating his belief that they're overspending, it's not being received for that purpose, but to show that at some point in the future he had a meeting with them because the statement, I think the court is inferring an intent here uh, from a much larger statement which deals with Jose Menendez's opinions and beliefs. Well, as you said, uh, your own client corroborated that there was such a conversation. So the conversation took place and well, your client put on a, uh, in his explanation, put a certain gloss on that conversation as to what was said. That's correct. And if the people had admissible evidence to contradict that gloss, that would be one thing. But they're using an impermissible hearsay inference to contradict something that Lyle Menendez testified to, which is a belief by Jose Menendez that uh, the, that Lyle was overspending on this camera. Court. No, a belief. And that's an impermissible purpose. No, it's being offered uh, to show that he had the conversation and his purpose in having it was to uh, curtail the spending habits of the defendants, to tell them to change their habits, or this defendant to change his habits. It's still not our to. position that's hearsay, denies us a right to confrontation, and that no limiting instruction the court could fashion could possibly um, direct the jury to make proper use of that statement. All right, I disagree with that. I think it can be properly limited to uh, the intent of Mr. Menendez to have such a conversation. We would object not for to anything else. It would only be received as to Lyle Menendez. Your Honor, yeah, there's one thing I forgot to um, tell the defense, and it's something I'm going to ask Mr. Oh. Uh, Anderson about. I asked him today at lunch if mm -hmm. Mrs. Menendez ever spoke to him about her husband's affair, and he said yes, that he had spoken to him about the infidelity, that's how he referred to it, and that it was shortly after she arrived in Los in the Los Angeles area. So, and, and I'm going to offer that because of the um, Joan Vandermolen's testimony that Kitty, she and Kitty were close and that Kitty never spoke about the infidelity to show that there was someone with whom she was close that she trusted to talk about that. Because I believe that, that the defense has said that she was secretive and she didn't tell people her problems and obviously this contradicts that. Well, what is he going to say she told him? That she, um, I asked him specifically, and he said that she discussed the fact that she had an infidelity, an infidelity problem with her husband. All right, anything else? I, I don't think the court has ruled on the objection to Eric Menendez's uh, hearsay statement to this witness oh, concerning the circumstances under which the camera recorder was purchased. Yeah, that would not be admissible against Lyle Menendez. Well, Your Honor, I, I would. I mean, with respect, you know, really, with what respect? Yes, respect to really, what? what? I can hear you. Even if I smile, I can still hear you. No, but it's not just a smile. Yeah, go ahead. You yeah. can't try yeah. to take advantage of good ruling. No, here. go ahead. Okay. Um, what we now have is that Eric's, Menendez's mother, is upset with him over a camcorder, not because of the spending, because this witness doesn't have that information. For reasons unknown, she's upset with him on August 3rd, over leaving a camcorder on an airplane, that just isn't relevant. Well, you offered all sorts of evidence about that uh, weekend and that week and the two weeks, uh, so this is just another piece of information the jury should consider. We, we join in that objection right. that the incident, as pared down by the court's rulings, is irrelevant. All right. Uh, you want your cake and you want to eat it too is basically the way you're approaching this, but sometimes you can't have it both ways. All right, the okay. um, court's ruling will stand. Okay, now the next page, Your Honor, I, I, as I indicated, um, I don't think there was a response to the objection that Kitty said Lyle not doing well at Princeton. Jose said Lyle would have to be a doctor. Uh, I don't see how that's relevant to anything. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And um, I'm not going to offer the part about the cash, cash flow problems. Okay, I'm not offering the part about the policy. They're offering that, that this witness actually saw Kitty hug her son in Louisville. No doubt it was such an outstanding. Okay, let's not editorialize. Let's get to okay. things that you're objecting to. Okay. Um, now, I think this is a repetition here. Eric talked back to both his parents. Is this different than both? boys used rude language, or is this something else that we have no discovery of what this is supposed to be? All right, if, if it is, you'll find out when the witness testifies. We're not going to do uh, any more discovery uh, during this hearing. Anything else? My understanding is they're not offering the last page. Yes, could, could the court uh, instruct the prosecutor to advise the witness as to the limits of the court's ruling so he doesn't blurt out the yes. the court has ruled it admissible? Yes. Anything else? And to not to refer to counsel by their first name. That's obvious. Anything else? No. 
I'm right, not well, entirely sure I understand the court's ruling, but I'll do my best. What don't you understand so that well, we can? The portion of the conversation that, that he overheard between Mrs. Menendez and Eric, what can come in is, is Eric telling her about it being on the plane and her saying, I can't believe you've done this. So that's not what he says she said. I can't believe you boys continue to do these things. That's what right. he said. Well, that's what he said here, and he said something different to me of the same genre, but, but slightly different words. All right. So all I can do is tell him. Right. As long as he doesn't put his own interpretation on it as far as what he thought she was referring to. And I can't put on the fact that, that he understood it to be money because it was in the context of money. Again, he has not described it that way, and he just just is a personal opinion. Well, I, I didn't take it that way. Okay, well, I've ruled that way, so you understand it now as to how I'm ruling. So what else don't you understand? That's it. Okay. All right, we'll take a recess, and we'll resume at 3 o'clock. We'll have both juries in the courtroom at 3 o'clock, and those items that uh, the prosecution is only introducing as to one jury will deal with um, after the information is presented to both juries as to whatever you're introducing as to both juries. Well, there's only one thing that I'm going to introduce in front of the air file in this jury. Okay, and then everything else will be before both juries, 3 o'clock, both juries in the courtroom. Mr. Anderson, you are the brother of Mary Louise Menendez, is that correct? That's correct. And did you call her Kitty? I did. And in terms of the family uh, chronology, um, are you the oldest, the middle? What What is your place in the Anderson family? I'm number three. Kitty was number four. And what was the age difference between you and your sister, Kitty? A little over 11 months. And were you close to your sister? Very close. Yeah. In 1985, um, did something occur which brought you and your sister closer together? Uh, in 1984, my mother passed away over the Thanksgiving holiday. Okay. Did that seem to um, change the um, affection between you and your sister, Kitty? We were always strong. We became much closer after the death of my mother. Now, during the course of your adult life, after your sister married, um, did you ever live in the same um, suburban area with her? Did yeah, you ever lived close to her in terms of distance? She lived in Illinois, uh, in Hinsdale, and I lived in a town called Oaklawn, I believe, about five miles away. And during that was for approximately a year, is that correct? A year or more, yes. Did you see her during that period of time? Frequently. And after she moved back to the East Coast, did you continue to keep in contact with your sister? Yes, ma'am. And how did you keep in contact with her after she left um, the Illinois area? I visited uh, their homes uh, in uh, the East uh, often and uh, talked on the telephone frequently <coughs> and made trips occasionally together. What kind of trips did you make with her? Ski trips, um, trips up to Canada fishing. Did, did any of these trips include the defendants who are seated here in court? Yes. And um, in the last three years of her life, when Mrs. Menendez uh, moved to California, did you continue to keep in touch with her? Yes, ma'am. Approximately how many times did you visit her in California um, during those last three years? I believe it was three. And in addition to seeing her in California, did you see her um, in other parts of the United States when she was traveling? Yes. In the summer of 1989, uh, did you see your sister in Louisville? I did. And uh, could you tell us the circumstances surrounding that particular visit? Eric uh, was in a tennis tournament in Louisville, and I flew down to uh, be with them and view the match. Now, when you say you flew down, um, do you have a pilot's license? I do. You also own your own airplane? That's correct. Over um, the years when the defendants were participating in tennis, did you ever use your own airplane to travel to watch tennis tournaments that the defendants were in? Quite often. And was that the case when you went to Louisville in the summer of 1989? That's correct. And aside from yourself and Eric Menendez, who was playing in the tournament, was your sister there as well? Yes. And was her husband, Jose Menendez, there? Yes. And did you make any observations of how um, Eric Menendez performed at the Louisville tennis tournament? Yes. Uh, now, just to back up before I ask you about that, um, did you stay for the entire tournament when Eric Menendez was playing, or did you leave at some point before he stopped playing? 
in the Louisville match. I yes. left. I left um, after a couple of days. All I did right. not stay for the whole match. All right. And was he continuing to play after you left? He and was. To the best of your knowledge. He was. Okay. And while you were there, did you see him perform on the tennis court? I did. And how did he perform? He lost uh, the first round. He drew a uh, either the first or second match. He lost to a, uh, a player that was seated, and he was uh, dropped into uh, consolation round. And he won uh, each of his matches that I viewed in the consolation round. And did you learn later that he had continued to win while he was in Louisville? I called my sister daily during the matches to see how he was doing, and he continued to win. Yeah, it's and sometime after the Louisville match, do you remember what month of 1989 it was that you traveled to Louisville to see him? As I best recall, it was July. Okay. Um, now, so it's your testimony that you saw him win the first consolation match? Is that correct? Yes. All right. And how did his parents react to his winning that consolation match? Very elated. And how did they express their elation? Well, with a lot of excitement and, and jubilation, a lot of back slapping and, and uh, compliments. Did you see them express any of this elation or jubilation to their son, Eric Menendez? Oh, definitely. And did they, um, did they ever touch him in relation to their jubilation? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what did you see in that regard, sir? Kitty hugging uh, Eric and telling him what a great job he did and the general spirit of excitement. Um, Mr. Anderson, did you love your sister? Very deeply. And was she affectionate with you in the years since your mother's death? Overall. Very much so. And how was she affectionate with you, sir? The same objection. Be more specific as to what you mean. Uh, was she verbally affectionate with you when she saw you? Yes. Did she hug you? Yes. Did she tell you she loved you? Always. You object to this as well? Overall. Your answer? Yes. And when you saw her in Louisville uh, in the summer of 1989, was she affectionate with you then? Yes. Okay. Now, shortly after the Louisville tournament, did you see your sister again in a state other than California? You, after the Louisville? Yes. In uh, Illinois. All right. Do you know approximately how long it was after Louisville, when you had left Louisville, until you saw your sister again in uh, Illinois? Approximately three or four weeks. And during that period of time, did you keep in touch with your sister by telephone? During the match in Louisville, I called every day, and then we spoke occasionally in that same time, yes. Now, during 1989, before you saw your sister in Louisville, um, did you keep in contact her by, with her by telephone frequently? Yes. And could you describe how often you talked to her during that year? Um, a number of times. Uh, she, uh, she called me on her car phone frequently. And when you say frequently, are you talking about per, per month or per week or how often? Could you give us an estimate of how sometimes, often? Sometimes more than once a day. All right, so during 1989, then you were in close contact with your sister, is that Constant correct? contact. Okay. Prior to 1989, had your sister ever expressed to you a problem that she was having with her husband um, and an affair? Yes. Could you describe to us what occurred in that regard? A phone conversation uh, that I had with Kitty uh, at approximately the time they went to California. Uh, she indicated, or she didn't, she told me she was having an infidelity problem with Jose. And you indicated that she told you this sometime after she'd moved to California? Yes. All right. Um, now, you have another sister named Joan, is that correct? That's correct. What is the age difference between Joan and your sister Kitty? Ten years. And of all the siblings, there's another brother, Milton, is that correct? That's correct. And um, how much older than Kitty was Milton? Milton would be seven years. All right, so it's Joan is the oldest, and then Milton, and then you, and then 11 months later, your sister Kitty. That's correct. Okay. And of the three siblings, who was closest to your sister? I was by far the closest. Now, in Chicago in the summer of 1989, was that the last time that you saw your sister? In Chicago in 89? Yes. No. In the summer, pardon me, in the summer in Kalamazoo, was that the last time you saw your sister? The After Louisville. 
after Louisville, after she was in Chicago, she was in Kalamazoo, and I saw her there in Kalamazoo, and that was the last time. And this particular trip that we're going to be talking about was the last time that you saw her alive, correct? In Kalamazoo, that's correct. All right. Now, why had you gone to Kalamazoo? I went to Kalamazoo twice. Okay, could you describe that for us, please? I went to Kalamazoo uh, when the matches uh, in Kalamazoo were first beginning and uh, spent uh, a day or two. And then uh, I went back uh, towards the middle of the week. Now, when you went to Kalamazoo, did you see your sister Kitty there? Yes. And did you go to Kalamazoo to watch Eric Menendez play in some sort of tennis tournament? That's correct. Do you remember the kind of tennis tournament? Was it um, a national tennis tournament? It was a local, do you recall? Uh, it was uh, National Juniors, I believe it was called. And the first time you went to Kalamazoo that summer, uh, was Mr. Menendez there? Yes. Was uh, Lyle Menendez there during that time? No. Okay. I believe you indicated that you left and then you returned, is that correct? Yeah. Kalamazoo, that's correct. Yes, and I take it when you left, you flew in your plane? That's correct. All right, during this period of time that you saw your sister in, in Kalamazoo, um, did she return to you at some point, return with you to your ho home in the Chicago area? From Kalamazoo? Yes. No. Did she arrive there before going to Kalamazoo? To my home? Yes. Yes. Okay. And when she arrived there, did she arrive with her son, Eric Menendez? Yes. And was Mr. Menendez, Jose Menendez, with them at this time? No. Okay. Was there an incident that you recall that occurred in your home um, regarding a camcorder which had been left on an airplane? Yes. All right. Could you tell us briefly what occurred with regards to the camcorder? You have Jackie Coulson there. Overall. That means you can answer. The morning uh, after they arrived, uh, when we got up in the morning, Eric uh, asked to use a telephone privately, and I set, went up for him in the rec room of the house, and he made some phone calls. And then uh, we were in the kitchen, Kitty was in the kitchen, we were all in the kitchen, and a call came back, and the call that came back was for Eric. And uh, Eric uh, insisted on taking the call back in the rec room. And he took the call back in the rec room, and when he came back to the kitchen, he wanted to use the car. And Let me just ask you a question. Whose car did he want to use? The rental car that uh, Kitty had rented. What happened then? Kitty uh, interrogated him as to why he wanted to use the car and what the phone call was about. And then, it, okay, then what happened? Then uh, it... Uh, it came out that. Uh, Excuse me, I'm going to check. I want to hear something. All right, why don't you ask another question? Okay. At that point, um, did Eric Menendez tell his mother what the topic was of why he wanted to use the car? Yes. And what did he tell his mother why he wanted to use the car? Object to this is hearsay, Mr. Lyle Menendez. Overall. <coughs> that uh, Lyle had purchased. No, this is going to what was. What did uh, Eric say about why he wanted to go back to. sustain the answer stricken. Okay. What did, did Eric Menendez tell his mother that he had left a camcorder on the airplane? That's correct. Okay. And what did he tell her he wanted to do about the camcorder being on the airplane? They had recovered the camcorder from the airplane. It was in the baggage claim, and he wanted to go up and pick it up. Did uh, Mrs. Menendez appear to be surprised that her son was in possession of a camcorder? speculation. Sustained. Okay. Did Mrs. Menendez react to the fact of her son wanting to go to retrieve the camcorder? She did. And what did she say in that regard? She was very upset uh, when she interrogated as to how he got the camcorder. And he told her. Okay. And, All right, the next question. And please. after he told her how he'd obtained the camcorder, what did she say to him about it? Would you ask the question again? After Eric Menendez responded to her about the camcorder and how he'd acquired it, what did she say? What was her response to that? She was upset that... Uh, Just what was she, the word she used? As best you can recall sitting here today, four years later, what did your sister say? Kitty was very frustrated, very disturbed. Uh, she said, that's 
sustained. Um, answer stricken. Okay. Mr. Anderson, I'm not going to ask you to describe her demeanor. I'm going to ask you to, to describe her words. Tell us the best you can recall what she actually said. You kids have got to stop doing these things. And when she said that, would you describe how she appeared to you? Now, you you've, you knew her her whole life, correct? Yes. Did she appear to be happy when she said that? She was very disturbed, very unhappy. Okay. And at that point, did Mrs. Menendez and her son Eric leave to go to the airport to recover the camcorder? They did. And at some point after they left for the airport, did you actually see this camcorder? Yes. And did Mrs. Menendez <coughs> use the camcorder uh, during the trip that you observed? Yes. Now, at some point, did Mr. Menendez then join, uh, okay, let me get the chronology correct. You were in the Chicago area at your home, was, and this is before your first trip to Kalamazoo, is that correct? Yes. And how was it that you and Kitty Menendez and Eric Menendez got to Kalamazoo for the start of the tournament? Kitty and Eric drove. And how did you get there? I flew my plane. And then you met up with them there, is that correct? That's, they picked us up at the airport. All right. Now, when was it in this chronology that Mr. Menendez arrived in the Kalamazoo area? I don't vividly recall if he arrived there before or after I did. I think he was there before I was there. Uh, but that evening he was there. All right. And that was before the tournament actually began. Is that correct? As I recall. Okay. And then I believe you indicated that you stayed for a couple of days and you left. That's correct. And then you returned. That's correct. And when you returned, how much time had gone by between your leaving and returning? Two days, I think. Did you return home for business reasons or something like that? Uh, uh, never mind. I'm, I'm going to go on. Um, when you returned the second time to Kalamazoo, did you see Eric Menendez play in any matches? No. All right. Um, was he was he through playing by that time? Yes. All right. When you were there for the first trip, did you see Eric Menendez play in any matches? Yes. And did you see him in a particular match that he lost? Yes. And could you describe, first of all, were you familiar with Eric Menendez's style of playing tennis? Somewhat. Uh, how many matches had you seen Eric Menendez play prior to the Kalamazoo uh, tournament in 1989? I, I don't remember the number, quite a few. Would it be more than 10? I think so. All right, and did you notice anything about the way he was playing this last match that you saw him play? He was playing uh, a different style, and he wasn't happy with the result. Excuse me, I've here the last All right, we'll have the answer read back. Thank you. Could we ask the witness to put it in the Yes, if you could move a little closer to the mic. Can I get some water, too, sir? He was playing a different style, and he wasn't happy with the result. When you say he wasn't happy with the result, who are you referring to? Eric. Did he? So he appeared to be unhappy with his results? Yes. Were you in the stands with Mr. Menendez when this occurred? I was. How did Mr. Menendez respond to the way that Eric Menendez was performing in this particular match? He was trying to get him back into his uh, normal groove. And what was... I'm going to object to that as speculation conclusion and part of it. Overall, the answer will stand. What particular things did you hear or see Mr. Menendez do in order to achieve this end of getting Eric back into his groove? The, um, Mr. Menendez was giving hand signals. He was giving hand signals? Various sorts to Eric. Did you um, ever see Eric Menendez look in the direction of his father when his father was giving these signals? Occasionally. Now, during this particular match, were you aware of whether or not Eric Menendez had a tennis coach with him? He did not. All right. And at that particular time, his father, I believe you've indicated, was giving him hand signals. Is that correct? That's correct. Was there something that occurred during this interchange between Eric Menendez and his father that caught your attention? Next before the question, since that's Overall, do you understand the question? Did you see, Could it be repeated? Yeah. Did you see any uh, verbal response by Eric Menendez to what his father was doing? Uh, Eric was very frustrated with himself and very frustrated with his father. And how did he express that frustration? He was shouting at everyone. When you say he was shouting at everyone, was this during the match? Yes. And at whom was he shouting when you say everyone? 
the other player, uh, Jose. Uh, did you actually see him direct remarks at his father in a loud tone of voice? Oh, yes. All right. And how does his re father react to what <coughs> Eric Menendez did? You're very upset that he was failing to communicate with him. Okay. And how did I'm going to object to that as speculation for the witness. Sustain the answer, Strickland. Okay. Um, specifically, if, if you recall anything Mr. Menendez said or did uh, to convey his state of mind, could you tell us what he did after Eric Menendez had said something to him? During the match? Yes. He continued to try to get his attention. And what would he do to continue to try to get Eric Menendez's attention? To give him hand signals, and Eric at that point did not uh, look at him anymore. Did Eric lose the match? Yes. All right. And was um, prior to the match beginning, uh, how was Eric Menendez behaving in terms of his tennis abilities? In other words, um, did he appear to be proud of himself from how he performed in Louisville, or can you describe that for well, us? I'm going to object to calling for speculation conclusion. Sustained as to the form of the question. Okay. Could you describe for us, please, how Eric Menendez was um, behaving when he first got to Kalamazoo after having performed well in Louisville? I'm going to object to this as well, Your Honor. It's irrelevant. Ask for an offer. Well, it might well be relevant, but it's uh, unclear as to what you mean by behaving. So objection sustained to the formal question. What was Mr. Eric Menendez's confidence level when he began the match in Kalamazoo? Objection. It calls for speculation. Sustained. What did you observe in terms of Eric Menendez's state of mind as to his prospects for winning the Kalamazoo tournament after having competed in Louisville? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation. You can't observe someone's Sustained. state of mind. Sustained. Did you observe Eric Menendez make any comments about how he felt he was going to do uh, in the Kalamazoo match? Yes. And what did he say in that regard? He felt very excited about the fact he drew a player that was very low. And, and standing, and he felt he was going to do very well. And are you referring to the player um, that he had the match with where his father was giving him the hand signals? That's correct. All right. And ultimately, what was the result of that particular match with this player? He lost. Okay. And after he lost that match, could you tell us what occurred, please? Jose uh, went up to talk to uh, Eric, uh, and uh, Eric screamed at him to shut up, and he... Uh, Tried a little further conversation, uh, which didn't go anywhere, and um, Jose walked away. Now, when Eric screamed at his father to shut up, did Jose Menendez strike his son? I never saw that. Okay, did Mr. Menendez do anything? Uh, did Mr. Menendez scream back at him? No. Well, you indicated that Mr. Menendez continued to try to speak to his son. Could you tell us in what tone of voice he was continuing to try to speak to his son? He was trying to rationalize with him. Objection or calls for speculation. Sustained. Answer yes, straight. All right. What kind of things was Mr. Menendez saying to Eric Menendez um, after Eric Menendez screamed at him? You're not going to object to the form of the question unless she's asking for the Did conversation. Objection overruled as to. Um, well, objection sustained, actually. Why don't you ask if he actually heard these things did, Mr. Anderson, did you hear the interchange between Eric Menendez and his father after Eric screamed at his father? Yes. How far away from them were you standing? We were walking around. It was at various points of distance, uh, at some point very close. And, and when you say you were walking around, were you walking in a particular direction or were you just milling around? Or, how did that occur? The match was over. We were walking over to where uh, Eric was packing his bag to leave the court area. And you overheard uh, the conversation then between Mr. Menendez and Eric Menendez? Yes. Could you hear Eric Menendez clearly when he screamed at his father? Oh, yes. What did he say to his father? He just screamed, shut up to him. And, then, and his father continued, is that correct? For one or two more words and then left. He just walked. He said, I can't. Uh, uh, what did he say, Mr. I can't, uh, if I can't communicate with you, there's no sense talking, and he left. And when you say he left, did he leave with Eric Menendez or without him? He walked in front of the group. We all left together. All right, and ultimately, did you leave the side of the match together with Mr. Menendez and Eric and Mrs. Menendez? Yes. Now, during the course of um, your sister's life, had you ever seen her interact with her sons? Did you ever see her <coughs> communicating with her sons during the course of her life? Oh, yes. Did you ever see her show any affection to her sons? I'm going to object as Vegas to time, place, Overall. and son. Overall. 
Your answer? Yes. Could you, uh, do you have a specific recollection here today of an incident that you recall where she was affectionate with her sons? Can I would take an ask to approach. Overall. For an offer? Overall. Your answer? In Louisville, uh, when he was winning the matches there. All right, so she was affectionate with Eric, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever see Eric talk back to his parents during the course of his life? Objection, Vegas to time. Overall. Yes. On how many, do you have a specific incident in mind that you can recall, or is it this a general impression that you have, or can you tell us what that is? Frequently, it was uh, when they were together. All right, and did you ever hear Eric Menendez use any kind of <clears throat> language on his mother which contained some minor profanities? Yes. All right, what kind of language did you hear Eric Menendez use towards his mother? I'm going to object again. Vegas to time, place, situation. Overall. You can answer your question. He would use expressions as goddamn, which was uh, bullshit, things like that. And that was to his mother, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever see him use that kind of language towards his father? I don't recall. How about Lyle Menendez? Did you ever see him use any kind of language similar to that with his either his mother or his father? Yes. And with whom did you see Lyle Menendez use that kind of language? With both parents. And was that um, in a time period within the <coughs> three years prior to their deaths that you saw that kind of language from Lyle Menendez? I couldn't say that it was exactly within three years. But you have a specific memory that you observed him to use that kind of language on his parents, is that correct? Yes. Now, does your family have any relatives in Quito, Ecuador? Yes. Could you describe um, which family members and what their situation is, please? Uh, cousins from uh, Scandinavia. And do they have a business in Ecuador? Yes. Did your sister ever tell you that she had intentions to go visit um, re your relatives in Quito? Yes. And what, were, what was your sister's statement as to her intent upon visiting these relatives? She asked me if I would like to join her and our cousin June. Your cousin who? June. Uh, all right. Is that another Anderson cousin? It's uh, an Anderson side cousin that lives in Northern California. And did you have any idea of when uh, your sister wanted to take a trip to Quito, Ecuador? They were planning to do it that winter. By that winter, which winter are you referring to, The sir? winter of 89, 90. Had you made any commitment as to whether or not you would go with her? I was unable to. You were unable? I was not able to go. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, did you, I believe you indicated that you had um, visited the family in the, in the East Coast when they lived back there, is that correct? That's correct. Um, when Lyle Menendez was approximately 15 or 16 years old, did you begin to notice something about his hairline? Yes. And what is it you noticed about his hairline? He was thinning. And did you ever mention this to Lyle Menendez? No. Did you ever mention it to anybody else? Kitty and Jose and I talked about it. All right. And do you remember about what age it was that um, you first noticed that Lyle Menendez's hairline was thinning? It was in the uh, summer of 86, as I recall. All right. Now, um, the summer of 86, then, was the summer that the family moved to California. Is that correct? It was later that year. All right. So your recollection is, is that this incident, or this, this first time you noticed it, occurred in the summer of 86, but in the East Coast. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, um, your sister, did you ever see your sister drink alcohol? Yes. Um, do other members of your family drink alcohol? Yes. Okay. Did you ever see your sister where you felt that she was drunk? Never. May I have a moment, please, Your Honor? I think I'm done. <coughs> <clears throat> I 
have nothing further of this witness at this time. Cross examination. Yes, sir. Mr. Anderson, um, you have two sons of your own, do you not? Yes, ma'am. And one of them, who's known as Alan Anderson, testified in this trial. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Anderson, have you been watching the trial on videotape or on court TV or on cable television? I, I've seen one tape of it. Okay. And have you been, there's been things written about the case as it's been progressing through trial. Have you read any of those things? A couple of them. Okay. Now, are you personally a tennis player? No. Was your sister a tennis player? Yes. And uh, did you observe your brother-in-law, Jose Menendez, play tennis? Yes. Were either of your sons tennis players? No. Did you ever study tennis or read tennis books as a consequence of your nephews being involved in the sport? Would you ask the question again? Yes. Well, both Lyle and Eric were involved with tennis from an early age, to your knowledge, correct? That's correct. Did you ever try to bone up on tennis or read about tennis because the nephews were your nephews, which is what they are, were involved with it? Yes. Okay. What did you read about it? Periodicals. Okay. And did your brother-in-law, Jose Menendez, hold himself out to you as a great proficient and expert in tennis? I don't know to that extreme, but yes, he... He talked like he knew a lot about it, didn't he? Yes. Now, you have indicated in your testimony that your mother passed away in 1984. That's correct. She passed away, did she not, on your airplane? That is correct. And seated opposite your mother when she died was Eric Menendez. Correct? I don't remember the seating arrangement. But he was in the back of the plane with his grandmother when she uh, suffered her fatal attack. Do you remember that? That's correct. And wasn't it on return from a holiday that she had been spending with the Menendez's that she died? No. No, do I have that wrong? Was she on her way there? No. She was on her way somewhere for a holiday, was she not? She was on the plane, yes. Okay. And it was around a holiday season. She was going to visit? Thanksgiving. Okay. And did you ever discuss with Eric Menendez what the effect upon him was of having his grandmother pass away right before his eyes? Your Honor, I would object to this as being the eldest fault. Sustained. Did you and your sister ever discuss the effect on her son of what had happened in that airplane in 1984? Yeah, I would object to this Sustain. Well, I'd like to make an offer with respect. All right, let's go on to something else, and perhaps you come back to it. Okay. Now, you've indicated there was a time for approximately a year or a little more than a year when you lived in close proximity to your sister after her marriage. Correct? That's correct. And that was the time that she and uh, Jose and the children lived um, in Hinsdale, East Hinsdale, actually. Correct? The location is incorrect. The it, town is correct. It was not East Hinsdale? I, I don't know that there is any such place. Okay. You know Hinsdale, though? Yes. And this was a, a fairly new housing tract in that area? Yes. And you, at the time, lived in Oak Lawn, which is where you grew up? Yes. And at the time that um, your sister and her husband lived in Hinsdale, how old was Eric? I don't know that Eric was born. Eric was born when they lived in Cedar Grove, if this would refresh your recollection, and they moved to Hinsdale when he was two months old. And they lived there until just before his second birthday. Does that refresh your memory? Mm. No? 
So I remember Lyle running around the house. I don't remember Eric running around. Okay, so you don't remember Eric from Hinsdale at all. Now, where did they live after Hinsdale? <laughs> They moved to the East Coast. Uh, Do you know what state? I believe they moved to um, Upper State New York. And did you have an opportunity to visit their home there, or did you only start visiting when they moved to New Jersey? No, I visited them in Munsey, New York. Excuse me? I, miss, I visited them in Munsey, New York. Munsey, New York. So that's where they moved to? Yes. And what year was it that uh, you visited them in Munsey, New York? I don't remember. Did your son Alan spend a summer with the family in Muncie, at least yes. one summer? More than one summer, to the best of your recollection? I don't remember it being more than one. I do remember one. And do you know if your son Alan spent time with the family when they lived in Hinsdale? May have, but... Uh now, you said that um, you visited the homes in the East <clears throat> often. Were there specific occasions upon which you made those visits, or were they just whenever you could? Whenever I could, and sometimes specific occasions. Was there any set holidays, for example, when you would always visit their home in the East? Not that I recall. Altogether, Mr. Anderson, how many times do you think you visited the home in Muncie, New York? I don't know. Were you there when Eric was being taught to ride a bicycle by being pushed down a hill into a cul-de-sac? Not that I recall. Now, did you also visit them in other homes besides the one in Muncie? Yes. And what other homes did you visit them in while they still lived on the East Coast? Is there a time frame? Uh, do you know what years they lived uh, in Muncie? Not offhand. Okay. Would it refresh your recollection if I told you that they moved to Muncie in 1972 and remained there until they moved to Princeton Junction in 19... <coughs> 77. If those are the dates, uh, whatever they were. Okay. And did you visit them when they lived in Princeton Junction on the, I think it's South Mill Road house? Yes, I did. And that how long did they live at that location? I think about a year. And did you visit them when they moved from that house to the house in Pennington? Yes. How many times did you visit in the Pennington house? A few times. I don't remember exactly. Would it be fair to say you don't have an exact recollection about how many times you visited either in Muncie or in Pennington? I have it in a pilot log, but I don't have it here. You have it in your pilot log because you always flew? Most of the time. Okay. As I recall, I did. And when you would visit, would you visit with your wife and your children? Sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes would you visit by yourself? Yes. When you visited by yourself, would the visits be brief? What do you mean by brief? A day or so. Sometimes. And when you would visit by yourself, would you stay at uh, your sister's house? Yes. And when you'd visit with your wife and children, uh, would, you, would the family stay at their house? Yes. And how long would you stay as a family? It would vary. From what to what? A couple of days to maybe four, five, six days. Do you have any idea, Mr. Anderson, of what the total number of days are that you ever spent uh, at the home of your sister when she lived on the East Coast? No. Do you think it was more than 20? I don't remember. Now, did you uh, see, you said that there were 
trips that you would take together. Was this, um, would it be fair to say that if you would spend consecutive days with your sister, the most frequent way that you did that was on these vacations? Is that when you actually spent the longest intervals of time with her over the years? I don't know that that's true, but. Okay. Um, you took ski trips together with her and her family? Yes. And was it you and your wife and your sons and they and their sons? Yes. And did you go to uh, various different ski resorts? Yes. And how many different ski trips, just roughly, do you think you took? More than one. I don't remember exactly. And was your sister an accomplished skier? She was fairly good. She was quite athletic, was she not? Yes. And you said there were also trips uh, fishing to Canada. Yes. Now, did your father own some property in Canada? Yes. A camp, a fishing camp, was it? Yes. And uh, would, was it a, um, strike that. Did Eric and his mother, on more than one occasion, following the Nationals at Kalamazoo on earlier years, earlier than 89, proceed to Canada afterwards for a fishing holiday at your father's place? Yes. And would you, meet, would you go with them there or meet them there? One or the other. Would you do that? One or the other. Okay. So that was some, something of a family ritual, if you will, to go from Kalamazoo to Canada for the fishing. I don't know that a ritual applies, but we would... A practice. Yes. Now, how many different um, junior national tournaments at Kalamazoo uh, did you go, did you attend? I believe the first one was in 85 and then every year after that, until 89. And when you went in 85, was it to see Lyle play? Yes. And, you, and did you go in 86? Yes. Again to see Lyle play? I believe it would have been Lyle. Uh, my best recollection is whether it was every, every uh, August, as I best recall. Okay. Um, but not August of 1988. Do you recall that was a year that neither of the boys played there? Do you remember Eric had a broken ankle the summer of 88, didn't go to Kalamazoo? Okay. Do you remember telling Miss uh, Lansing and me that when we spoke to you on April 28th, 1992, at your business in Illinois, I think you indicated that you did not believe that uh, you went to Kalamazoo in 88, Eric didn't play that year. Remember that? I don't have notes of that. You were going to give me notes of that visit and didn't do that, so I don't have notes of that, so I don't remember that. Would it, you think it might refresh your recollection if I show you the notes of that? Right now? Sure. Okay. okay. Um, it may not, but does that refresh your recollection concerning going to Kalamazoo to see either or both of your nephews play? If they didn't play, I didn't go. Right. Does it refresh your recollection that um, you didn't go in 88? If they didn't play, I didn't go. Now, th this particular tournament is for um, male players of what age? This, this final round of, this is the final round of the national tour in Kalamazoo each summer, is that correct? I don't know that. Okay, so you don't know the technical aspect of what tournament it is, but how old are the boys who play in this tournament? 15 through 18 as I recall. So would it be fair to say that Lyle would have been too old to play in 88, correct? Because he would have been 20 in 88. Yes. So if either were going to play in 88, it would have been Eric, correct? Yes. But if he didn't play, you didn't go, right? If he didn't play, I didn't go. All right. 
<laughs> now, in 87, um, do you believe you saw Eric play there? If it wasn't 88, it would have been 87. Okay. And how many matches did you see Eric play in 87? I don't recall. Uh, how long does this tournament run in Kalamazoo, do you know? The tournament itself, as I recall, it ran uh, over two weekends and a week, the weekend between. So it encompasses two weekends and the weekdays in between. That's as I remember it. So it's about uh, nine days. Eight or nine days. <clears throat> and do the boys play tennis? Uh, are there matches every single day? There are matches every single day, as I recall. And do you recall ever attending where you stayed the entire eight or nine days? I don't think that I did. Now, if a boy doesn't play very well, and let's say he loses the, in the first match or he loses in the second match, uh, then he gets into the consolation matches. Is that right? The matches with all the other boys who have lost. That's correct. And if he loses there, it, the tournament is over for him, correct? Unless he's playing in doubles or some other. Unless he plays. Uh, we're just talking about singles play, though, correct? Well, he didn't clarify it, yes. As far as you know, did uh, Eric or Lyle play doubles at these tournaments, or did they play only the singles part? They played doubles. They played doubles? Do you recall seeing Eric play doubles in 87? I watched doubles matches. I don't know if Eric was in one of the doubles matches in 87. Okay. So you, I, I take it you can't tell me how many separate matches you saw Eric play in in 87, right? That's correct. And in 87, before the Kalamazoo uh, leg of the tournament, had you gone somewhere else to see his play on the national circuit? such as you did in 89 when you went to Louisville? <coughs> I may have. I don't recall. Okay. Um, where else had you seen Eric play uh, matches, tennis matches, besides Kalamazoo and uh, Louisville in 89? Uh, let me strike that because I don't want to mislead you. I'm not going to limit this to 1989. You've told us you saw him play in Louisville in 1989. Yes. You saw him play in Kalamazoo in 1989. Yes. You saw him play once before in Kalamazoo, correct? Either 87, if not 88. Yes. Right? Where else had you seen Eric play tennis matches? Pennsylvania. And when was that? I can't remember the year. How old was he? I can't remember. Was it when they were still living on the East Coast? Yes. How old was Eric when they moved to the West Coast? I can't remember how old he was. When's his birthday? I don't know. I don't you remember don't know the, I don't birthday. remember the year, no. What year is it? Hmm? What year was he born? Approximately. If that's the best you know. Sixty-four. Sixty-four. Sixty-three. Mr. Anderson, I'm, um, I'm Eric, guessing. I'm just asking me to guess. I guessed. Well, no, I asked if you don't know what when his birthday is. You, do you know how old he is? We're talking about Eric or Lyle. Eric. Well, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. Okay. When's Eric's birthday? I don't know. Uh, when, I, I just want to make sure you understood the previous two questions. I had asked you where else you had seen Eric play besides Kalamazoo and Louisville, and you told me Pennsylvania. Is that Eric you were talking about? I'm quite sure. I watched both boys play there. Okay. But right now I'm just doing the Eric part, okay? Okay. And. And when you saw Eric play in Pennsylvania, he was still living on the East Coast, correct? Yes. And I asked you if you had any idea of how old he was when you saw him play in Pennsylvania. Do yes, you? Yes, you did. And you don't recall? No. So then I asked you how old he was when the family moved to California, and you didn't recall that? Okay. At that point, uh, I was focusing on Lyle. Okay. Well, let's stay with Eric for a while. Okay. okay. When did the family move to California? In 1986, as I recall. And 
how old would Eric have been in 1986? I would have to guess. How much time uh, would do you think, um, Mr. Anderson, you actually spent with Eric Menendez before the family moved to California? I don't know. And when you were asked by Mrs. Bazanich if you could call up an incident where you saw your sister being affectionate to Eric, you told us about Louisville, is that correct? That's correct. In 1989. That's correct. And you don't even remember Eric existing in Hinsdale, is that correct? A long time ago. Now, you said you had three visits to California after the family moved to California. Is that your best recollection? That's correct. OK. Um, I mean, I don't doubt it. I just wanted to ask you when these three visits were. When they were? Yes, sir. The uh, first visit was in uh, January of 1987. And where was the family living then, the Menendez family? In a rental home in Calabasas. <clears throat> Did you notice, by the way, in that house that the entire living room was filled with boxes? Such as you couldn't get in it? Such as there was nothing else in it but boxes. There were boxes in there. I don't know that. Mr. Anderson, were you familiar with your sister's habit of never throwing anything out, basically? She collected stuff, didn't she? She may have. Mr. Anderson, didn't you visit the house in Calabasas where hundreds of boxes of possessions of your sisters and brother-in-laws was stored and go through them and remove things that were of sentimental value to you. Objection, in 1986, right. in 87? In, in 1990, 91. Objection, Vegas, to which Calabasas house was Sustained. Mr. Anderson, after your sister died, did you go to the home that they had been building in Calabasas and go through the garage, which was filled with boxes containing possessions of your sister and her husband. Yes. And did you go through those things and remove things, with permission, that had sentimental value to you? Yes. And did you notice in looking through those boxes that there were things going back 20 and 30 years? Yes. And did you notice there were things like old magazines and old recipes and old coupons and old school papers of both the parents and the children? Yes. And did you see there were also entire boxes of old tennis shoes and tennis rackets? Yes. And did you see that there were many boxes full of photographs? What constitutes many? Well, more than three. Probably. And did you go through those things looking for things of sentimental value that you wish to keep? Yes. And you removed things, did you? Yes. Know? And the custodian of all of these materials was Maria Menendez, was it not? Yes. And at the time that you were looking through all of these materials, your nephews were in jail, correct? Yes. Now, going back to the visits to California, you said you visited in January of 1987. Were you by yourself on that visit? No. And who came with you? My father. 
Was your father already ill then, in 1987? Was he ill? He was fine in 87. Okay. When, when did he become ill? When did he die? No, I know when he died. When did he, when was he diagnosed as having cancer? Uh, well, he had cancer in prior to 87, if that was the question, but it okay. was well, I, in remission, I, I, it wasn't, he wasn't ill. Okay, but he had cancer. Yeah. Was he um, in that same condition in remission and not ill in 1989, or had, was he beginning to get sick again? Uh, no, he was fine. So you and your father came in January of 87? That's correct. And how long did you remain in California on that trip? Just overnight. And did you stay with your sister? Yes. And did you see Eric or Lyle? Eric. And was he playing tennis on that one day you were here? No. And what was the next time that you came? Later in 87. Do you recall what time of year? I won't ask you the month, just what time of year? I would like to suggest it was in the summer months. Okay. And that same summer, do you recall the summer of 87 being in Canada at your father's fishing camp with Eric and, and your sister? If it was 87, yes. And in fact, do you, do you have photographs from that summer that show you teaching Eric how to bone fish? How to clean fish? Clean fish, yeah. yeah. I think you were filleting and doing more than cleaning them. Do you remember teaching him that that summer yes. in Canada? Mm -hmm. And how long was Eric and his mother in uh, Canada with you in the summer of 87? I believe it was uh, five days. Could have been more, could have been less. Okay. And what was the uh, third trip to California? What year was that? I don't recall. Do you recall a trip in 1988? I don't recall if the other trip was in 87 or 88. Could have been in 88. Okay, so the third trip might have also been in 1987 or it could have been in 1988. Yes. And in 1988, do you recall, apart from this possible trip, was there any other time or place when you saw your sister? Objection vague is the time. Overall. Other than the discussions of her being in my house, yes. Well, was your sister at your house in 1988? I believe so. And what was she doing there? I don't understand the question. Okay, we're assuming for the sake of, just assuming for the moment, that Eric did not play in Kalamazoo in 88, and neither, of course, did Lyle, okay? If neither of the boys played in Kalamazoo in 88, would your sister have been at your house that year? Could have. Okay, do you have any specific recollection of your sister being at your house in 88? Specific? No. Now, you live in, a, in an area called, I won't give the address, but Downers Grove? That's correct. And how long have you lived? And this is a house you built yourself? That's correct. And uh, how long have you lived there? Since 1979. And how many times do you think since you've uh, lived in that house, has your sister spent at least one night under your roof? I don't remember. Has Jose Menendez, or had Jose Menendez ever slept at your house? Yes. And I believe you've testified that in August of 1989, Eric and his mother slept at your house one night? 
As I recall, it was one night. And in 1987, do you recall if they stayed at your house? Could have been two nights in uh, 89, but anyway, what was the next question? No, that's okay. Could have been two nights in 89? Could have been. When did the tournament begin, do you know? In 89? Yeah. I think they were there either Friday or Saturday on the trip. Do you remember the date? Because I, I don't want to go racing for an 89 calendar at the moment. Was it, does the tournament begin on the first or on the second? You know what I mean? I don't recall. Okay. Let me talk to you about that for a moment, though. Um, did you know in 1989, in August, just before the Kalamazoo tournament, did you know if your sister and Eric were coming from the same place or from different places <laughs> to get to your house? In fact, to get to Illinois. You don't understand the, the, my question? The, the okay. question is confusing to me. Right, let's start with this. Do you know where your sister was, say, three days before the start, or two days before the start of the Kalamazoo tournament? I seem to recall they came to Chicago from Florida, but I'm not certain about that. Do you think your sister came from Florida, or Eric came from Florida? <laughs> Both or either? I don't recall exactly uh, whether they... Uh, uh, it seems, my, my, my memory seems to tell me that Kitty met Eric in Florida and came to Chicago. That's as I best recall it. Do you know if anyone met uh, Kitty and Eric at the airport in Chicago? I don't believe so. I believe they rented a car. If I were to tell you, Mr. Anderson, that witnesses placed your sister in California, just before she went to, Cat to Chicago for the tournament, would that in any way refresh or change your recollection? As I said, I'm not sure. It could be true. And if, if I were to tell you that Eric Menendez has testified that he went to Kalamazoo directly from Florida, and in fact we have a plane ticket that shows that, would that refresh your recollection? What you're saying is he didn't stay at my house? No. I'm saying if I were to tell you that we have documents like plane tickets to show that your sister flew from Los Angeles to Chicago and that Eric flew from Tampa to Chicago and met up there, would that refresh your recollection as to who was coming from where? You met in Chicago? Right. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't, though. It's, I, as I said, I don't recall. Um, you've told us about this incident about the camcorder. You, you got to see the camcorder at some point, did you not? Yes. Could you show me with your hands how big it was? I have to go over here because the bench blocks your hands. Show, me with, show us with your hands how big it was. The camera about. You're on a report make an estimate. You say about a foot? Uh, it's a guess anyway, but it's fine. All right. We both guess a foot. Thank you. So it was about a foot long. And when you saw it, did it have a case of some kind, some carrying case of some sort? Uh, yes, it did. And when Eric was talking about what all these phone calls had been about, when he was telling his mother that he left a camcorder on the airplane, couldn't you tell from the conversation that she hadn't been on the same airplane with him? I don't recall that. Thank you. But you heard him tell his mother that he had a camcorder and he had left it in the overhead compartment above his seat on the airplane, right? Yes. And that he had tracked it down and that they were holding it for him in baggage claim. Yes. And what airport was it that they were holding it for him? O'Hare. And how far was O'Hare Airport from your home? In, in miles and time. Um, well, both, I guess. Miles and time. Miles, I'm not sure. It's about 30, 35 minutes in time, <coughs> depending on traffic, of course. Okay. 
Now, is it your testimony that this uh, conversation about the camcorder occurs in the morning? Yes. Are you sure about that? Yes. What time did um, Eric and his mother arrive at your house the night before? In the, uh, I don't recall. It was sometime in the afternoon or evening. Were you home when they got there? I don't remember. Um, do you remember if your son Tim's wife met them at the airport or met either one of them and drove either one of them to your home? I don't remember that. Do you know if before coming to your home, whether or not your sister went to Oak Lawn to visit other family members? Would you ask that question again? Yes, during the same time period, this August of 1989, do you know whether or not Kitty went to Oak Lawn, which is where you guys grew up, before she came to Downers Grove to your house that day? She visited Oak Lawn on that trip, whether it was that day or then before she came or after. I think it seemed to me that it was after. So you think that she visited Oak Lawn after she went to Kalamazoo? Oh, no. Okay. So what After she was at my house. All right. How long did they stay at your house before they went to Kalamazoo? I believe two evenings. Two evenings. And your wife, Pat, was there at that time, was she not? Yes. And do you remember, um, apart from this trip to uh, the airport, what else was done by either your sister or by Eric while they were staying at your house? I do not understand that question. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Uh, what time was it in the morning that uh, Kitty and Eric took off for O'Hare Airport to retrieve the camcorder? It would be a guess. So you don't remember? It was middle morning. And how long after um, Eric had told his mother that he had left the camera on the airplane, was it that they left? As I best recall, it was within the hour. Within the hour. And during the course of that hour, did your sister remain disturbed and upset? She was more uptight after the incident than she was before. Now, you said that she um, interrogated him about why he wanted to borrow the car and what the phone call was about. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's when he told her, told her, I left a camcorder on the airplane, but they're holding it for me. Yes. And then you said her reaction when he told her that was she was very upset and disturbed, I think you said. That's Is that correct. correct? That's correct. And did you see her demeanor change? I mean, her physical appearance change? At what point? When she was upset and disturbed. Oh, yes. Did you see her clench her fists and grit her teeth? I don't recall that. Did you ever see her do that? I may have, but I don't recall. Was that a characteristic look of your sister's when she was upset or frustrated or angry? Clench her fists, grit her teeth. Just like that? Well, I don't look like her, but an approximation. She had many gestures. Is that no? Or is that maybe? Was that one of her That's, gestures? I'm not understanding the question. I'm trying to answer it. Okay. When your sister would be angry or upset or frustrated, did you see her from the time she was a teenage girl? Did you see her clench her, te her hands, her fists, and shake them? Did you ever see her do that? I may have. Did you see her grit her teeth with tension? Did you ever see her do that? I may have. Did you ever hear her raise her voice? I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. Did you ever hear her raise her voice? Oh, yes.
Now, you have told us, Mr. Anderson, that among the four of you, the four siblings of your family, you and your sister Kitty were the closest, correct? That's correct. And as a consequence, she, I take it, confided in you. That's correct. I, I assume that she did. She confided in you to the extent she'd confide in anyone. Would you say that would be a fair statement? Can you take the cost speculation? It's a statement. And you've told us that sometime before 1989, sometime after the move to California, she confided in you that she had an infidelity problem with Jose. That's correct. Are those the words that she used? That's correct. What else did she tell you about it? I don't recall. We discussed the incident briefly. In fact, she didn't tell you anything beyond that, did she? We discussed the incident. Did she tell you how long this infidelity problem had gone on? I don't recall that. In 1980, did she tell you when she was still living in New Jersey that she had an infidelity problem with Jose and had left the family home to stay in a motel for several nights? No. And uh, with respect to what she's telling you, first of all, do you remember how long after the family moved to California she told you about the infidelity problem? It wasn't long after. I don't remember exactly. Do you know where the family was living when she told you that? Would have been Calabasas. Do you know where they lived before they rented the house in Calabasas? It seems they were in a hotel or apartment or something. I don't remember. I, Did she ever mention to you that she was living at an Oakwood apartment, which was sort of like a, an apartment hotel type setup, furnished services, that whole thing? That is vague to me. It sounds vaguely familiar? It's or vague to me. Sure. Okay. Did she tell you when she was confiding in you about the infidelity problem, about the arguments and fights she was having with Jose over his having cheated on her for eight years? No. Did she tell you that there was discussion of divorce? No. Uh, when did your sister tell you that she was in therapy because of the suicidal thoughts that the infidelity problem had caused? Do you ask the question again? Yes. When did your sister tell you that she was in psychotherapy because of the depression and the suicidal thoughts that Jose's infidelity problem had caused her? I can't answer that question. She never told you, did she? I can't answer that question Why? the way it's asked. Did she ever tell you she was in therapy? Yes. When did she tell you that? I can't recall. Did but, she tell uh, you? And in therapy, she said, uh, to say that she was in therapy, she said she was seeing a therapist, which I guess would be the equivalent of saying she was in therapy. When did she tell you that? In phone conversations. It was not a big deal. A different phone conversation than the infidelity one? I believe so. And who was the therapist? I don't recall that we discussed that. And why was she seeing a therapist? We discussed that as being something that was pretty common in California. So it was just to be trendy? Excuse me, Honor. Can I ask for five minutes? Okay. Your Honor, may we approach about time and schedule? Yeah, let's... Uh, Anybody who needs a short break, if the jurors want to stay in place, but those who need to take a break, you can do that. And uh, the rest of you can stay put so we can leave for a moment. And then we'll proceed. Uh, we'll go until 5 o'clock, and then we'll take our break. Tomorrow morning, um, one juror has a medical appointment, uh, so we'll start at 10 o'clock tomorrow. I'll have the lawyers here at 9 and go over some matters with them. And as far as tomorrow afternoon, I know there's interest in getting out early because of the holiday, and we'll try to accommodate you. I can't tell you exactly when it will, will be. It won't be at noon, probably, but it'll be hopefully before the um, 5 o'clock time that we've been doing here. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll work on it so that we can get you out a little early on uh, Thanksgiving Eve. May I confer with the last Sure. Yeah. And as far as the time estimates for the trial and uh, when arguments would take place and things of that nature. I've been conferring with the lawyers here, and um, they've given me some information. And tomorrow morning, I'll get uh, some more from them. And then when you come in tomorrow morning, I'll give you uh, 
or share with you the information they've given me as to when the evidence phase will be over and when the arguments will begin, and then I'll give you more information about that, the scheduling after that. So it shouldn't be um, um, much more than tomorrow morning when you get this information. We'll now proceed with the examination of the witness for their cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. I believe I was asking you, Mr. Anderson, if you ever asked your sister, you tell us that, uh... oh, by the way, did you tell Mrs. Bozanich, who has been interviewing you these past few days, that your sister told you she was in therapy? I don't recall that I did. I don't, I don't remember. You don't remember if you told that to Mrs. Bozanich today or yesterday or the day before? If she asked me the question, I would have told her. I remember she asked me. Well, she interviewed you on Sunday, is that correct? That's correct. She interviewed you again yesterday, correct? Yes, she did. And she talks to you periodically over the course of the day today, correct? Yes. And you refused to allow any members from the defense team to be present on Sunday when she interviewed you, is that right? I refused. You refused. Isn't that right? Am I misinformed? Mrs. Bozanich told us you refused to have either Mr. Bird or any of us there. I had already spoken to you. You had spoken to me and refused to talk about your sister or the family or how they interact. Did you recall that? I don't recall that. Mm -hmm. You knew we wanted to speak to you on Sunday or at least be present for her interview, didn't you? It was mentioned to me. And you refused, correct? I had already spoken to you. Well, do you want me to read to the jurors what you were willing to talk to Mrs. Lansing and I about in 1992? Excuse me, this is beyond scope. You were very concerned, were you not, in 1992, Mr. Anderson, that none of your family's secrets be revealed. Wouldn't you say that's an accurate statement? Your Honor, that's argumentative. Sustain. And you still don't want any of your family secrets revealed, would that be fair to say? Your Honor, um, I have it's still argumentative. Objection like sustained. Now, is it your testimony that Mrs. Bozanich uh, never asked you if you knew if your sister was seeing a therapist? Is that your testimony? She may have asked. But you didn't tell her, isn't that true? Excuse me, Your Honor. Um, I object to this as assuming that's not in evidence. Overall. Do you understand the question? No, John, I'm lost in the question. If you're all right, well, let, let me go through a few things. Mrs. Bozanich, in her interviews, first of all, you spoke to her on the telephone about a month and a half ago, and, and she interviewed you that way as well, correct? I don't know the time frame. We talked on the telephone. Okay, and you talked about your sister and her family and various facts that you claim to have personal knowledge of, correct? Yes. <coughs> yes? Yes. Okay, and then you talked to her again and indicated to her, oh, about a week to ten days ago, that you were now willing to be a witness in this case, correct? She asked me if I would be a witness, and the answer was yes. Well, she had been asking you all along if you would, but it was only about a week or ten days ago that you agreed. Is that correct? That's true. And she interviewed you then on Sunday when you came in from Illinois, right? That's correct. And she's had these other conversations with you during the course of these past two days, correct? That's correct. And uh, she asked you, uh, she, she was trying to find out from you uh, how close you and your sister were, right? Objection, Your Honor, um, as being irrelevant, what I was trying to find out. Sustained call for speculation. She asked you questions to find out how much you knew about what was really going on in your sister's life, didn't she? Your Honor, again, that would call for speculation. Sustained. She asked you if you knew about uh, Jose's affair, right? Yes. And you told her that what your sister had told you was she had an infidelity problem with Jose, right? That's correct. Yes? That's correct. She asked you about your sister's drinking, and you told her that your sister drank but never was drunk. Is that I correct? I never saw her drunk. That's correct. Okay. And, are you, and, and do you recall her asking, did you know your sister was in therapy for three years? Your Honor, that seems back not in her Sustain. But I'm asking, did she ask you? 
if she was in therapy for three years? Yes. I don't recall. Did she ask you if you knew whether your sister was in therapy at all? She may have. Do you, you don't remember? We, there's a jet lag. We talked about many things. I don't remember. Okay. Do you remember whether or not Mrs. Bozanich asked you if you knew that your sister was taking high dosages of tranquilizers for two and a half years? I, am I asking if I knew that or if she asked me if I knew that? Did she ask you that? You know, that's irrelevant, what I asked. Sister. Okay. Did you know it? I don't think I did. And what about attempts at suicide? Did your sister <coughs> ever told you ever tell you that she had attempted suicide? No. Did your sister tell you that she thought about suicide? No. Did your sister tell you that she had spent a significant period of time very depressed? No. Did she tell you she was a person subject to panic attacks? Objection, I assume that's not evidence. Overall. What constitutes a panic attack? Oh, it's a terminology but that she knew, but she described it to a doctor. Did she ever describe it to you that she was a person who had panic attacks? Excuse me, Honor. I assume that's not evidence. Sustained. Rephrase the question. It's argumentative. Just ask the okay. question directly. Did your sister ever use that language with you? Did she ever tell you, I have panic attacks? She may have, but I don't recall. Did she ever tell you there were times when she was paralyzed and could not function? Emotionally paralyzed? Not that I recall. Did she tell you how she had discovered the infidelity problem? No. Did she tell you about going to New York and staking out the woman in question? Sustain. Do you know she told other people that she did that, went to New York and, and searched for the woman in question, took her pictures, talked to her? Yeah, that calls for Thursday Sustain. Well, did she ever tell you anything about going to New York to look for this woman? No. Did she ever tell you that her husband hit her? No. Can I have a moment, Ron? Yes. Now, you said that during 1989, well, I'll strike that. Let me go back to something. You've got, you've got a laugh here when you said you asked your sister why she was th seeing a therapist. Did you, did you do that? Did you ask her why? I don't remember that. I asked her. Okay, she said she was seeing a therapist. You didn't ask her why. The, I can't recall the specifics of the conversation. And she didn't volunteer why? She didn't tell you. I'm seeing a therapist because. Her phrase was what I gave you. Her phrase was everybody in California does? I don't think that's what I said. OK, why don't you tell me what she said about a therapist? It was common in California. Excuse me? It was common to do that in California. She said it's common to do that in California. Something to that effect. OK, and you didn't question her about is it common for people who don't have problems to see a therapist. Did you ask her, is it common for people who don't even have problems to see a therapist? We had conversation about it. I don't remember the specifics of the conversation. Uh, to your knowledge, uh, Mr. Anderson, was she the only person in your family who had gone to see a therapist? Objection, we're all Were you surprised? Objection irrelevant. Overall. 
I don't remember my reaction. And uh, what was the time, uh, the space of time, if you will, between the I'm seeing a therapist conversation and the I have an infidelity problem with Jose conversation? They were in the same general area. And did this come up again? Now you said that this conversation was shortly after they moved to California, correct? Which conversation? But well, the, the two in the same general area, infidelity <coughs> problem and seeing a therapist. This is soon after they moved, correct? The infidelity problem stuck with me more than the therapy did. And I remember the infidelity question coming up shortly after she moved here. The okay. therapy one, I, it, I best recall, was in that same general time. It stuck with you. Did it uh, bother you? A little. Did it bother you that this man was cheating on your sister? Your Honor, at this point, it's irrelevant for him to do. Sister. Right. Is it your testimony that you didn't ask your sister anything about this? What's the infidelity problem? What's been going on? What has he done? Nothing? My sister wanted to tell me she would have told me. I didn't, I didn't prod. Your sister was a very private person, wasn't she, Mr. Anderson? Again, that's a question I can't answer. You can't answer whether your sister was a private person? She told me many things in my life. I, I don't consider it to be private. What constitutes being private? I guess that's my problem. Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. You said she told you she had an infidelity problem. She gave you no details of it, correct? I didn't press for them. She didn't give me any. Okay, and if she had wanted to tell you, she did, but she obviously didn't want to tell you, correct? Objection calls for conclusion on part of the witness. Sister. You said if she had wanted to tell you, she would have told you, right? That's correct. And she didn't tell you, correct? She didn't go into detail. She didn't tell you anything more than that she was having an infidelity problem, isn't that true? Generally true. And you were the closest member of her family to her, is that correct? That's correct. Did she tell you uh, when she was living on the East Coast that her son Eric had learning disabilities? We had many conversations about Eric. Now that, I'm not asking you that. I'm asking whether she told you that he had learning disabilities. I don't recall. And you didn't tell her that your son had learning disabilities either, did you? When I learned, I did. And you learned when your son was 30 years old and he found out for himself. Isn't that true? Objection, Your Honor, relevancy. When your sister talked to you about her infidelity problem, did she discuss it in terms of your family's history of infidelity? Excuse me, Your Honor. Um, beyond the scope, very difficult to. Sister. Now, before you saw um, Eric in Louisville in July of 1989, you have that time in mind? How long before that had you last seen Eric? I don't readily recall. If he were not in Kalamazoo in 88, is it possible that the last time you saw him was the summer of 87? I don't think that's true, but it's possible. Okay. Well, you've talked about trips to California in 87. Is it possible the last time you saw him was on one of those trips to California in 87? Probably in 87, it would have been Kalamazoo. So the last time would have been, because that would be August towards the end of the year? That's correct. Okay. And you don't specifically recall seeing Eric in 1988, correct? Specifically, no. And you don't recall seeing him in 1989 until Louisville. Isn't that true? That's, as best I recall, that's true. Now, at Louisville, did you get there at the very beginning of the tournament? I believe so. Excuse me? As I recall, I did. And how many matches did you see Eric play? It would be a guess. I think three, maybe four. Three or four in one or two days? He played two in one day, as I recall, one in another, as I remember it. Is that a hard schedule? For me, yes. I mean, he was the one playing. Was it hard for him? 
I don't know. Sustain. So you might have seen him in as many as three matches. That's correct. And did, did he, and he lost the first one, you said. As I remember it. Were you there when he lost? Yes. And he lost to a very high-ranked player, is that what you said? I believe that conversation was Kalamazoo. So who did he lose to? Oh, that, I'm sorry, that was, um, that was Louisville. Okay, so he loses the first round. I mean, he yeah. loses the very first match, right? That's what I understand. Uh, well, did you see it? Yeah. Excuse me? Yes. All right. And he lost playing somebody very good? As I remember it. And uh, I take it your sister was very elated and hugged him and kissed him and told him he did a great job losing. Is that right? I don't recall that. Winning was rather important to your sister and brother-in-law when it came to the boys in their tennis, wasn't it, Mr. Anderson? Yes. It calls for a conclusion. Overall, the answer will stand. And they would be quite excited at these big national tournaments when their boys won, wouldn't they? Yes. But isn't it true that what preceded Eric telling his father to shut up is that his father told him, you played like an ass? Isn't that what happened? Those words? Those words, that. or at least that sentiment. I don't, I don't, uh, you don't I don't recall know? those words. Do you, do you recall what words of praise Jose Menendez used when he talked to his son who had lost in front of uh, the world? I don't recall there were any. Oh, nothing. So what was Eric saying shut up to? Silence? Counsel, now you're arguing to the... You said you heard Eric tell his father to shut up, right? Yes. And his father was talking to him before he said that, wasn't he? Yes. And what his father was saying was, you played like an ass, or words to that effect, wasn't it? I don't remember that. Do you remember what words his father was saying to him? He was asking, interrogating him as to why he was, why he did what he did on the court. Okay, so the kid's lost now in front of everybody, and Jose goes over and interrogates him. Is that what he did? Yes. He was angry, wasn't he, Mr. Anderson? Jose Menendez, he was angry that his son hadn't followed his illegal hand signals from the state, from the stands. You had an argumentative. Sustained as to the form of the question. Now, these hand signals that you've testified to, those are illegal. You're not allowed to do that in these tournaments, are you? And that's true, but every parent does it. I see. Well, we've had coaches testify. Counsel, so let's not, not argue with a witness it. and just ask a question. In your opinion, yeah. as a tenants expert, every parent does it. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Objection argument. Sustained. Is it your opinion that every parent does it? I saw it happening frequently when I was in these matches. Okay. Is that your opinion, that every parent does it? Ask and answer. He's given his answer. And uh, would that still be your opinion if I were to tell you that the, that the tennis coaches who testified in this trial said it's illegal and improper and only the over-involved parents do it? You got an objection on humanity. Sustained. Would it change your opinion that every parent does it if I tell you that Professional tennis coaches indicate that every parent doesn't do it. Objection, argumentative. Sustained. Well, Your Honor, I'm asking if it would change his opinion. Counsel, let's go on to something else. Now, you said that Mr. Menendez was making these signals and Eric wouldn't look at him. Is that correct? Objection, mistake. Overall. <sighs> Is that right? Do you recall a question? I recall the question, but again, it's one of those that I can't answer. There were times that he did look at him and times that he didn't look at him. Well, you said after the break he wouldn't look at him at all. Counsel, is that a question? Right. That's the question part. <laughs> all right, why don't you ask it again so we have one question. Okay, let me see if I understand. You testified that in the beginning part of the match, Eric would only occasionally look in his father's direction where his father was making the hand signals, correct? That's correct. And then after the break, Eric wouldn't look at him at all. Is that, what is it, question now? Is that correct? An inflection, is that correct? Did you refine the question? If I'm, you're losing me if you refine the question, I didn't. All right. You said that there was part of this match where Eric, um, 
Was this a question you're telling me what I said? I mean, well, let's make it simpler. Let's just remember the match, okay? So there was part of the match where Jose was giving this, these hand signals, and only occasionally Eric looked in his direction. Is that your recollection? At the beginning of the match? Right. Yes. And then later on in the match, Eric wouldn't look at his father at all. And that's as I recall it. Okay. And I take it that Mr. Menendez appeared to be unhappy with the fact that Eric wasn't looking at him to receive his signals. Is that true? That's true. Now, you said that Eric during this match appeared to be very frustrated with himself as well as with his father. Yes. And you say you were familiar with Eric's style of playing. Is that true? Yes. And were you familiar with the fact that when Eric was angry and upset with himself, he would shout? Yes. And he would shout at himself? Yes. And he was doing some of that during this match as well, wasn't he? Yes. And you said he was playing in a way that was very different than what you had seen before. Is that right? It was different, very different. It was different. Was it strange? Hmm? Was it strange? He was doing strange things? What constitutes a strange thing? I, again, it's a question I don't understand. Well, did you... Um, Did you tell Mrs. Bazanich when she interviewed you on November 21st that when the match began, Eric played differently, doing strange things on the court? He wasn't playing as normal as I observed it. I'm not an expert in tennis. I don't pretend to be an expert in tennis, but he was playing differently than he had played. Was he doing strange things? In that context, I guess, in my vernacular, yes. And did you know why it was that Eric decided to uh, play not his normal game and to do things differently and to do strange things? Discussion for speculation. Overall. In my opinion, he was quite puffed from the backslapping he was getting from his parents and from his peer players. So for his was, performance in Louisville. So he was just so conceited that he was frustrated and angry and shouting. Is that right? Is that how puffed people behave, or is that how disturbed kids behave? Excuse me, I think this is argumentative. Sustained. Rephrase the question. He was disturbed that day, wasn't he, Mr. Anderson? Objection calls for conclusion on part of the witness. Sustained. Do you know what happened in his hotel rooms in Louisville, Mr. Anderson? Were you there? Again, a question I can't answer. I don't know what you're talking about. When Eric played at Louisville, did you stay in the same hotel room with him? Did I stay in the same hotel room? No. Yes. After he lost that first round at Louisville, do you remember anything about what happened that night? I don't recall anything specific. Do you know what was in Eric's mind that summer, what he was hoping for, what he was looking forward to? Do I know what was in his mind? Did you ever have a private conversation with him that summer during either of these two tournaments? I probably had. You don't remember? No. How old was he that summer? I would guess 15, 16, something like that. Actually, he was 18. 18. You don't really know him very well, do you, Mr. Anderson? Objection as to Vegas very well. Overall? Yes, I do. You do. And you knew very well what was going on in your sister's family. Is that what you want to tell us? Excuse me, that's argumentative. Sustained. It was everything just normal and wonderful in your sister's family, Mr. Anderson? Is that what you want to tell us? Excuse me, Your Honor. It's still argumentative. Ask a different question. 
think your sister had a normal family? Your Honor, that's beyond the scope. That's argumentative. Sustained. Now, you said Eric was playing differently and he was playing strange, but he was very frustrated. Is that right? That's correct. With himself, right? That's correct. Angry with himself. That's correct. Now, didn't his father go down to near where he was playing during the course of the match? We were sitting near where he was playing. How far away from him was uh, his father during the match? I guess it would depend on what court he was in. Well, during this one where he's so frustrated and uh, shouting and doing all, all that. Well, there were two courts. There was a front court and a back court, and they switched sides. So it was a matter of at what point. I, 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 you looking for this in feet or in time? or Yeah, feet. Feet? I, I don't recall that from the, where we were sitting to the beginning of the court. I'm going to guess it was about 20 feet. Now, you said that during the match he directed some remarks towards his father. Is that what you're saying? During the match? And during the match, not after, not the yes, shut up. Yes. Okay, would well, you remember what those remarks were? I do not. And do you remember what remarks his father directed towards him during the match? Mm, I don't know that there were any that were directed towards him during the match. Mr. Anderson, by the time this match was over, did it appear to you as if Eric had had a good time playing that match? Station calls for speculation. Sister. Did he seem happy? No. Did he seem upset? Yes. So did your sister go over and say, gee, honey, I'm sorry you didn't play well. Don't be so hard on yourself. To that effect. Oh, she did. No, she didn't, Mr. Anderson. Counsel, again, are you testifying or asking questions? Ask your next question, please. When did you decide to remember that? Excuse me, Honor, that's argumentative. Sustained. Did you ever tell anybody that your sister said these comforting, consoling words to her son? If I was asked. You never asked. Were you asked uh, to describe uh, Eric's words at his father during this match? Objection vague and irrelevant. Overall. Ask the question again, please. Well, let me ask you this. Were you asked to describe this incident in Kalamazoo, where Eric had the temerity to speak back to his father? Excuse me, argument, Your Honor. Sustained as to the form of the question. Were you asked to describe this incident in Kalamazoo? Yes. And who asked you to describe it? Ms. Bozanich. And uh, you're familiar with how your former wife testified about this incident, aren't you? Yes. You watched her testify about it, right? I saw a videotape. And she doesn't seem to have seen your sister consoling Eric, does she? Objection, argumentative. Sustained. So, in fact, wasn't it one of your reasons for deciding to be a witness to talk about this incident in Kalamazoo? Again, you asked uh, if that's a question, I don't understand it. When Mrs. Bozanich asked you to describe uh, this incident in Kalamazoo, did you tell her uh, what Kitty did after the match? I don't remember that she asked me what Kitty did. Well, let me ask you this. Would you say that what you're now telling us Kitty did, being consoling to Eric, was a sign of affectionate behavior? She did that. No, I'm asking you, this particular thing that you're now telling us your sister did in Kalamazoo, would you characterize that as affectionate behavior? Yes. Then why, when you were asked by Mrs. Bozanich if you could give an example of your sister's affectionate behavior, did you only mention Louisville when Eric won? Objection, argumentative. Overall. I focused on the elation in Kalamazoo, in uh, Louisville. 
The fact is, Mr. Anderson and that family, losers were never consoled. Isn't that true? Not true. Now, after this particular match, Eric spent several hours alone in his room, did he not? He had his own room. He spent several hours in it, didn't he? Didn't you see him in there writing in his diary? Yes. Upset and depressed? He was writing in his diary. He wasn't happy with himself. He wasn't happy with himself. Excuse me, I've got a question. Does that mean he was depressed? <coughs> he wasn't happy. I assume he was depressed. Did he join the family for dinner later? That was not usually the tradition. Not when you lost, is that right? In any event. But the question is, did he join the family for dinner later? That question, no. Were you told that he and Jose had had dinner alone? Before yes. Before the rest of you went to dinner? Yes. Now, you said that <clears throat> By the way, Mr. Anderson, are you in the real estate development business? Yes. And did you ever discuss with your nephew, Eric Menendez, or real estate as an investment? I don't mean serious discussion, but just your basic idea that you thought it was a good thing to do. Yes. And did you discuss that with him after your sister died? Yes. Now you've testified that. All right. Miss Tennis shots. No. Never heard anybody using vulgar language. No. Never heard any disputes between anybody. No. Thank you. A redirect. Right, and uh, we'll now uh, proceed with um, testimony before the gold jury. Uh, are you ready to proceed? Okay. And would you state your name again for the record, please? Brian Anderson. I'll remind you that you're still under oath. <laughs> And this is uh, examination uh, before the gold jury. Do the people have any questions? Are you sure that you, this was a matter that we had discussed? Oh, I'm sorry. Just a moment. I thought we were doing this cross-examination. Yeah, we'll Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. questions that were asked of you about an incident where uh, Eric Menendez had left an item on an airplane. Do you recall that? I do. And subsequent, after uh, you witnessed this particular exchange between your sister and Eric Menendez, did you have any conversation with Jose Menendez about the camcorder incident? Uh, not in Illinois and Kalamazoo. And about how many days was it after um, you had witnessed this exchange between Mrs. Menendez and their son, Eric. Was it that you talked to Jose Menendez about the camcorder incident? It would have been two or three days the following weekend when we wound up in Kalamazoo. All right, and could you tell me what you said to Mr. Menendez and what his response was, please? Overall, I asked uh, Jose what uh, happened with the uh, camcorder incident, and he uh, said, well, I've got to have a major conversation with my son, Lyle. Uh, he has to uh, get the message that we're not going to be supporting them the rest of their lives in that general conversation from there. Now, when you, when you uh, said to him, what about the camcorder, did you make any more reference to it, or was that the gist of what you said to Mr. Menendez? That was it. We just related to the camera. And the um, statements from Mr. Menendez that you have indicated he made to you, was that a long conversation or was it a brief conversation? It was relatively brief. We were walking along at the, during the course of the tennis matches. Uh, that's when the exchange took place. 
And do you remember who was playing at the time that you had this conversation with Mr. Menendez? <clears throat> the me? conversation took place. We were walking up to the refreshment area, the two of us were walking along. I have nothing further of this witness, Your Honor. All right, cross examination. Mr. Anderson, you said the exchange with Mrs. Menendez and Eric Menendez occurred in Kalamazoo, is that correct? About the camcorder incident? I said what, sir? Did you say that the conversation between Mrs. Menendez and Eric Menendez about this camcorder occurred in Kalamazoo or in... I did not say that. I said that took place in Illinois, in my home in Illinois. And can you give me your best approximation of the date that that conversation took place between Mrs. Menendez and Eric Menendez? At the time they were in my home. <coughs> date, though? At the time they were in my home. All right. That, that's, can you give me a date, as in August, September? Well, it was in August when they were in the home, just prior to going up to Kalamazoo. Was that early September? I didn't say that it was in September. That was in August. Okay. Early August? That was in August. It would have been the first week in August. The, the matches traditionally are held uh, the first weekend in August, uh, the following week, and then the following weekend, as I best recall. So it would have been prior to that first weekend in August. And your conversation with Mr. Menendez occurred during that same time period? Is there a relative time period? Around the first week in August. It was the following weekend. And who was present when you had that conversation with Mr. Menendez? Jose and myself. And was Lyle Menendez um, in town in Kalamazoo when that conversation took place? He was not. And is it true that after the conversation that you overheard between Mrs. Menendez and Eric Menendez concerning this camcorder, that you in fact saw Mrs. Menendez, Mrs. Menendez using the camcorder? In Kalamazoo? Yes. Yes. Did she appear upset as she was using the camcorder? Upset using the camcorder? Yes. I don't relate that she was. I think you testified during the conversation with Eric she appeared to be upset about the incident, correct? When she learned that the camcorder had been purchased without their permission on their credit card, she was upset about that. I think once she learned to use the camcorder and was using it in the match, that didn't seem to bother her to use the camcorder. I move to strike that as non-responsive. Calling for here, sir. Sustain the answer is stricken. And when you overheard this, uh, and it was shortly after you overheard the conversation with between Mrs. Menendez and Eric Menendez, that you saw Mrs. Menendez using this camcorder, is that correct? Am I confusing the court? I, the camcorder incident was in my home in Illinois. Yes, and, and it was shortly, shortly after that that you saw her using the camcorder. Are you suggesting the same day? No, shortly after, either that day or some other day. A few days later up in Kalamazoo. All right. And the video, you in fact took possession of a video that was produced as a result of her using the camcorder, isn't that true? Well, there were many videos that were produced as a result of her using the camcorder, and I have one of them, yes. And you were asked by the prosecution to bring that uh, videotape with you um, when you came to testify last week, isn't that true? That's correct. You provided a copy of that to the prosecution. To did. the prosecution, did you not? I did. Now, following this conversation with Jose Menendez, you don't know of your own personal knowledge whether, in fact, he ever had any conversation with Lyle Menendez, do you? That's correct. And was that the last time that you saw Jose Menendez was when you had that conversation with him? No. When was the last time you saw him? I picked them up in my airplane from Kalamazoo and flew them to O'Hare Field. And uh, we shook hands, hugged, and uh, said goodbye at that time at O'Hare, on O'Hare Field. Uh, it would have been the date that I flew them back, which I think is the 9th of um, August. 
And is it true that in early August you found out about the deaths of, of your sister and Mr. Menendez, correct? When was that? In um, late August, excuse me. Yes. Uh, it would have been uh, the Monday following uh, the murder. And do you recall that in September, and specifically on September 14th, 1989, that Detective Zoller uh, came to your business in Chicago or in the Chicago area and interviewed you? I remember him coming to Chicago and interviewing me. I couldn't specify the date. And that would have been approximately uh, a month after this conversation that you overheard or that you had with Mr. Menendez, correct? If your timing is correct, then, then it would be a month later. And, and do you recall during um, that interview with Detective Zoli, he asked you whether your sister had spoken of any problems within the family? He may have. Do you recall you stating to Detective Zoller on September 14, 1989, that your sister never spoke of any problems which were of any concern to her or her family, and that nothing appeared to be out of the ordinary? If that's what I said. Is that what you said? I don't have the notes. That was a long time ago. And so you don't have any recollection of what you said in September um, in your conversation with Detective Zola? I remember the conversation. I remember the incident taking place at my office in Chicago Ridge, Illinois. And do you remember during that conversation with Detective Zola that you did tell him about an incident with Lyle that neither Jose nor Kitty approved of? I may have. And do you remember telling Detective Zoller about um, Kitty and Jose disapproving of Lyle dating an older woman? I may have. And do you recall that that's the only incident you talked about in your interview with Detective Zoller? Again, uh, that's a while ago, and I don't have total recall of what that conversation was. I was very emotional. Uh, it was only a short time after my sister and brother-in-law had been murdered. And I, it's, it's a very f difficult. Well, you weren't so emotional that you couldn't talk about Mr. Menendez's business affairs with Detective Zoller, were you? Director Sustain, the phrase of question. Did you feel that you were so emotional <coughs> that you could not talk about Mr. Menendez's business affairs with Detective Zoller? I communicated with Mr. Zoller on whatever subject you wanted to talk about. So you weren't so emotional that you couldn't discuss Jose Menendez's business affairs, correct? Is, if that's a question, I'm, I'm having a difficult time answering it. Uh, whatever the conversation was, uh, I, was I so emotional that I couldn't speak? <coughs> I you, was able to speak. I was able to communicate with people, yes. And you were able to impart uh, information to him about your sister and, and Jose Menendez, correct? I'm sure I did the best I could at the time. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Anderson, the video that you brought to California with you when you came to testify last week, does that show a view from your plane as you flew um, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez and Eric Menendez from Kalamazoo to Chicago? Are you objecting best evidence for him? The video uh, begins with my picking them up in Kalamazoo. It shows uh, uh, Kitty, uh, Jose, and Eric uh, prior to boarding the airplane. The video also shows the flight uh, over Lake Michigan into O'Hare, the landing at O'Hare, and uh, the uh, again, the activity around the plane after landing at O'Hare. And that's it, right? That's it. Thank you. Nothing further. Anything else? No. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm excused. With um, testimony before both juries, um, this is uh, cross-examination of uh, the witness uh, who was on the stand last Wednesday um, when both juries uh, were here. Um, and uh, would you step forward, please? Actually, uh, last Tuesday, as I recall. Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, Tuesday because Wednesday uh, we had other witnesses and uh, 
uh, illness uh, with one of the jurors. So, yeah. It was Tuesday. It's hard to keep track. I know the All right. feeling. All right, we're now ready to proceed, and would you state your name again for the record? Brian Anderson. All right, I'll remind you that you're still under oath. Yes, sir. Okay, and this was uh, cross-examination by Ms. Abramson. Uh, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Oops. <clears throat> Mr. Anderson, I want to show you a photograph that was previously marked in this trial as Exhibit uh, 202. Do you, first of all, recognize the person in the photograph? <clears throat> uh, the photograph has been expanded and blurred, but it looks like it's Lyle. Okay, and it appears to be Lyle riding a bicycle, correct? That's correct. Do you recognize where he is? In the neighborhood? Yes. Um, it looks like any suburban area under construction. Do you, uh, can you determine from the photograph and from your knowledge of your sister's family how old Lyle is at the time of the taking of that photograph? Well, I would have to guess his age. I don't... You can't tell? No, I'm, I'm not an expert on ages. Now, you indicate that when your <clears throat> sister and her family lived in Illinois, in Hinsdale, you lived about five miles away. I lived in the town of Oklahoma, that's roughly five miles away. And does that photograph appear to be the neighborhood in Hinsdale where the family lived, or can you not tell? I couldn't uh, be sure of that. Now, I want to fast forward, if we can, to California, to some of the conversations that you had with your sister. I think I w asked you a number of questions about whether she told you specific things. Uh, let me ask you this. Did she ever tell you that she overdosed on pills and was taken to the hospital and had her stomach pumped? Uh, I don't remember her telling me that. You think you would remember if she told you that? I would imagine so. Did she ever tell you the name of the woman that Jose was unfaithful towards her with, the infidelity lady? No. Did you ever hear her make any even oblique references to the fact that he was seeing a woman who had the same last name as your mother's maiden name, Maloney? If she did, I don't relate to it. We had many conversations with Kitty, and it's difficult to recall them all. They run together. Was your mother's maiden name Maloney? That's correct. Did you um, ever learn after your sister died that Jose's mistress was named Louise Maloney? No, this is irrelevant. Sister. Now, did you ever have a conversation with your brother-in-law, Jose Menendez, after your sister told you about the infidelity problem, where the issue of his infidelity was discussed? No, ma'am. Now, you testified here on Tuesday that I think what you said was Eric talked back to his, you were asked, did Eric ever talk back to his parents? And you said frequently when they were together. Do you remember that statement? Uh, I don't clearly remember that statement, but I know that it happened. <clears throat> okay, did it happen frequently or did it just happen? Well, that's a difficult question to answer. What is the difference between happening frequently and just happening? Well, sir, you used the word frequently, so I'm trying to understand what you meant by it. More than once. Okay. Tell me about the first incident where you noticed Eric talking back to both of his parents. Well, it went on from 
throughout his life. I couldn't. Uh, Give me an incident. I couldn't. There's so many. Uh, it would be difficult to. Uh, it was a way of life. I didn't. I can't, I can't relate to one particular incident. Well, why don't we try? Just give me one. It, since it happens so often, you must have a storehouse of memories about it, do you not? Objection, Rephrase the question. Do you have many memories of Eric talking back to his parents? Um, I can relate many times to that being the relationship. Good. Then would you tell all these jurors of a specific incident when you observed Eric talking back to his parents and what he said? I would uh, not recall uh, clearly what was said. Uh, it would, uh, my recollection is it would happen on almost any visit. Any of your visits? As opposed to? Well, can you explain, Mr. Anderson, why not another single witness who was called to testify in this case ever saw what you say you saw all the time? Objection, argumentative. Could you just give me one example? Of Eric talking back to his mother? To, well, I think what you testify to is uh, that he talked back to his parents, both of them. Now, is that wrong? Was it just to his mother? Oh, well, it was, uh, he did pretty much what he wanted to do. It's, uh, he... Yeah, so we've heard. But why don't you just give me one incident of where Eric talked back to his parents? Just one. Besides the shut up in Kalamazoo that you clearly recall, okay? It would be uh, in any particular tennis match, perhaps. Uh, it would are be are you guessing? Pardon me? You use the word in any particular tennis match, perhaps. Are you guessing? I'm, it's, uh, I can't relate to any particular incident at this time. Can you relate to anybody else now living besides yourself? and Eric, who was also there at any time when Eric talked back to his parents. One witness, Mr. <coughs> Anderson. Can you give us one? As I said here, I can't relate to an immediate conversation which would recall any particular person being there. Okay. Now, do you think that perhaps there was something that you were doing with Eric that encouraged him to talk back to his parents only when you were there? Overall. That means I'm to answer the question. Yes. Uh, something that I induced him to do? Yes. Uh, I don't think so. Now, are you aware of the fact that numerous other family members have testified in this case? No, I've heard that being argumentative and I haven't heard the question. That's the question. Are you aware of the fact that numerous other family members testified in this case? Yes. Are you aware of the fact that numerous teachers testified in this case? No. Are you aware of the fact that numerous coaches testified in this case? Um, Objection irrelevant. Overall, you can answer that question. I'm what, uh, I only know of one coach that testified. Okay, so you only know of one. Are you aware of the fact that uh, friends of Kitty and Jose testified in this case? Uh, particular friends? Any friends. Um, I'm not. You are aware, however, that your former wife, Pat Anderson, testified in this case. Yes. And that your sister, Joan, testified in this case. Yes. And in fact, you viewed a videotape of their testimony. Uh, that's correct. And you are therefore aware that you testified <coughs> quite differently than Pat Anderson did about the incident in Kalamazoo. Objection, argumentative. Sustained. Now, are you aware that no one besides yourself has said that Eric talked back to his parents. Objection, argumentative. Sustained as to the former question. Are you aware of any other testimony in this case besides yours and what Patty Anderson said about Eric saying shut up to Jose after Jose was haranguing him uh, to the effect that Eric talked back to either of his parents? Objection, lack of foundation, argumentative. Sustained. Now, you said that you cannot give us any incident whatsoever in order to illustrate what you're talking about. Is that correct, Mr. Anderson? At this time, without uh, giving it some thought, no. Well, you have had at least a week and a half to give it some thought, have you not, which, since you first made this statement to Mrs. Bazanich a week ago Sunday? Rephrase the question. Didn't you first make this statement to Mrs. Bozanich a week ago Sunday? If that's when I made the statement. And that's uh, 10 days. You've had some time to think about it, have you not? 
I've had 10 days, yes. And in fact, uh, when Mrs. Bozanich was examining you, I might have a moment. Uh, at page 22579 of volume uh, 130. Uh, do you recall that even when Mrs. Bozanich examined you last Tuesday, a week ago, she asked you if you have a specific incident, well, strike that. She asked you first, did you ever see Eric talk back to his parents during the course of his life? And you said yes. And then she asked, do you have a specific incident in mind that you can recall or is this a general impression that you have? Or can you tell us what that is? And your answer was frequently, it was when they were together. You, you remember she asked you if you had a specific incident even a week ago, correct? Mm -hmm. So you've had at least a week to think about it, right? And you haven't been able to come up with an incident. Is that correct, Mr. Anderson? On the assumption, that's all I've been thinking about. That's correct. All right. Now, you also testified that you heard Eric use mild profanity towards his mother. Is that right? That's correct. And the words that you gave us in court were God damn and bullshit. That's correct. correct. Yes. Would you give me an incident that you recall where Eric, well, first of all, why don't we why don't I ask you this. In what sense would he tell his mother, God damn you, or your bullshit? I mean. The question was not did he use it in her presence, but did he use it at her? Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. So can you give me an incident where Eric used these words at his mother? A spe specific incident? Yes, please. Which goes back to the question of whether I can remember him talking back to his mother. I cannot... Uh, oh, is this the same thing? Is talking back the use of these words, or is talking back separate than the use of these words? Well, I would... Uh, that's a matter of your questioning. I cannot recall one particular incident at this particular time. Okay, can you recall any incident where he was rude to his mother or talked back to his mother? As I sit here and think with your questioning, the answer is yes. Okay. Tell me about it on a fishing trip uh, that uh, Eric and uh, Kitty have run with me in August of 1986. 1986? 1986. Okay. And uh, what happened? We were camped out on an island in, uh, uh, on a, uh, not on an island, but on a peninsula of a lake uh, overnight uh, camping, and I was going to go fishing in the morning, and Kitty preferred that I, that uh, she was not going to go with me. She wanted Eric to go with her, and uh, he was uh, quite upset about it, but he complied with his mother's wishes. So his being upset with her was an act of rebellion, in your opinion? No, well, he, was, he was vociferous about it. But he did it? Mm hmm And now you're sure this was August of 86? As I best recall. Okay. What did he say to her? Do you remember? Not exactly. Now, can you give us a specific incident of Lyle using, um, we'll strike that. I want to go back to the goddamn and the bullshit, pardon me. Um, you're saying he used those words. Are, are you saying you specifically remember, with no memory of an incident, Eric saying those words to his mother? It was... From my experience, it was part of his, his conversation when he was frustrated or upset. So when he mother. was frustrated or upset, he'd say, God damn it, or that's bullshit? Things like that? Things of that nature. Okay. So he wasn't cursing at his mother. He was just using these words when he was upset. Is that what you're saying? That, uh, I hear him using that vernacular toward his mother. Toward his mother. That's correct. All right. Now. You're remembering these specific words, but you cannot remember an incident in which they were used. Is that your testimony? 
at this particular time, I cannot remember a specific incident. What about Lyle? You said that Lyle used this kind of language with both parents. Do you have a specific incident? I can't focus on one at this time. Okay. Now, I want to talk to you about this trip to Quito. Um, it's true, is it not, Mr. Anderson, that you told Mrs. Bozanich the trip was supposed to be occurring in the fall, but when you testified, you said the plan was for winter. You changed that, is that right? Well, I changed it. The trip was planned, uh, it was a general plan for the fall, winter 89, 90. Okay. Did you know what other trips your sister had planned for the fall of 1989? Uh, I may have. I can't think of any now. Do you know what was happening with respect to Lyle and a uh, condominium that his parents were purchasing for him in Princeton that fall? I was vaguely aware of that. Excuse me? I was vaguely aware of that. Were you aware of your sister's plans to go to Princeton that fall to help Lyle furnish and buy furniture for him and do those things to set him up in the condominium? That conversation may have come up. Well, I'm not asking you to guess. I'm asking you if you remember. It may have come up, but it also may not have come up. No. Okay. So I really need what you remember and not, and not what you might have heard. Okay. I've had many conversations with my sister, sister as I've said before. and I. Uh, so you don't recall this one, is that right? Not for that particular one. And do you recall her telling you anything about needing to be in Los Angeles in the fall so that she could set Eric up in his dormitory at UCLA? Well, there was conversation about uh, him going to UCLA. Mm -hmm. But the specific thing I've asked is her plans for her involvement in setting his dorm up in the fall. She may have, but I don't recall the particular don't conversation. Recall. Okay. And did you know that there were plans for her and Jose to go to Hawaii with Terry and Carlos in October? I don't recall that. Now, have you um, ever discussed this keto trip with your cousin June? Yes. When was that? Uh, after the murders. And are you relying on June's information in saying that there was a plan? Oh, no. And June lives in Northern California? That's correct. When did you last speak to her? <coughs> Oh, some months ago. Did you talk to her before your decision to testify? I spoke with her earlier this year. I think it was uh, probably around, I just don't remember. It was earlier in the year. And did the topic of this proposed keto trip come up in that discussion earlier not. this year? No. Did you go on a vacation with Eric after his parents were killed? Um, the skiing vacation. That qualifies as a vacation? Mm -hmm. Did you? Yes. Where did you go? To Aspen, Colorado. And who else was there? Mark Heffernan and Lyle. I, I seem to be jumping around a bit, but I, I just see if you can follow. Remember we talked about you're going out to, that, to the new house in Calabasas and looking through boxes and, and taking things of sentimental value. Do you recall yes. that? Okay. Do you recall whether you saw in any of the boxes that you looked through either live or dead mice? I do not recall that. Do you recall mouse droppings? I do not recall that. Now, do you recall in April of 1992 when Ms. Lansing and I sat with you in your office at your development in Illinois, do you recall telling us that you only saw from Eric conventional adolescent behavior towards his mother, 
but and also love and respect. Yes. I, I don't know that I recall telling you that, but it's something I would have said. It's something you would have said. Because mm -hmm. it was true. Right? Your answer? Yes. I would have said. Um I wanted to clear up one thing, Mr. Anderson, about the match in Kalamazoo. Um, I didn't follow up. You said that because the players switch courts during a match, that there was th that you weren't always the same distance away from Eric while he was playing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you said that at the beginning of the match, you were approximately 20 feet away. I don't know that I related it to the beginning of the match. Okay. What was the closest that you were to him? during that match? Well, if I went up to the uh, fencing, it could have been as little as probably 10 or 15 feet away, I would imagine. I'm a guesstimate on depth. OK. And did you see Jose Menendez go up to the fencing during the match? I think that he did. And in fact, wasn't it from that position that he was doing his signaling so that he'd be closer so that Eric would have a greater opportunity to see the signals? Um, not necessarily. He would do it from there, and he would also do it from the stands, the, okay. the seating area that we're at. Did you hear him, meaning Jose Menendez, say anything to Eric, whether you remember the words now or not, uh, in addition to giving signals? During the match? Yeah. Uh, not that I recall. And you've already testified, I believe, that <coughs> you don't recall anything that Eric might have said to his father during the match. Is that correct? The specific words? Yeah. No. So is that correct? You don't remember any specific words Eric said during the match? I remember his frustration and his, uh, his boisterous, boister, boisterous outbreaks. Okay. And I think you've already tested it. He was shouting at himself. He was shouting at the other player. He was just shouting. If, if anyone who, yeah, that's right. And I think you've also testified that after the match, you and I take it your wife, Pat, and your sister, and Jose, were together approaching Eric where he was packing up his bag. Is that right? I'm not sure that uh, uh, Pat was part of that. Uh, she may or may not have been, uh, but... Uh, well, you're aware she testified that she was there. Sister. Does it refresh your recollection if I tell you that Pat testified that, yes, indeed, she was there after the match? Well, she was at the match, yeah. She said, she, would it refresh your recollection that she testified she was there after the match and wanted to go up and console Eric and your sister <laughs> stopped her? Objection, Your Overall. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you're asking me to clarify what my wife testified to? No, no I'm asking. She asked if that would refresh your recollection. What does it refresh your yeah. recollection as to whether or not Pat was with you afterwards when, uh, when you were all approaching Eric? Well, whether she was there, whether she was one of the people approaching Eric, I guess is the difficulty. She was, she was there. Whether she was one of the group going up to approach Eric, I don't recall that. Well, who else was, that was part of your group besides yourself, your sister, Jose, and You're asking, wife? Leslie, whether we went up to approach okay, Eric. let's refer to people by their proper names. I'm sorry. I'm we sorry. know each other, but we have to be formal, Mr. Anderson. My apologies. That's quite all right. Um, no, what I'm saying is who else was in your group? Wasn't it just the two couples, your, yourself and your wife, and Jose and Kitty? Weren't you the only ones who were together that's, at the match? That's correct. Okay. Now, I believe uh, you, you testified you don't have any recollection of what it was that Jose may have been saying to Eric before Eric said, shut up. Is that right? He was uh, generally questioned. It would be general. The answer is no, I don't have specific words that he was saying. But I think you said that he was generally telling him, you know, what he did wrong. Uh, I think he was more questioning rather than telling him. Questioning why he did wrong, that sort of thing? He was questioning him. And how long did this questioning go on before Eric said, shut up? Not very long. And then I think you testified, Jose said something, and then you all walked off. Is that right? Jose walked off. Uh, he made a comment about not being able to communicate with him, and then walked ahead of the group. OK. And did the rest of the group walk also? 
the rest of the group, uh, as I recall it, uh, Eric and uh, Kitty and uh, I believe my wife Pat at that time and myself walked to pretty much as a group. And you didn't see any other words exchanged between Eric and uh, his father, is that correct? Uh, after that time? Yes. Uh, no, there was uh, no exchange uh, that I recall. Now, would you characterize what you saw, Jose questioning Eric, Eric saying shut up, Jose saying something about communication, would you characterize that as an argument? Well, I characterize it as... Uh, you can answer that yes or no. If yes you would. or no. Okay, that is an argument. Was that an argument? Uh, borderline, I guess, could be. Well, did you describe it as? Um, a second. I can have a second. you tell um, <coughs> Mrs. Bozanich on the telephone about a month before you came out here to testify that uh, Eric Menendez had talked back to his father and gotten into quite an argument with him. Did you use that phrase? During the match or after the match? No, no, what I'm asking, Mr. Anderson, is did you characterize this episode to Mrs. Bozanich by using the words quite an argument? The arguing was going on during the match. So you're saying during the match he, they were arguing? Jose was trying to get his attention and, and uh, Eric was, and the answer is yes, I guess, to the question. Okay, well, an argument is two-sided, is it not, Mr. Anderson? Overall. I would say so. Yeah, so what was Jose arguing to Eric? He was discussing his performance on the match. During the match? Yes. Now that's sort of distracting for a tennis player, isn't it? Sustained. That's not even permitted to talk to a player while they're playing, is it, Mr. Anderson? There were breaks during the uh, play. Now isn't it a fact that during the breaks in play, because Eric was behaving so strangely, his father was harassing him and criticizing him. And on his case, isn't that what was happening? Wasn't my opinion. Mm -hmm. And the kid couldn't handle it. He lost patience with this Objection. and finally said something. Objection. Isn't that what happened? Pause for speculation, right? Just to answer the form of the question. Didn't you, in fact, describe to Mrs. Bozanich, Eric, losing patience? <laughs> Eric lost patience with his father. Even at the break, Eric wouldn't look at Jose. Do you recall saying that to Mrs. Bozanich? That's what happened. Now, using the word patience implies that there was something that he endured before he lost patience, does it not? Objection, argument, and call for Overall. Would you ask the question again? Yes, by using the word patience, that implies that there was something that Eric endured before his outbreak that he ultimately lost patience with, does it not? He was enduring the loss of a match. There was a lot he was enduring. Yes, and he was enduring his father's constant criticism and illegal signals, was he not? Overall. He was uh, enduring his father's communication, yes. And what was your sister doing while Jose was illegally communicating with his son during the match? Was she relaxed and happy, or did she seem pretty tense? Well, I think she was tense. Now, you had been to matches before with your sister, and she was pretty tense during the boys' tennis, wasn't she? She would uh, feel the energy of her boys playing. And if they won, she would be happy, right? Oh, I'm sure, yes. And if they didn't win, she wouldn't be happy? She would be consoling. She would be consoling, yes. Now, you realize many people have testified here who saw 
Mrs. Menendez at matches, and you're the only person who says she was consoling. Do you know that? Objection argumentative, Your Honor. Sustained. Is it your job here, do you think, <coughs> Mr. Anderson, to try to paint a totally different picture of your sister than everyone else who has testified? Do you see right. that is your mission? Mr. Uh, excuse me, that is argumentative. Sustained. Now, you testified last Tuesday, which was the 23rd of November that you made your decision to testify in this case one week to 10 days before last Tuesday. Do you recall that? I don't recall telling you that I made a particular, that at some particular point I made a decision. Well, let's go to the transcript. trying to find this reference, unfortunately, I didn't. Apologize, Ron. I know it's here. This is page two two six two two six two nine. Okay. Um, you were testifying last Tuesday, Mr. Anderson, about your interviews with Mrs. Bozanich. And I asked you in line 19, and then you talked to her again and indicated to her, oh, about a week to 10 days ago, that you were now willing to be a witness in this case, correct? Your answer, she asked me if I would be a witness, and the answer was yes. Question, well, she had been asking you all along if you would, but it was only about a week or 10 days ago that you agreed. Is that correct? And you said that's true. Do you recall that testimony from Tuesday? That sounds now, correct. Now, what Mr. Anderson happened in the probate court 10 days before last Tuesday, on November 3rd, 1993? Uh, if you have a specific incident, I can answer it, but I can't answer that question. What happened in the pre? Well, let me ask you this: Are you aware that on November third, nineteen? May we approach, please? Yes. About the juries. Uh... Yes, in seeking some parameters, Your Honor, um, our offer of proof would be that we would ask the witness the following questions. The first question we'd ask is whether in 1990 and 1991. He participated in a reaching agreement that the estates of both Jose Menendez and Mary Louise Menendez could pay the costs of the legal defense for Eric and Lyle Menendez. The second question would be um, that in April of 1992, he knew and was informed by myself and Ms. Lansing that Eric and Lyle Menendez had indeed killed their parents, and we met with him specifically to tell him why. And at that point, he did not take any action, um, either volunteering to be a witness nor uh, attempting to do anything in the probate court. The next question would be, uh, basically, isn't it true that he recently filed papers in the probate court seeking, and the ultimate ruling they're seeking, Your Honor, is that if, if there is any money left in the estates um, of Jose and Mary Louise Menendez, it should all go to the Anderson side of the family. They have made that argument 
that none should be, uh, if there is should go to the Menendez side. And the fourth question would be um, whether he knows that on November 3rd, the probate judge said he would not hear uh, Mr. Anderson's request to make this determination unless and until the boys are convicted. And what was communicated by the probate judge was that um, no members of the Anderson side of the family stand to inherit unless the boys are convicted. And then it was after that that he decided to become a witness. That would be the line of questions. And um, our, our main concern is that the specific amount, because I don't, I don't know if he even remembers it. Did the uh, probate judge say that uh, members of the Menendez family would inherit if the defense were convicted? No. Well, he didn't say, he didn't rule either way on the, the merits of it. what he found. Well, I'm just asking because you, you limited it to a statement relating to the Anderson side of the family. No, what it is is what he understood that meant was that his petition, his opposition that he filed wouldn't even be heard, which was seeking to have the Menendez's cut out and seeking to have funds uh, restored to the estates would not even be heard unless the boys are convicted. If they're not convicted, then there's no way uh, anybody is going to inherit except the boys. Okay, well, you phrase it differently. Well, I can phrase it that way if that's better. And our, our main concern is, first of all, not to get into a whole lengthy um, analysis of whether his position seeking recoupment which he is seeking is right or just, but just the indication that he took this position in the probate court recently, seeking to assert uh, the Anderson side interest, and only when that, in fact, he took that position, I believe, in September, and only when the hearing was continued did he agree, to, and, and that judge, made, judge Scheiner made it clear what the condition precedent was, uh, did he decide to testify, and I don't think under, that, that the specific amounts of anything, either the expenses or the fees that he's seeking to stop or the fees that were paid to lawyers are relevant. Anything else? Now that, that's what we'd like to prove and, and we'd like to know what limits, if any, there would be placed on the prosecution. Well, I have no idea what the prosecution intends to do, so I'd have to hear them first. Right. What is your position? I have to see how the questions are answered before I, I, I certainly intend to ask him some questions such as, why did you do what you did? Um, I would also object to the hearsay statements of counsel as to why the crime occurred re relating to question two. Oh, I wasn't going to ask him to relay what we told him, but only that we did tell him what they did it and what the defense was, if that's a more neutral way to put it. All right. Um, and as far as telling the court what, what my cross examination is going to be, I don't know. Um, this is a matter the probate, we have access to some of the probate files, much of it's been sealed. And, um, so I'm just going to have to operate like doing normal process or normal redirect examination. Or well, we, we are trying to get some kind of ruling here, Joanne. I think the, the people are being coy. I mean, I think she can, she can tell us now whether she feels and has an argument to support the position that the specific numbers are relevant. Which numbers are you referring to? Uh, well, mainly the legal fee numbers, but subsidiary to that, because it would be extremely consumptive, unduly consumptive of time, we get into the numbers of what the executors are requesting for their extraordinary fees, what their lawyers are requesting, what their accountants are requesting, which are all matters that he is opposing. Um, what the costs were, what, what the specific expenditures at totaling a million four were on the Calabasas house that he is seeking to have the Baralt personally repay to the estate. I think all of that gets unduly complicated. What is the people's response to those Your Honor, numbers? The fact that he filed a petition in court seeking to have the Andersons, the, the question's going to be couched in seeking to have the Andersons so I can hear it should be convicted, I think needs explanation. And I'm going to ask him to explain why it was he filed this petition. And I think he's entitled to answer the question. I mean, you can't just ask a question a certain way and then tell the prosecution on the other side that they can't try to explain, especially when this question may not be accurate, that that's exactly what he did. 
So I think he should be allowed to explain what he what his understanding was of what he was doing and why he did it. Well, in terms I terms of filing this petition, it is something that occurred rather recently. Well, when the offer by the defense is that this shows bias, then uh, the appropriate question of the witness is, why did you do these things? And without knowing his answers, uh, it's hard to uh, put limits on it. Uh, but you certainly do expose uh, the witness to uh, attack on his credibility, and he's entitled to answer why he did certain things to refute the inference that you're trying to draw. Well, I'd like and people it, to tell us what he's going to say. I'm sure they have the answer. No, I, I, I don't know what he's going to say. I specifically um, didn't ask him about this because well, I don't think this is something that has to be uh, explored uh, in advance so you know what uh, the answers are going to be before you ask the questions. This is just part of a trial. And well, uh, you what we're you ask questions and you take your best shot as to what the answer is going to be and well, whether you can deal are, with it or not. I understand that ordinarily, Your Honor, but here we are, we are specifically seeking some limitation to this because this thing could, I mean, this is what we filed. And um, we could go through it all, and then we could go through the entire accounting. I mean, it could open the door to all of this stuff. We're That's trying, true. We're it trying could. to do this in a relatively limiting way, um, and, and we're trying to get the court to exercise its discretion under 352. Now, the court can't do that if the prosecution you know, won't reveal what they think the answer is going to be. Our, our concern is that numbers not be discussed, because that will get us into a long and lengthy litigation about these numbers. Um, if he wants to say he did it because he loves his sister and he hates the testimony, fine. But well, what you're asking me really to do is listen to his answer and then say, well, part of that's uh, sufficient and that uh, rehabilitates him and the rest of it is extraneous and uh, doesn't have to come in uh, because uh, it really doesn't uh, rehabilitate. But uh, I really can't do that. Uh, I, in essence, would be weighing the evidence and not uh, ruling on its admissibility. So I, well, I can't evaluate it uh, in that fashion. You're asking for the court to accept uh, your uh, questions and then uh, put limits on the answers, uh, which I can't do. Well, but what we're asking for is a ruling on relevancy that the amount of the legal fees is not relevant. Your Honor, at this particular point, I, it's not my intention to find get the witness to say exactly <clears throat> how much he thinks the defense attorneys are being paid. But if he, if part of his explanation for why he filed this petition is he thinks they're being paid too much or that the money's been squandered or something like that, then it might become rele relevant. Well, all, all I can tell you is that if he made that that answer, since there is no claim in the, his petition for that, that will just open the door on the entire petition and what he is asking for, and, and that's going to involve very extensive litigation, none of which has anything to do with the amount of the legal fees, which he never contested and doesn't contest. It, it, it's not in the meeting. Well, uh, as I said, I, I can't get into the specifics until I hear what his explanation is and uh, how he answers these other questions that you've asked. Um, you expect certain answers that are favorable to the defense, and his answers might be different. Uh, it was, I, as I mentioned at the sidebar, this whole area is just opening the, the area up for uh, litigation that uh, the defense has sought throughout the trial to uh, avoid. And if you want to bring it out now at this late stage, then uh, we have to uh, hear what the witness says before we can uh, rule on the, or I can rule on the specifics of his uh, answers. I see that. What we'd like to do, which I, I sense the court will not allow us to do, is to have a testimonial for or to and see what the witnesses answer. Would I don't see this. I you won't let us do that. I, I just don't see this as a type of uh, issue that requires such a hearing. This is a typical cross-examination where you ask the questions and you get answers. All right, let's do it. All right, Judge. You have often said to us, all you can do is roll the dice. Dice roll. Okay. All right, are we ready then with the uh, witness? 
Yes. All right, let's get the jurors in, please. Judge Lewis, one other uh, brief issue. Uh, this concerns the law of an industry. The court ruled huh? this the conversation uh, between this witness and Jose Menendez. And at the time, the court ruled that it missed the court said it would give a cautionary instruction about the limited purpose for which that was offered. I have the transcript mark at the appropriate time. I'd like the court to do that. That relates to uh, this witness and his testimony? Yes. Okay. But since the court has to uh, instruct on the eyes of right. the testimony, we could perhaps do that. Okay. All if you could find that for me, I'd appreciate it. I have it here. I'll give it to the court at the break. All right. All right. Let's get the jurors in, please. Yes. All right. All the jurors are back. You may continue your cross examination. Okay. I just want to change the subject briefly here, Mr. Anderson. I want to go back to. Uh, when you were at your home in Illinois in early August of 1989 and uh, Eric and your sister were there, uh, this is with reference to the camcorder, okay? Now, you recall uh, your sister and Eric going to the airport to pick it up, is that right? Remember them leaving the house to go up there, that's correct. And you remember them coming back with it? Uh, I'm not sure if I was there when they arrived back. Did you, at some point later that day, see the camcorder? As I recall, I did. I believe you previously testified it was about a foot long and there was a carrying case with it. Is that your recollection? That's correct. Now, did you hear your sister talking about, either to you or to Eric or to anybody else in your presence, about sending the camcorder back for work to wherever it came from? Uh, don't remember that conversation. And in fact, did it turn out that your sister wound up using the camcorder um, at Kalamazoo? That's correct. And did she appear to know how to use it already, or did someone instruct her on its use? She was using it. You didn't see anyone instructing her on how to use it? Well, I don't recall. Was she sort of handy with gadgets that way, that she could figure things out? She was mechanically inclined. And I believe you testified that you went to Kalamazoo, you flew, and Kitty and Eric drove, and you all met up again at the airport in Kalamazoo? I, I'm not, uh, either she drove or I flew her. It's, I don't okay. remember exactly how. So Somewhere, it's we, wound, we wound up there together. Okay, it's possible that you flew Kitty and Eric uh, in your plane. And did she, um, did she use the camcorder on the first day that you were in Kalamazoo with her? She used the camcorder for the tennis matches. I don't remember that there were any tennis matches on the first day. Okay. And do you re how many days did you stay in Kalamazoo on, on that particular trip? If I remember right, it was three days. And did you see her using it? You said you saw her using it for the tennis matches. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, was it just to film Eric's matches or other people's matches as well? I, she was using it. She may have been filming uh, other things going on. And did she keep it with her, or did she give it to Eric at any point? Let me ask you this. Every time you saw it at Kalamazoo, was it in your sister's possession? Oh, she was using it, I think, possibly. Eric used it as well. Okay. Right in front of her, correct? Hmm? Eric used it right in front of her. Oh, right. so. Yes. Um... Oh, I want to go back to something else you testified to on your direct examination. You testified uh, with respect to Louisville. Let me see what you said. Ah. Um, you testified that you, you saw some of his matches at Louisville, but you did not stay to the end, correct? For the whole week? Right. Well, no, to the not, end of I did Eric's not stay play. for the whole week. Excuse me? I did not stay for the whole week. And you testified in counsel, this is at 22558, 
that you learned later that after you left, Eric continued to win. Is that correct? I call down there every day. It, it, but, but you did learn that later, correct? <coughs> that he continued to win. I call down there every day. <coughs> but that's not my question. You have to answer the question. The record has like a hole in it, okay? You learned later from your sister that Eric continued to win. When I called down and talked to my sister, she updated me on his winning. Okay. And did she also tell you, and did, so did, therefore did you also learn later, that when he finally lost at Louisville, it was due to heat exhaustion? That's what I was told. And were you also told that, in fact, he played in that hot weather more than any other player in the tournament? He played more matches than anybody else? I think that's correct. Okay. Now... I want to take you back now, Mr. Anderson, to uh, 1990, uh, after the time that uh, Eric and Lyle were arrested. Um, it's true, is it not, Mr. Anderson, that during 1990 and early 1991, you were actively involved in negotiating uh, the agreements between uh, Eric and Lyle and attorneys That's to correct. represent them. And uh, it's also true, is it not, that uh, you agreed um, and your stepmother, Doris Anderson, agreed, um, and Maria Menendez agreed, that the estates could pay the costs um, of the legal defense for Eric and Lyle in this case. Well, there was an agreement that was uh, concluded, too. And it included those persons I've just named? I'm sorry? It included the persons I've just named? Uh, D Doris? No, I don't know that it included my name, but it included Doris and... Uh, and Maria Menendez. And Maria Menendez. But you were actually... And my father, I think, as well as uh, his estate. Okay. Well, let me just set up a chronology here. Your father died when? He died uh, July uh, 7th, I believe it was, 1990. Okay. And subsequent to that, um, his heir was his then wife, Doris Anderson, correct? That's correct. Okay. And you... Uh, became ultimately the attorney, you have the power of attorney for Doris Anderson. I was given that, that's correct. Yes, and, and you did um, the, the actual negotiating and, and uh, actively participated in this agreement that was worked out through the probate court, correct? I was one of, one of the people, yes. And you attended the probate court hearings uh, from time to time, correct? Yes, some of them, yes. Now, I've referred before to April of 1992. That's when Ms. Lansing and I were in um, the Chicago area and met with you. You recall that? I remember you meeting with me in Chicago. And in April of 1992, um, when we met with you, um, I don't understand that. Right. In April of 1992, <laughs> this is what happens when you have a group action here. When we met with you, uh, you knew at that time, did you not, that Eric and Lyle uh, indeed killed their parents? And in fact, we discussed with you um, what the defense was in the case. Do you recall that? I believe that's about the time I found that out. Okay. And in fact, we had come to Illinois to talk to you and to talk to your brother and to talk to other family members to explain and try to help you understand what had happened. Yeah, that? That Sustained to the form of the question. Okay. Was it your understanding that we, when we were there in April of 92, we met with a number of members of the family, not just yourself? Objection calls for your say. Overall. Did you answer? I did answer, yes. I didn't hear you. Yes. And uh, is it true, Mr. Anderson, that even after we met with you in April, or strike that, isn't it true that after we met with you in April 1992, you did not at that time contact the prosecution in this case and tell them that you wanted to be a witness for them? You didn't do that, did you? That's correct. And at that time, you didn't file any papers in the probate court uh, seeking any benefit for your stepmother or your side of the family. Is that true? I didn't file any papers? Not in 92. Well, I don't recall what years those were. Okay. Well, do you recall, however, that this year, rather recently, uh, on behalf of uh, your father's second wife, your stepmother, Doris Anderson, uh, you did file papers in the probate court? 
The attorney for Doris Anderson did. Okay. Well, you signed the papers as her attorney, in fact. Uh, only until her signature could be gotten. Okay. But you're well aware of the content of those papers. That's correct. And you're the person who deals directly with Alan Wattenmaker, the attorney. That's correct. And in fact, um, you've been dealing with Mr. Wattenmaker <coughs> on probate matters since 1990 or early 91. That's uh, somewhere in there. I don't know. When, I can't remember exactly when. Okay. And isn't it true that this paper that was filed in the probate court, among other things, is seeking a ruling that if there is any money left in the estates, it should all go to Doris Anderson? I don't know that that's true. You do know that there is a serious question about whether there is any money left in the estates, though, don't you? There's, that, that's been brought up. And you do know that there was a status conference. Um, we'll strike that. You, you do know, do you not, that before November 3rd, there was a trial set on your, um, the, the papers that you filed to determine these issues that you were seeking the court to decide. The trial date, I think, was set for November 8th, 9th, and 10th. It could have been. There was a status hearing and then a trial date uh, okay. after that. And the, the status hearing was set for November 3rd. If that's the date. OK. And you're aware, are you not, what the probate judge did at that status hearing on November 3rd? I wasn't there. I know, but you're, you're the attorney, Mr. Wattenmaker, certainly communicated with you that what the judge did, didn't he? Well, I, is there a specific question? That's awfully general. OK. Well, there was no trial on November 8th or 9th. Correct? That's correct. And the, your lawyer told you that the probate judge had taken your pleading off calendar on the grounds that unless Eric and Lyle Menendez are convicted, nobody else is entitled to inherit. Correct? I have not seen the order. But that's your understanding of what it meant, that, if they're that only if they're convicted does your stepmother, Doris Anderson, have any standing in the estate. Does she well, have I, any chance of inheriting? I think that's always been known. And isn't it right after you heard that this pleading was taken off calendar and the statements of the probate judge that you then agreed to be a witness in this case? The chronology? <coughs> if that's how the chronology works out. Excuse me? That is how the chronology worked out, correct? Rephrase the question. No, I, I think I was just repeating. Is that what you said, that that is the chronology? I have to answer out loud, Mr. Anderson. I said if that's the answering to your question, if that's how the chronology works out. Well, I, I need to ask you that. Is that how the chronology works out? The dates? Yes. You have, you have notes. I have no notes. I don't know exactly what those dates are. Well, let me ask you this. Do you remember that it was after you learned of what happened at the status conference on November 3rd that you told Mrs. Vozanich that you would be a witness. I can't relate to those dates because one does not relate to the other in my mind. Oh, are you saying you don't remember whether you learned one thing before you said the other? Is that I'm, what you're saying? I'm a, a lot of business in my life. Those things come and go. You will agree, though, will you not, that um, November 3rd was more than 10 days before November 23rd. Arithmetically, that works out. So that if you had agreed to be a witness 10 days before November 3rd, that would have been 10 days after you learned of the probate judge's action. Uh, 10 days before November 3rd would have been back in uh, October. I'm sorry. I meant 23rd. Ten days before. All right. If you learn ten days before November, well, strike that. If you made your decision to testify ten days before November twenty third, that would be November thirteenth. I didn't say I made my decision. Uh, I, I don't think it's ever come up as to when I made my decision. Well, that's when you communicated it to Miss Bozanich, correct? That's correct. When was it that you viewed the videotape testimony of your former wife and your sister? Well, I think uh, within a week uh, or so after it happened. 
and you were aware that they were here in uh, Los Angeles um, on a couple of occasions before they actually got to testify, were you not? I was not. Well, isn't it true, Mr. Anderson, that you tried to track them down here in Los Angeles to dissuade them from testifying? Absolutely not. Is there some agreement that you have with Doris Anderson where any monies that you may be able to get from the Menendez estates you may keep? No. Is Doris Anderson interested in obtaining money from these estates? Judgment calls for Doris and speculation. Sustained. Has Doris Anderson ever attended any of the probate court proceedings? I don't. Judgment calls for hearsay, lack of foundation. Sustained. Have you ever seen Doris Anderson at any of the probate court proceedings? No. To your knowledge, has she ever come to California to attend those hearings? She's been in California. But to attend those hearings? I've never seen one. <laughs> Have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Anderson, do you know a Los Angeles Times uh, or former Los Angeles Times reporter named Ronald Sobel? Yeah, I object to this being the opposite. Just purposes. Or? Solely foundational, you're on to introduce a statement by the witness. All right, Judge Sobel. The question? Yes. Are you acquainted with or were you acquainted with a Los Angeles Times reporter named Ron Sobel? I can't recall the names of all the reporters that tried to reach me. Okay. Do you recall? Uh, have a moment. Here. Are you familiar with the content of a Los Angeles Times article dated August 26, 1989? Yeah, I object to that All right. Mr. Anderson, did you speak at the memorial service here in Los Angeles? Seems to me that I did. And did you speak about your sister? Mm -hmm. I did. And would you say, Mr. Anderson, that your sister was, um, among other things, uh, competitive and aggressive? Why? Do not recall what I said. It was immediately after the murders I was still emotionally involved. No, I'm, I'm not asking you that. I'm asking what you know. Would, would you say, I mean, was it your opinion that your sister was competitive and aggressive? She was very competitive. And do you, uh, now I'll ask you, do you, you recall saying at the memorial service, as competitive and aggressive as she was, it intensified when she and Jose married? I could have said that. It sounds true, does it not? It could, I could have said that. It is true, isn't it? I could have said that. Th that's not what I'm asking you. We, we can all say things. Was it true that her competitiveness and her aggressiveness intensified when she married Jose Menendez? Well, they were both competitive, and there was a synergism, yes. Yes. And wasn't it also true that, in your opinion, Jose certainly had met his challenge when he and Kitty became man and wife? Are you asking me if I said that? I'm asking if you believe that to be true. Well, I don't know that that's, uh, do I believe it's true? I, I don't know. Did you say that at the memorial service? I may have. And um, by met his challenge, weren't you referring to the fact that you considered your sister a strong person, strong-willed, strong personality? She is. She was. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I have nothing further. Any examination on behalf of uh, the co-defendant? No, Your Honor. Redirect. Yes, Your 
Mr. Anderson, you were just asking questions about your decision to testify in this case. So I'd like to ask you, how do you feel about testifying in this case? What, what, how do you feel emotionally about testifying? I'm going to object to that, Your Honor. I think that's a rehabilitation. Overall. I love my sister, and she loved me, and I'm here to uh, convey what I know to be those matters that I knew about my sister and I experienced with my sister. Now, in 1990, after the defendants were arrested, did you participate, I believe you were asked if you participated in the negotiations for the attorney's fees in this case, correct? That's correct. And at the time that you made those negotiations, did you believe that Eric Menendez and Lyle Menendez had not participated in the killings of their parents? They told me they had not, uh, and that was, uh, everyone said they had not, so I... And at the time that they told you they had not participated in killing their parents, did you believe them? Yes. Okay. And um, when you participated in the fee negotiations, um, did you personally spend any money? at any time on the attorneys? Oh, on the attorneys? Yes. Or the, uh, um, which attorneys? Okay, the, the defense attorneys, the criminal defense attorneys. After the defendants were arrested, you participated in negotiating for the estate to spend the money in the estate to pay the attorneys. Is that correct? Okay. Other than airfare out here? Yes. No. All right. And how long would you say you um, worked on the negotiations for the fees? Well, there was, I received many phone calls from uh, Ms. Abramson, and there was some period of time. All right. Now, did you ever discuss the fee arrangements with either of the defendants in visits at the county jail? Yes. All right. So were they, were, did you keep the defendants up to date on what you were doing in order to negotiate the fees? As best I could, because I couldn't call them, but they could call me. And did they ever call you after you had become involved in the fee negotiations? Oh, yes. And did you ever discuss with them the fee negotiations? Constantly. Okay. Now, what was your understanding as to um, what the estate was going to do in terms of paying the fees? In other words... Your Honor, I'm going to object to this. this I'm okay, I'll rephrase it. I think she's changing the question. Where was the money going to come from to pay for the criminal defense attorneys to defend Eric and Lyle Menendez? The term that I was given was called a family allowance. And what money was going to be used to pay the family allowance? The monies that were presently in the different accounts uh, and uh, the, all things were brought up, the sale of the uh, Beverly Hills house, the sale of stocks and bonds, the sale of the Calabasas house, uh, whatever could be liquidated to produce the cash to pay the attorneys. And, and um, so what was your understanding of what the estate, what were the assets in the estate at the time that you were negotiating the fees for the defense attorneys for Eric and Lyle Menendez? Your Honor, I object to this. It's um, irrelevant. Sustained. Okay, well, you've mentioned the Calabasas house, the Bev uh, there was the Beverly Hills house, and stocks and bonds. Uh, there were stocks. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to object again. I think counsel is simply trying to re the same question. Through Overall. Suggestion. Overall. Is that correct? The, uh, there were stocks with, uh, yes. And those were all properties that had previously belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Menendez, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so it was going to be their money that was going to be used to pay the legal fees, is that, that correct? Is cor this is that not is correct. Examinations Overall, yeah, it's real okay. Now, Mr. Anderson, did you at some point um, help an agreement to be reached whereby the money from your dead sister and brother-in-law would be used to pay the legal fees? Do you understand my question? I do not. All right. At some point, was there, in fact, an agreement reached wherein the money that had previously belonged to your sister and brother-in-law would, in fact, be used to pay for the legal defense of Eric and Lyle Menendez? Yes. And at that time that the agreement was reached, what did you still believe that Eric and Lyle Menendez had not killed their parents? Yeah, I believe that was asked and answered. That's correct. Okay. Overall, the answer was 10. After an agreement was made to use the estate to pay the legal fees, was it then that you found out that they actually had killed their parents? Uh, 
Um, Mrs. Abramson told me that if she didn't receive the money well, soon, she was going to quit. She was going to quit. Okay, wait, 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 wait. wait, okay, wait. Hold on here. Response. All right. The uh, objection is sustained. The answer is stricken. Um, why don't you rephrase the question? It's rather imprecise as to. Okay. It's Did also, you find? Okay. Why don't you ask it in a different way? Okay. Did you find out that Eric and Lyle Menendez really had killed their parents before or after the agreement was made to pay the legal fees? After. Now, I believe you were asked some questions about um, this petition that you filed in the probate court recently. Do you remember the questions you were asked on cross? Generally, yes. All right. Uh, and uh, what was the reason that you filed the petition in probate court? The one that was filed recently, this fall. My father asked me before, I, before he died if I would uh, continue my, which he asked me before, right from the very beginning, which is why I was participating in it, if I would stay with this uh, until the until there was a conclusion. And I agreed to do that, and I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing the best I can. What is, what is it you're trying to get from the probate court by this petition that you filed? What is yeah, your I'm going to object to that, that it's too broad in scope, under 352. Are you asking what his purpose was in filing the document? Yes. All right. Why don't you ask that? Okay. Um, Mr. Anderson, you said that the reason you filed it is because your father asked you before he died to stick with this thing to the end. Is that your testimony? That's what he said. All right. And what, what did you think you would accomplish towards that end by filing this petition in probate court? The, uh, uh, the petition in probate court was for fees. It wasn't my petition. It was, it was a, in response to a petition for fees by the uh, executors of the estate and the council representing the executors for the estate and the, uh, the claims that they were asking for were not related to the estate and excessive. All right, so in other words, you're trying to, um, you're challenging the amount of fees that have been charged by the executors of the state and their attorney, is that correct? That's correct. Because you feel they are excessive? They didn't relate to settlement of the yeah, estate, and they were excessive. Is, opening the door to open. Overall, the answer will stand. And who do you understand the executors of the estate to be? Uh, Terry and Carlos Burrell. Okay. And who is the attorney that you understand to be the attorney who, um, whose fees you're challenging? Their attorney, Mr. Goldberg. Is that Stephen Goldberg? That's correct. Okay. Now, um, what is your understanding as to the amount of money that is presently left in the estate? I'm not certain what the amount of money is left in the estate because they incorporate the Calabasas house and if I, if to my knowledge, it has not been sold and I don't know what it will be sold for. All right. Is it your understanding that there is a lot of money, like, like over $500,000 left in the estate? Ron, well, I'm going to object to calls for here, sir. Overall. Um, I believe, that, well, incorporating the Calabasas house, I believe the number was around 800000 or 700000 something in that area. Now, why is it you decided to come testify in this case? I think that was asked and answered, Your Honor. No. no, it hasn't. Your answer? I love my sister. All right. And did your decision to come and testify have anything to do with this petition that you filed in probate court? Not a bit. Didn't relate to it at all. Do you need the money? I do not. Thank you. I'm nothing further. All right. Any recross? Yes, Your Honor. Now, you said this petition was a response to a request for fees by the executors and their attorney. Is that correct? That's correct. And the objection of the object of this petition is to prevent them from receiving the fees that, as executors and attorneys, they're requesting, correct? Fees that uh, did not relate to the state or that were excessive. All right, but you're trying to keep them from getting paid, basically, right? That's not correct. Well, you're trying to keep them from being getting paid what they're asking to be paid. I'm, I'm very willing for them to get paid whatever they have coming. But you dispute what they have coming, correct? You have a different number in mind than they do. The fee, I think I answered this question, but well, I'll answer it again. Why don't we try to answer it with a yes or no, Mr. Anderson, because it will save us all right, a lot of time. Why don't you re-ask the question? Isn't you, the purpose of your pleading, which in fact is called an objection, is it not? An objection? What is that? Objections. We've never heard any of those things in this court. <laughs> Oh, okay. It's objections to first account of executors, um, etc. Isn't that what it's called, the document you signed? Uh, with the etc.? Well, it has more words, but the first words is objections. It's an objection to the account. Why don't you read the whole document rather than just read a part of it? 
Okay, Mr. Anderson. All right, why don't you ask do a, a, another question rather than responding to uh, okay. the witness? Is the title of the document that you signed on behalf of your stepmother objections to first account of executors petition for allowance on account of executors extraordinary commissions and fees for extraordinary legal services and petition for surcharge? Uh, that sounds correct. Okay. Now, there's two different things here. There's your objections to what <laughs> the... Uh, the executors and their lawyer is asking for. That's one part. And then there's your separate petition for surcharge, correct? Um, I did not draft the document. Alan uh, Wattenmaker drafted the document. You understand those are two different things? Well, again, I'm not a lawyer. I well, let me, let me see if I can help you with this. On the one hand, the Baralts as executors now four years later and their attorney Mr. Goldberg and accountants as well I understand are asking to be paid a certain amount of money for work they claim they did on behalf of the estates. Is that a fair statement as you understand it? In excess of the money they've already been paid, yes. Okay, they've been paid something and now they're asking for these other things, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Thank you. And you are objecting to what they're asking for, correct? I've answered that. Is that yes? Well, I've, I'm objecting to anything in excess of what they should have coming. What yes. you believe they should have coming, correct? What I understand, that's correct. All right. Now, in addition to that, you're also asking that they be made to pay money back to the estate, correct? And that has to do with, you claim that they spent too much money completing the remodeling and renovation of the Calabasas house. And so you're arguing that they should have to pay back some of the money that was spent on fixing the house up. Correct? The document was drafted by Alan Wattenmaker. I'm opinion. asking if you know what's in it. Oh, yeah. Do you know that that's well, I don't, in it? I don't know everything that's in it. I don't understand the thing totally. It's a legal document. Do you understand that that is the, what the petition for surcharge is? You're asking them to pay back money that they spent to get the Calabasas house fixed up. I don't know that it was a matter of paying it back or explain the reason for spending it. I think uh, I'm not certain. Okay. Now, you are not doing this, Mr. Anderson, on behalf of Eric and Lyle Menendez. You don't represent their interest in probate court, correct? No, you have your own attorneys. No, I don't have any attorneys, but, but you're not doing this in order to get the money to them, correct? I'm, I'm doing what my father asked with respect to his estate. And what your father asked you to do is to try to get as much money out of this estate as you can, correct? He, he absolutely did not. All right. But what you're asking the probate court to do is to disallow these fees that the executors and their lawyers are asking for, maybe make them pay more money into the estate, and then determine that the Anderson side inherits. Isn't that what you're asking? You're not doing all this so that Eric and Lyle can get the money. Is that Counsel, paragraph one question? Wait, 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 wait. wait. I'll break it down. Rephrase the question. Answer stricken. Your father didn't ask you to go to probate court in order to uh, make sure that Eric and Lyle have money, correct? <clears throat> That's not the thing he asked you to pursue to the end. My father is dead and man. I understand that. So you're not doing this on behalf of, of uh, Eric and Lyle. You're doing this on behalf of Doris Anderson, his widow. That's correct. Now, you are a commercial real estate developer, correct? That's correct. And you work with legal documents all the time, do you not? Relating to uh, real estate contracts, yes. And you're, in fact, rather fastidious about written agreements, are you not? Uh, what do you mean by fastidious? When Miss Lansing and I came to talk to you in uh, April of 1992, you made us sign a three-page agreement that uh, any information that you discussed with us uh, could only be used in very specific ways. Do you recall that? I was. Uh, that's correct. I was concerned about your uh, your uh, husband, who was in a. Concerned about my husband, who was a journalist. Is that journalist. correct? Uh -huh. yeah. You didn't ask Mrs. Bazanich to sign any agreements before you talked to her, did you? No, ma'am. And you didn't ask Detective Zoller, who's gone, who's made public statements about this case, to sign any agreements. Is that correct? Objection argumentative, Your Honor. Sustained as to the form of the question. Now, you made Miss Lansing sign an agreement, too, did you not? That's correct. Uh, her husband's not a journalist. He's a lawyer. Did you know that? Objection she worked. Objection argumentative and the spoken 
sustained as to the form of question and answers. Okay. You didn't believe Miss Lansing's husband was a journalist, did you? No, you were working together, however. I see. And you knew that, did you not, Mr. Um, Anderson, when you, in, as of April 1992, that neither Miss Lansing nor I had publicly commented on any family-related matter in this case? You knew that. I did not know that. Well, you didn't have anything to show otherwise. Isn't that true? Objection, argumentative. Let's get back, though, to probate court. Now, you said you were told that if, if one includes the Calabasas house, which is not sold yet, that there might be $800,000 in the estate? I don't remember the accounting. I was estimating what I remember from the sheet. Well, isn't it true that th there's still $600,000 owed to the IRS? Again, I don't remember the documentation. And $200,000 owed to the County of Los Angeles to reimburse the county for costs that the county has advanced for the criminal defense? I don't have, uh, I read the document. There's a lot of numbers in there. I don't know that that, I don't think any of that was in there, but it in may In fact, have. the estate has no money if the taxes are paid and the debts are paid and the fees are paid to the executors and to Mr. Goldberg, then there's less than zero left. Isn't that true? I have not have it at Foundation. Rephrase the question. OK. That's Isn't it your understanding that if these fees that have been requested by the executors and their attorney and the taxes and the costs owed to the county of Los Angeles are paid, there will be a negative balance in the estates. There'll be nothing, less than nothing. I have not done the accounting on it. I don't know that firsthand. Well, we're not knowing it firsthand, but that's your understanding, isn't it? I have, we don't, we have not been given enough information to understand the estate. That was one of the reasons for the objection. All right, but the fact is that's the, cl that right now with the information you have, that's what the financial picture looks like. There's less than nothing there. I'd have to give you the same answer, Ms. Lansing. I, uh, Ms. Abramson, I have not, uh, we, we have not been given enough information to understand it. And that's the reason for the, for, we're just well, asking for information. We haven't gotten it. That's part of what that objection is. Well, you're objecting because you're alarmed that there's no money there. Is that Sustained as to form of the question. Was it not a matter of concern to you, the financial condition of the estates, the level of depletion? If uh, my concern is uh, to protect my stepmother and do what my father asked me to do. Well, but that wasn't my question. My question was, wasn't it a matter of concern that your understanding is the estates have been so depleted that it is more than likely that there's nothing there? I don't know that firsthand. But you know that that's what the accounting shows. I don't know that firsthand. But you know that that's what the accounting shows, do you not? I do not know that firsthand. Do you know it secondhand? I don't know it thirdhand. OK, ask a different question, please. All right. Now, you do understand that if the Calabasas house is not sold, then whatever the condition the estate is in, it gets worse, because there's still mortgages that are being carried on that, correct? I'm not sure that's true. It might be a good idea just to let it go. I don't know. There's, uh, again, we don't have the information. You do know that that house was right in the middle of the Agura Malibu fire zone uh, earlier this month, do you know? As best we get that information in Chicago, their fire was in the Topanga Valley, as I understand it. You didn't go over there to see? I have not been there. And so you don't know that all the houses around it burned, but it's still standing? I have not been over there. And that that might somehow affect its value as real estate? Your Honor, I moved to that. Objection. This is speculative and argumentative. Sustain. Let's move on to something else. Okay. Now, I just want to back up to one thing. You remember, Mr. Anderson, that the first time I met you was at the Beverly Hills house, and other members of the family were there, and there was a discussion about hiring attorneys for Eric and Lyle, correct? I recall that. All right. And do you, now you've answered Mrs. Bozanich's questions that the legal fees were paid from this family allowance. Isn't it true that the first round of legal fees were paid by Eric Menendez? I don't recall that. Do you recall at this same meeting, Martha Cano was there? I believe the, uh, 
Marticano was there, that's correct. And you recall that it was indicated that Eric still had uh, substantial funds in his accounts with Mrs. Cano, and those funds would be used first to pay for the attorneys. I vaguely recall uh, some accounting with, that uh, Marticano had. You vaguely recall that, correct? That's correct. I have nothing for you. Anything else? Okay. Can I get some more water? Sure. Mr. Anderson, Doris Anderson is your stepmother? That's is that correct. correct. What is your understanding as to how she will succeed to Kitty Menendez's interest in the estate? She is the heir to my father's estate. And, and what is your understanding as to how she has any interest in Kitty Menendez's uh, estate or Kitty Menendez's interest in Jose Menendez's estate? She has whatever interest uh, my father would have uh, in the estate. And do you know how she obtains an interest? She's the heir to my father's estate. And do you remember in the pleading which has been referred to here that it stated that Doris Anderson will succeed to Kitty's interest in this estate if the decedent's sons are determined not to be entitled to such interest pursuant to probate code 250. Kitty will have an interest in this estate if she is Thank determined you. to have survived Jose. What pleading are you talking about? The pleading that you and Miss uh, Abramson have been discussing that she read to you. There's been a lot of documents that Ms. Abramson brought up to discuss. Uh, uh, if you could clarify what you're talking about. So I can well, do you remember um, the pleading which is entitled Objections to First Account of Executors? The one with a long title? Yes. All right. If you remember a statement in that plea, by the way, you signed that pleading as attorney, in fact, for Doris Anderson, correct? That's correct. All right. And do you remember a statement in that pleading which says that Kitty will have an interest in this estate if she is determined to have survived Jose. That's the Jose. Estate. I think that's out of context. Gotta make that clear. And do you remember in the same uh, statement, um, the statement, the same paragraph, the statement, accordingly, objector will succeed to Kitty's interest in this estate, that is, Jose Menendez's estate, if the decedent's sons are determined not to be entitled to such interest, pursuant to probate code section 250. Are you reading the entire paragraph, or are you just taking a, section, a part of it? Well, I think I'm reading the entire paragraph, but what, could I approach a witness? Just yes. Please, thank you. Could you, uh, Mr. Anderson, just take a moment to read the paragraph which I just referred to, which is highlighted there, and just read it to yourself if you could. The paragraph starts on the prior page? Yes. I think the entire paragraph should be read, and then I'll answer it. <laughs> well, and by the way, the, this pleading is sign uh, Doris Anderson by Brian Anderson, her attorney, in fact, correct? That's correct. That is your signature, which is on the signature line for Doris Anderson. She didn't sign it, but you did, correct? That's my printed name. You said that you didn't need the money. Does Doris Anderson need the money? I don't know what Doris Anderson needs. And let me ask you again, uh, what your understanding is as to how Doris Anderson will succeed to any interest in the Menendez estate. She is the heir to my father's estate. All right. And do you recall the statement in this pleading which says, <coughs> objector will succeed to Kitty's interest in this estate if the decedent's sons are determined not to be entitled to such interest pursuant to probate code section 250. Kitty will have an interest in this, in this estate if she is determined to have survived Jose. I think if you read the entire paragraph, I'll answer the question. Do, do you recall, do you recall uh, that statement in that pleading? That does, are you asking me if that, is that part of the, what that paragraph says? No, I'm, I'm saying, do you recall that that statement is in this pleading, which I just showed to you? That, that is part of that paragraph, that's correct. And what, what do those two sentences I read to you mean? If you read the entire paragraph, I think it'll be explanatory. 
Well, the two paragraph, two sentences I just read to you, I'm asking you what, what those sentences mean in this document that you signed. Could later you on in what that you Later on in that document, it states that Maria Menendez would be the, the sole beneficiary, and that is particular estate is Jose Menendez, not Kitty Menendez. And it states that, uh, she, that uh, Maria Menendez would be the sole beneficiary if, if uh, Eric and Lyle do not s succeed. And in that, we're clarifying for the court that that may not be the case. So this pleading um, clarifies for the court that it may not be the case that Maria Menendez, that is the grandmother of uh, the mother of Jose Menendez, is not the sole contingent heir at law of deceit. Is that it, the part you're referring to? It's, it's possible. Right. And the reason she would not be the sole heir is under um, the scenario which is outlined in the two sentences I read to you. That is, if Kitty is determined to have survived Jose, then she would not be the sole heir, correct? You're in an area that I think is more for lawyers than it is for me. I'm just asking what you're understanding. I, but you're asking me understandings that are, that's a legal document that was prepared by a lawyer, and you're asking me to clarify what the lawyer put in it, and I, no, I'm not in a position to do that. I'm not asking you to clarify what the lawyer put in it. I'm asking you for your understanding of a document that you signed and was filed in court. So my question is, what is your understanding as to how Doris Anderson succeeds to an interest in the estate. Yes. The, uh, as I said, the statement further, further on in that same paragraph, it states that uh, Maria Menendez would be the uh, sole uh, heir, uh, uh, absent uh, Lyle and Eric, and that for clarification for the court, we stated that may not be the case. And it may not be the case if Lyle and Eric are convicted and it's determined that Kitty survived Jose, correct? That's possible. That's your understanding? That's possible. All right. Now, you said that the um, early on after the death of your sister and her husband that you were involved in the negotiations for attorneys, correct? Is there early on? What does that mean? Early, well, when was it that you became involved in the negotiations for the defense attorneys? not long after they were arrested. And did you negotiate with any lawyers who were prospective attorneys for Lyle Menendez? Yes. And was that uh, Joel Isaacson? I don't know that I negotiated with Joel. I may have, uh, I met him. Did you ever negotiate uh, with myself? I don't think we've met. You and I have never met, correct? No. And you didn't negotiate with Miss Lansing, did you? In those she early was, stages? She was an attorney working with Jerry Chalif at the time, if I recall correctly. But you had no negotiations with her personally? Uh, no, she was not the lead attorney at the time. And Jerry Chalif was another prospective attorney that you had discussions with, correct? I think he was hired by Lyle, as I recall. But my question is, in terms of the people that you negotiated with, you did not negotiate with Miss Lansing nor myself, correct? No, that's correct. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Any redirect? No. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down. You're excused. Thank you, sir. And